Lakshmi tugged the short sleeve straight. So why did you run with those two men? Lakshmi asked. There was a man back in the army, a bad man. He wanted to... Mary stopped and shrugged. You know... Soldiers, Lakshmi said disapprovingly. But the two men you ran away with, did they treat you well? Yes, oh yes. Mary suddenly wanted Lakshmi's good opinion, and that opinion would not be good if she thought that Mary had run from the army with a lover. One of them, she told the lie shyly, is my half-brother. Ah, Lakshmi said, as though everything was clear now. Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell continued. Disc 6 The two armies had crossed the river well to the city's east and were now on its southern bank, and Sharp climbed with the rest of Goudin's men to the fire step above the Mysore Gate to watch the first British cavalry patrols appear in the distance. A torrent of lances clattered out of the gate to challenge the invaders. The Tipu's men rode with green and scarlet pennants on their lance heads, and beneath silk banners showing the golden sun blazoned against a scarlet field. Once the lances had passed through the gate, a succession of painted ox carts squealed and ground their way into the city, each loaded with rice, grain, or beans. There was plenty of water inside Seringapatam, for not only did the river Corvary wash beneath two of the walls, but each street had its own well, and now the tipper was making certain that the granaries were filled to overflowing. The city's magazines were already crammed with ammunition. There were guns in every embrasure, and behind the walls, spare guns waited to replace any that were dismounted. Sharp had never seen so many guns. The tipper's sultan had great faith in artillery, and he'd collected cannons of every shape and size. There were guns with barrels disguised as crouching tigers, and guns inscribed with flowing Arabic letters, and guns supplied from France. Some still with the ancient Bourbon cipher incised close to their touch holes. There were huge guns with barrels over twenty feet long that fired stone balls close to fifty pounds in weight, and small guns, scarce longer than a musket, that fired individual balls of grape. The Tipu intended to meet any British assault with a storm of cannon fire. And not just cannon fire, for as the two enemy armies marched closer to the city, the rocket men brought their strange weapons to the fire steps. Sharp had never seen rockets before, and he gaped as the missiles were stacked against the parapets. Each was an iron tube, some four or five inches wide and about eighteen inches long, that was attached by leather thongs to a bamboo stick that stood higher than a man. A crude tin cone tipped the iron cylinder, and inside the cone was either a small solid shot or else an explosive charge that was ignited by the rocket's own gunpowder propellant. The missiles were fired by lighting a twist of paper that emerged from the base of the iron cylinders. Some of the rocket tubes had been wrapped with paper, then painted with either snarling tigers or verses from the Koran. There's a man in Ireland working on a similar weapon, Lawford told Sharp, though I don't think he puts tigers on his rocket heads. How do you aim the bloody things? Sharp asked. Some of the rockets had been placed ready to fire, but there was no gun barrel to direct them. Instead, they were simply laid on the parapet and pointed in the general direction of the enemy. Well, you don't really aim them, Lawford said. At least I don't think you do. They're just pointed in the right direction and fired. They're notoriously inaccurate he added. At least I hope they are. We'll see soon enough, Sharp said, as another hand cart of the strange missiles was heaved up the ramp to the fire step. Sharp looked forward to seeing the rockets fired, but then it became apparent that the British and Hyderabad armies were not approaching the city directly and thus bringing themselves into range, but instead planned to march clear around Seringapatam's southern margin. The progress of the two armies was painfully slow. They had appeared at dawn, but by nightfall they had still not completed their half-circuit of the island on which Seringapatam sat. A crowd of spectators thronged the city ramparts. 
to watch the enormous sprawl of herds, battalions, cavalry squadrons, guns, civilians, and wagons that filled the southern landscape. Dust surrounded the armies like an English fog. From time to time, the fog thickened as a group of the Tipu's lances attacked some vulnerable spot. But each time, the lances were met by a countercharge of Allied cavalry, and more dust would spew up from the horses' hooves as the riders charged, clashed, circled, and fought. One lancer rode back to the city with a British cavalryman's hat held aloft on his spear point, and the soldiers on the walls cheered his return. But gradually, the greater number of Allied cavalry gained the upper hand, and the cheers died away. As more and more of the Tipu's horsemen splashed back, wounded through the South Corvary's ford, some of the enemy, when the Tipu's cavalry was driven away, ventured closer to the city. Small groups of officers trotted their horses toward the river, so that they could examine the city walls. And it was one such group that drew the first rocket fire. Sharp watched, fascinated, as an officer turned one of the long weapons on the flat top of the parapet. So that its tin cone pointed directly toward the nearest group of horsemen, the rocket man waited beside his officer, swinging a length of slow match to keep its burning end bright and hot. The officer fussed with the rocket's alignment. Then, satisfied at last, he stepped back and nodded to the rocket man, who grinned and touched his slow match to the twist of paper at the rocket's base. The fuse paper, sharp guessed. Had been soaked in water diluted with gunpowder, then dried, because it immediately caught the glowing fire, which ate its way swiftly up the fuse, as the rocket man stepped hurriedly away. The glowing trail vanished into the iron cylinder. There was silence for a second. Then the rocket twitched as a bright flame abruptly choked and spat from the tube's base. The twitch of the igniting powder charge threw the heavy rocket out of its careful alignment. But there was no chance to correct the weapon's aim, for a jet of flame was spitting fiercely enough from the cylinder to scorch the rocket's quivering bamboo stick. And then, very suddenly, the bright flame roared into a furnace-like intensity, with a noise like a huge waterfall. Only instead of water, it was spewing sparks and smoke as the rocket began to move. It trembled for an instant, scraped an inch or two across the parapet. Then abruptly accelerated away into the air, leaving a thick cloud of smoke and a scorch mark on the parapet's coping. For a few seconds, it seemed as if the rocket was having trouble staying aloft, for the long scorched tail wobbled as the fiery tube fought against gravity, and as the smoke trail stitched a crazy whirl above the ditch at the foot of the wall. But then, at last, it gained momentum and raced away across the glassy, the encampment, and the river. It spewed a tail of sparks, fire, and smoke as it flew. Then, as the powder charge began to be exhausted, the rocket fell earthward. Beneath the missile, the group of horsemen had collapsed their spy glasses, and were fleeing in every direction as the fire-tailed demon came shrieking out of the sky. The rocket struck the ground, bounced, tumbled, then exploded with a small crack of noise and a burst of flame and white smoke. None of the horsemen had been touched, but their panic delighted the Tipu's men on the bastions, who gave the rocket men a cheer. Sharp cheered with them. Farther up the wall, a cannon fired at a second group of horsemen. The smoke of the gun billowed out across the encampment beneath the walls, and the heavy round shots screamed across the river to disembowel a horse a half mile away. But no one cheered the gunners. Guns were not so spectacular as rockets. He's got thousands of those bloody things," Sharp told Lawford, indicating a pile of the rockets. Well, "They really aren't very accurate," Lawford said, with pedantic disapproval. "But fire enough at once, and you wouldn't know if you were in this world or the next. I wouldn't fancy being on the wrong end of a dozen of those things." Behind them, from one of the tall white minarets of the city's new mosque, the muezzin was chanting the summons for the evening prayer. And the Muslim rocket men hastened to unroll their small prayer mats and face westward toward Mecca. Sharp and Lawford also faced west, not out of any respect for the Tipu's religion, 
but because the vanguard of British and Indian cavalry was scouting the flat land beyond the South Corvary, which was plainly visible from the summit of the Mysore Gate. The main body of the two armies was making camp well to the south of the city, but the horsemen had ridden ahead to reconnoitre the western country in preparation for the next day's short march. Sharp could even see officers pacing out and marking where the Lascars would pitch the army's tents. It seemed that General Harris had decided to attack from the west, the one direction the Macandas had warned against. Poor bloody fools, Sharp said, though neither he nor Lawford yet knew what was dangerous about the western defences. Nor had they been given the slightest chance to escape from the city. They were never unwatched. They were never allowed to stand guard at night. And Sharp knew that even the smallest attempt to break away from the city would lead to immediate death. Yet they were not otherwise treated badly. They had been accepted well enough by their new comrades. But Sharp could detect a reserve, and he supposed that until he and Lawford proved their reliability, there would always be an undercurrent of suspicion. It ain't that they don't trust you, Henry Hickson had explained on their first night. But till they've actually seen you bang a few balls off at your old mates, they won't really know whether you're stout. Hickson was sewing up the frayed edge of his leather thumb stall, which protected his hand when a cannon was swabbed out. The gunner had to stop the touch hole so that the rammer could not drive a jet of fresh air down the barrel and so ignite any scraps of remaining powder and Hickson's old and blackened thumb stall betrayed how long he'd been an artillery man. I had this in America, Hickson said, flourishing the ancient scrap of leather, stitched for me by a little girl in Charleston. Lovely little thing she was. How long have you been in the artillery? Lawford had asked the grey-haired Hickson. Bleeding lifetime, Bill. Joined in 76. Hickson laughed. King and country. Go and save the colonies, eh? and all I did was march up and down like a little lost lamb, and only ever fired a dozen shots. I should have stayed there, shouldn't I, when they kicked us out, but like a fool I didn't. Went to Gibraltar, polished cannon for a couple of years, then got posted out here. So why did you run? Lawford asked. Money, of course. The tip who might be a black heathen bastard, but he pays well for gunners. When he pays at all, of course, which isn't precisely frequent. But all the same, he ain't done bad by me. And if I'd stayed in the gunners, I wouldn't have met Sooney, would I? He had jerked his callous thumb toward his Indian woman, who was cooking the evening meal with the wives of the other soldiers. Don't you worry that you'll be recaptured? Lawford asked him. Of course I bloody worry, all the bleeding time. Hickson held the thumb stall close to his right eye to judge the neatness of his stitching. Christ, Bill, I don't want to be stood up against a bleeding post with a dozen bastards staring down their musket barrels at me. I want to die in Sooney's bed. He grinned. You do ask the most stupid questions, Bill. But what do you expect of a bleeding clerk? All that reading and writing, mate. It doesn't do a man any bleeding good. He had shaken his head in despair of Lawford ever seeing sense. Like all of Goodhart's soldiers... Hickson was more suspicious of Lawford than of Sharp. They all understood Sharp, for he was one of them and good at his trade. But Lawford was patently uncomfortable. They put it down to his having come from a comfortable home that had fallen on hard times, and while they were sympathetic to that misfortune, they nevertheless expected him to make the best of it. Others in Goudin's small battalion despised Lawford for his clumsiness with weapons, but Sharp was his friend, and so far no man had been willing to risk Sharp's displeasure by needling Lawford. Sharp and Lawford watched the invading armies make their camp well out of cannon range to the south of the city. A few Mysorean cavalrymen still circled the armies, watching for a chance to snap up a fugitive. But most of the Tipu's men were now back on the city's island. There was an excited buzz in the city almost a relief that the enemy was in sight, and the waiting at last was over. There was also a feeling of confidence, for although the enemy horde looked vast, the Tipu had formidable defences and plenty of men. Sharp could detect no lack of enthusiasm among the Hindu troops. Lawford had told him there was bad blood between them and the Muslims. But on that evening, as the Tipu's men hung more defiant banners above their lime-washed walls, 
The city seemed united in its defiance. Sergeant Rotier shouted at Sharp and Lawford from the inner wall of the Mysore Gate, pointing to the big bastion at the city's southwestern corner. Colonel Kudam wants us, Lawford translated for Sharp. Wait, Rotier bellowed. Now, Lawford said nervously. The two men threaded their way through the spectators who crowded the parapets until they found Colonel Goodai in a cavalier that jutted south from the huge square bastion. How's your back? the Frenchman greeted Sharp. Mending wonderfully, sir. Goodai smiled, pleased at the news. It's Indian medicine, Sharp. If I ever go back to France, have a mind to take a native doctor with me. Much better than ours. All a French doctor would do is bleed your dries and console your widow. The colonel turned and gestured south across the river. Your hope, friends, he said, indicating where the British and Indian cavalry were exploring the land between the army's encampment and the city. Most were staying well out of range of Seringapatam's cannon, but a few braver souls were galloping closer to the city, either to tempt the Tipu's cavalry to come out and dare single combat, or else to provoke the gunners on the city wall. One especially flamboyant group was shouting toward the city, and even waving, as though inviting cannon fire, and every now and then a cannon would boom or a rocket scream across the river, though somehow the jeering cavalrymen always remained untouched. They're distracting us, good I explained, drawing attention away from some others. There, see, some bushes beside the cistern. He was pointing across the river. There are some scouts there, on foot. They are trying to see what defences we have close to the river. You see them? Look in the bushes under the two palm trees. Sharp stared, but could see nothing. You want us to go and get them, sir? He offered. I want you to shoot them. Goudin said. The bushes under the twin palms were nearly a quarter of a mile away. Long bloody range for a musket, sir, Sharp said dubiously. Thrice this, then, Goudin said, and held out a gun. It must have been one of the Tipu's own weapons, for its stock was decorated with ivory, its tiger head lock was chased with gold, and its barrel engraved with Arabic writing. Sharp took and hefted the gun. Might be pretty, sir, he said, but no amount of fancy work on the outside will make it more accurate than that plain old thing. He patted his heavy French musket. Yeron, Goudin said. That's a rifle. A rifle? Sharp had heard of such weapons, but he'd never handled one. And now he peered inside the muzzle and saw that the barrel was indeed cut in a pattern of spiralling grooves. He had heard that the grooves spun the bullet, which somehow made a rifle far more accurate than a shot from a smooth-bore musket. Why that should be the case, he had not the slightest idea but every man he'd ever spoken to about rifles had sworn it was true. Still, he said dubiously, near a quarter mile, long ways for a bullet, sir, even if it is spinning. That rifle can kill at four hundred paces sharp, Goudin said confidently. It's loaded, by the way, the colonel added, and Sharp, who'd been peering down the muzzle again, jerked back. Goudin laughed. Loaded with the best powder and with its bullet wrapped in oiled leather. I want to see how good a shot you are. No, you don't, sir, Sharp said. You want to see if I'm willing to kill me own countrymen? That too, of course. Goudin agreed placidly, and laughed at having had his small ploy discovered. At that range, you should aim about six or seven feet above your target. I have another rifle for you, Lawford, but I don't suppose we can expect a clerk to be as accurate as a skirmisher like Sharp. I'll do my best, sir. Lawford said, and took the second rifle from Goudin. Lawford might be clumsy at loading a gun, but he was a practised shot in the hunting field, and had been firing rifled fowling pieces since he was eight years old. Some men find it hard to shoot at their old comrades, Goudin told Lawford mildly, and I want to make sure you're not among them. Let's hope the bastards are officers, Sharp said. I'm begging your presence, sir. There they are, Goudin said. And sure enough, just beside the cistern, beneath the two palm trees across the river, were a pair of red coats, 
The men were examining the city walls through telescopes. Their horses were picketed behind them. Sharp knelt in a gun embrasure. He instinctively felt that the range was much too long for any firearm, but he had heard about the miracle of rifles, and he was curious to see if the rumours were true. "You take the one on the left, Bill," he said, "and fire just after me." He glanced at Gudam and saw that the colonel had moved a few feet down the cavalier to watch the effect of the shots from a place where the rifle smoke would not obscure his glass. "And aim well, Bill," Sharp said in a low voice. They're probably only bloody cavalrymen, so who cares if we plug them with a pair of bloody ghoulies? He crouched behind the rifle and aligned its well-defined sights. They were so much more impressive than the rudimentary stub that served a musket as a foresight. A man could stand fifty feet in front of a well-aimed musket, and still stand a better than even's chance of walking away unscathed. But the delicacy of the rifle's sights seemed to confirm what everyone had told Sharp. This was a long-range killer. He settled himself firmly, keeping the sights lined on the distant man. Then gently raised the barrel, so that the rifle's muzzle obscured his target, but would give the ball the needed trajectory. There was no wind to speak of, so he had no need to offset his aim. He'd never fired a rifle, but it was just common sense, really. Nor was he unduly worried about killing one of his own side. It was a sad necessity, something that needed to be done if he was to earn Gudar's trust, and thus the freedom that might let him escape from the city. He took a breath, half let it out, then pulled the trigger. The gun banged into his shoulder; its recoil much harder than an ordinary musket's blow. Lawford fired a half second later, the smoke of his gun joining the dense cloud pumped out by Sharp's rifle. "Is it Clark wins?" Gudai exclaimed in astonishment. He lowered his spyglass. "Yours went six inches past the man's head, Sharp, but I think you killed your man, Lawford. Well done, well done indeed." Lawford reddened but said nothing. He looked very troubled, and Gudai put his evident confusion down to a natural shyness. "Is that the first man you've ever killed?" he asked gently. "Yes, sir," Lawford said, truthfully enough. You deserve to be better than a clerk. Well done, well done, both of you. He took the rifles from them and laughed at Sharp's rueful expression. You expected to do better, Sharp. Yes, sir. You will. Six inches off at that distance is very good shooting. Very good indeed. Gudin turned to watch, as the uninjured red coat dragged his companion back toward the horses. I think maybe Gudin went on. That you have a natural talent, Lawford. I congratulate you. The colonel fished in his pouch and brought out a handful of coins. An advance on your arrears of pay. Well done. Off you go now. Sharp glanced behind him, hoping to see what devilment the western walls held, but he could see nothing strange there, and so he turned and followed Lawford down the ramp. Lawford was shaking. I didn't mean to kill him. The lieutenant said when he was out of Gudan's earshot, "I did." Sharp muttered, "God, what have I done? I was aiming left." "Don't be a bloody fool," Sharp said. "What you've done is earned our freedom. You did bloody well." He dragged Lawford into a tavern. The tipo might be a Muslim, and the Muslims might preach an extraordinary hatred of alcohol, but most of the city was Hindu, and the tipo was sensible enough to keep the taverns open. This one, close to Gudar's barracks, was a big room open to the street with a dozen tables where old men played chess, and young men boasted of the slaughter they would inflict on the besiegers. The tavern keeper, a big woman with hard eyes, sold a variety of strange drinks, wine and arak mostly, but she also kept a weird-tasting beer. Sharp could still hardly speak a word of the local language. But he pointed to the arak barrel and held up two fingers. Now that he and Lawford were dressed in the tiger-striped tunics and carried muskets, they attracted little attention in the city and no hostility. Here,、yeah, he put the arak in front of Lawford. Drink that. Lawford drank it in one go. That was the first man I've killed, he said, blinking from the harshness of the liquor. Worry you? Of course it does. He was British. 
can't skin a cat without making a bloody mess, Sharp said comfortingly. Jesus, Lawford said angrily. Sharp poured half his liquor into Lawford's glass, then beckoned to one of the serving girls who circled the tables refilling glasses. You had to do it, he said. If I'd have missed like you, Lawford said ruefully, Goudin would have been just as impressed. That was a fine shot of yours. I was aiming to kill the bugger. You were? Lawford was shocked. Jesus Christ, Bill, we have to convince these buggers. Sharp smiled as the girl poured more liquor. Then he tipped a handful of small brass coins into a wooden bowl on the table. Another bowl held a strange spice, which the other drinkers nibbled between sips. But Sharp found the stuff too pungent. Once the girl was gone, he looked at the troubled lieutenant. Did you think this was going to be easy? Lawford was silent for a few seconds, then gave a shrug. In truth, I thought it would be impossible. So why did you come? Lawford cradled the glass in both hands and stared at Sharp as if weighing up whether or not to answer. To get away from Morris, he finally confessed, and for the excitement... He seemed embarrassed to admit as much. Morris is a bastard, Sharp said feelingly. Lawford frowned at the criticism. He's bored, he said chidingly. Then he steered the conversation away from the danger area of criticizing a superior officer. And I also came because I owe gratitude to my uncle. And because it would get you noticed. Lawford looked up with some surprise on his face, then he nodded. That too. Same as me, then, Sharp said. Exact same as me, except till the general said you was coming with me, I'd have a mind to run proper. Lawford was shocked by the admission. You really wanted to desert? For Christ's sake, what do you think it's like in the ranks? If you've got an officer like Morris and a sergeant like Akeswill, those bastards think we're just bleeding cattle. But we're not. Most of us want to do a decent job. Not too decent, maybe. We want a bit of money and a bibby from time to time, but we don't actually enjoy being flogged. And we can fight like the bloody devil. If you bastard lot started trusting us instead of treating us like the enemy, you'd be bloody amazed what we could do. Lawford said nothing. You've got some good men in the company, Sharp insisted. Tom Garrard is a better soldier than half the officers in the battalion, but you don't even notice him. If a man can't read and doesn't speak like a bleeding choir boy... You think he can't be trusted? The arm is changing, Lawford said defensively. Like hell it is. Why do you make us powder our hair like bleeding women or wear that bloody stock? Change takes time, Lawford said weakly. Too much bloody time, Sharp said fervently, then leaned against the wall and eyed the girls who were cooking at the tavern's far end. Were they whores, he wondered? Hickson and Blake had told him they knew where the best whores were. Then he remembered Mary and suddenly felt guilty. He'd not seen her once since their arrival in Seringapatam, but nor had he thought that much about her. In truth, he was having too good a time here. The food was good, the liquor cheap, and the company acceptable. And to that was added the heady spice of danger. After that brilliant piece of sharpshooting, he encouraged Lawford, we're going to be all right. We'll have a chance to get out of here. What about Mrs. Bickerstaff? Lawford asked. I was just thinking of her, and maybe you were right. Maybe I shouldn't have brought her, couldn't leave her with the army, though, could I? Not with Akeswell planning to sell her to a kin. A, a kin? A pimp. He really planned that? Lawford asked. Him and Morris, in it together they were. Bloody Akeswell told me as much the night he got me to hit him. And Morris was there with that little bastard Hicks, just waiting for me to do it. I was a bloody fool to fall for it, but there it is. Can you prove it? Prove it? Sharp asked derisively. Of course, I can't prove it, but it's true. He blew out a rueful breath. Just what am I going to do with Mary? Take her with you, of course, Lawford said sternly. Might not have a chance, Sharp said. Lawford stared at him for a few seconds. God, you're ruthless, he finally said. I'm a soldier. It fits. Sharp said it proudly, but he was not proud, merely defiant. What was he to do with Mary? And where was she? He drank the rest of his arak and clapped his hands for more. 
You want to find a baby tonight? he asked Lawford. A whore? Lawford asked in horror. I don't suppose a respectable woman will help us out much, not unless you want to spot a polite conversation. Lawford stared aghast at Sharp. What we should do, the lieutenant said softly, is find this man Ravi Shekhar. He may have a way of getting news out of the city. And how the hell are we supposed to find him? Sharp asked defiantly. We can't wander the bloody streets asking for this fellow in English. No one will know what the heck we're doing. I'll ask Mary to find him when we see her. He grinned. Booger, Shekhar. How about a bibby instead? Maybe I'll read. Your choice, Sharp said carelessly. Lawford hesitated, his face reddening. It's just that I've seen men with the pox, he explained. Christ, you've seen men vomit, but it don't stop you drinking. Besides, don't worry about the pox. That's why God gave us mercury. The stuff worked for bloody eggs well, didn't it? Though God knows why. Besides, Harry Hickson says he knows some clean girls, but of course they always say that. Still, if you want to ruin your eyes reading the Bible, go ahead, but there ain't no mercury that will give you your sight back. Lawford said nothing for a few seconds. Maybe I will come with you. He finally said shyly, staring down at the table. Learning how the other half lives, Sharp asked with a grin. Something like that, Lawford mumbled. Well enough, I tell you. Give us some cash and a willing couple of fraus and we can live like kings. We'll make this the last drink, eh? Don't want to lower the flag, do we? Lawford was now deep red. You won't, of course, tell anyone about this when we're back. Me? Sharp pretended to be astonished at the very idea. My lips are gummed together. Not a word. Promise. Lawford worried that he was letting his dignity slide, but he did not want to lose Sharp's approval. The lieutenant was becoming fascinated by the younger man's confidence and envied the way in which Sharp so instinctively negotiated a wicked world, and he wished he could find the same easy ability in himself. He thought briefly of the Bible waiting back in the barracks, and of his mother's advice to read it diligently, but then he decided to hell with them both. He drained his arrack, picked up his musket, and followed Sharp into the dusk. Every house in the city was prepared for the siege, Storehouses were filled with food, and valuables were being hastily concealed in case the enemy armies broke through the wall. Holes were dug in gardens and filled with coins and jewellery, and in some of the wealthier houses, whole rooms were concealed by false walls so that the women could be hidden away when the invaders rampaged through the streets. Mary helped General Appa Rao's household prepare for that ordeal, she felt guilty, not because she came from the army that was imposing this threatened misery on the city, but because she'd unexpectedly found herself happy in Rao's sprawling home. When General Appa Rao had first taken her away from Sharp, she'd been frightened, but the general had taken her to his own house and there reassured her of her safety. We must clean you, the general told her, and let that eye heal. He treated her gently, but with a measure of reserve that sprang from her dishevelled looks and her presumed history. The general did not believe that Mary was the most suitable addition to his household, but she spoke English, and Appa Rao was shrewd enough to reckon that a command of English would be a profitable accomplishment in Mysore's future. And he had three sons who would have to survive in that future. In time, Rao told Mary, you can join your man, but it's best he should settle in first. Her husband had told her that Mary had run with her lover, but Lakshmi decided to accept Mary's story. And the other man? she asked. He's just a friend of my brother's. Mary blushed at the lie, but Lakshmi did not seem to notice. They were both protecting me, Mary explained. That's good, that's good. Now, this. She held out a white petticoat that Mary stepped into. Lakshmi laced it tight at the back, then began hunting through the pile of saris. Green, she said, that'll suit you. And she unfolded a vast bolt of green silk that was four feet wide and over twenty feet long. You know how to wear a sari? Lakshmi asked. My mother taught me. In Calcutta? Lakshmi hooted. 
What do they know of saris in Calcutta? Skimpy little northern things, that's all they are. Here, let me. Lakshmi wrapped the first length of sari about Mary's slender waist and tucked it firmly into the petticoat's waistband. Then she wrapped a further length about the girl, but this she skillfully flicked into pleated folds that were again firmly anchored in the petticoat's waistband. Mary could easily have done the job herself, but Lakshmi took such pleasure in it that it would have been cruel to have denied her. By the time the pleats were tucked in, about half of the sari had been used up, and the rest Lakshmi looped over Mary's left shoulder, then tugged at the silk so that it fell in graceful folds. Then she stepped back. Perfect. Now you can come and help us in the kitchens. We'll burn those old clothes. In the mornings, Mary taught the general's three small boys English. They were bright children and learned quickly, and the hours passed pleasantly enough. In the afternoon, she helped in the household chores, but in the early evening it was her job to light the oil lamps about the house, and it was that duty that threw Mary into the company of Kunwa Singh, who, at about the same time as the lamps were lit, went around the house ensuring that the shutters were barred and the outer doors and gates either locked or guarded. He was the chief of Aparau's bodyguard, but his duties were more concerned with the household than with the general, who had enough soldiers surrounding him wherever he went in the city. Kunwar Singh, Mary learned, was a distant relation of the general, but there was something oddly sad about the tall young man, whose manners were so courteous but also so distant. We don't talk about it, Lakshmi said to Mary one afternoon when they were both hulling rice. I'm sorry, I asked. His father was disgraced, you see. Lakshmi went on enthusiastically, and so the whole family was disgraced. Kunwa's father managed some of our land near Sadasia, and he stole from us. Stole! And when he was found out, instead of throwing himself on my husband's mercy, he became a bandit. The Tipu's men caught him in the end and cut his head off. Poor Kunwa, it's hard to live down that sort of disgrace. Is it a worse disgrace than having been married to an Englishman? Mary asked miserably. Somehow in this lively house she did feel obscurely ashamed. She was half English herself, but under Lakshmi's swamping affection she kept remembering her mother, who had been rejected by her own people for marrying an Englishman. A disgrace? Married to an Englishman? What nonsense you do talk, girl? Lakshmi said. And the next day she took care to send Mary to deliver a present of food to the young deposed Raja of Mysore, who survived at the Tipu's mercy in a small house just east of the inner palace. But you can't go alone, Lakshmi said, not with the streets full of soldiers. Gunwa! And Lakshmi saw the blush of happiness on Mary's face as she set off in the tall Kunwa Singh's protective company. Mary was happy, but she felt guilty. She knew she ought to try and find Sharp, for she suspected he must be missing her. But she was suddenly so content in Appa Rao's household that she did not want to disturb that happiness by returning to her old world. She felt at home, and though the city was surrounded by enemies, she felt oddly safe. One day, she supposed, she would have to find Sharp, and perhaps everything would turn out well on that day. But Mary did nothing to hasten it. She just felt guilty and made sure that she did not start lighting the lamps until she heard the first shutter bar fall. And Lakshmi, who had been wondering just where she might find poor, disgraced Kunwa Singh a suitable bride, chuckled. Once the British and Hyderabad armies had made their permanent encampment to the west of Seringapatam, the siege settled into a pattern that both sides recognized. The Allied armies stayed well out of the range of even the largest cannon on the city's wall, and far beyond the reach of any rocket, but they established a picket line facing an earth-banked aqueduct that wended its way through the fields about a mile west of the city, and there they posted some field artillery and infantry to cover the land across which they would dig their approach ditches. The sooner those ditches were begun, the sooner the breaching batteries could be built, but to the south of that chosen ground the steeply banked aqueduct made a deep loop that penetrated a half-mile westward and the inside of that bend was filled by a tope, 
a thick wood, and from its leafy cover the Tipu's men kept up a galling musket fire on the British picket line, while his rocket men rained an erratic but troublesome barrage of missiles onto the forward British works. One lucky rocket streaked a thousand yards to hit an ammunition limber, and the resultant explosion caused a cheer to sound from the distant walls of the city. General Harris endured the rocket bombardment for two days, then decided it was time to capture the whole length of the aqueduct and clear the tope. Orders were written and trickled down from general to colonel to captains, and the captains sought out their sergeants. Get the men ready, sergeant. Morris told Hakeswell. Hakeswell was sitting in his own tent, a luxury he alone enjoyed among the thirty-third sergeants. The tent had belonged to Captain Hughes and should have been auctioned with the rest of the captain's belongings after Hughes died of the fever, but Hakeswell had simply claimed the tent, and no one had liked to cross him. His servant Razib, a miserable half-witted creature from Calcutta, was polishing Hakeswell's boots. So the sergeant had to come barefooted from his tent to face Morris. Ready, sir," he said. "They are ready, sir." He stared suspiciously about the light company's lines. "Better be ready, sir, or we'll have to skin off the lot of them." His face jerked. "Sixty rounds of ammunition," Morris said. "Always carry it, sir. Regulations, sir." Morris had drunk the best part of three bottles of wine at luncheon. And was in no mood to deal with Hakeswell's equivocations. He swore at the sergeant, then pointed south to where another rocket was smoking up from the tope. Tonight, you idiot, we're cleaning those bastards out of those trees. Ah,、uh, sir, Hakeswell was alarmed at the prospect. Just ah,、uh, sir, the whole battalion night attack inspection at sundown. Any man who looks drunk gets flogged. Officers accepted. Hakeswell thought. Then quivered as he offered Morris a cracking salute. Sir, inspection at sundown, sir. Permission to carry on, sir. He did not wait for Morris's permission, but turned back into his tent. Boots, give me a come on, you black bastard! He gave Razif a cuff round the ear and snatched his half-cleaned boots. He tugged them on, then dragged Razif by the ear to where the halberd was planted like a banner in front of the tent. Sharpen. Hakes were bald in the unfortunate boy's bruised ear. Sharp and understand, you toad-witted Ethan. I want it sharp. Hakes will gave the boy a parting slap as an encouragement, then stumped off through the lines. On your bleeding feet! He shouted. Look lively now. Time to earn your miserable pay. Are you drunk, Gerard? If you're drunk, boy, I'll have your bones given a stroke in. The battalion paraded at dusk. And to its surprise, found itself being inspected by its colonel, Arthur Wellesley. There was a feeling of relief in the ranks when Wellesley appeared, for by now every man knew that they were due for a fight, and none wished to go into battle under the uncertain leadership of Major Shee, who had drunk so much arrack that he was visibly swaying on his horse. Wellesley might be a cold-hearted bastard, but the men knew he was a careful soldier, and they even looked cheerful as he trotted down their ranks on his white horse. Each man had to demonstrate possession of sixty cartridges, and those who failed had their names taken for punishment. Two sepoy battalions from the East India Company's forces paraded behind the thirty-third, and just as the sun disappeared behind them, all three battalions marched southeastward toward the aqueduct. Their colours were flying, and Colonel Wellesley led them on horseback. Other King's battalions marched to their left. Going to attack the northern stretch of the aqueduct. So what are we doing, Lieutenant? Tom Garrard asked the newly promoted Lieutenant Fitzgerald. Silence in the ranks! Hakeswell bawled. He was talking to me, Sergeant. Fitzgerald said, and you will do me the honour of not interfering in my private conversations. Fitzgerald's retort improved the Irishman's stock with the company twentyfold. He was popular anyway, for he was a cheerful and easy-going young man. Hakeswell growled. Fitzgerald claimed his brother was the Knight of Kerry, whatever the holy hell that was, but the claim did not impress Sergeant Obadiah Hakeswell. Proper officers left discipline to sergeants. They did not curry favour with the men by telling jokes and chatting away like magpies. 
It was also plain that Brevet Lieutenant Bloody Fitzgerald did not like Sergeant Hakeswell, for he took every chance he could to countermand Hakeswell's authority, and Hakeswell was determined to change that. The sergeant's face twitched. There was nothing he could do at this moment, but Mr. Fitzgerald, he told himself, would be taught his lesson, and the sooner it was taught, the better. You see those trees ahead, Fitzgerald explained to Garrett. We're going to clear the Tipu's boys out of them. How many of the bastards, sir? Hundreds, Fitzgerald answered cheerfully, and all of them quaking at the knees to think that the havoc aches are coming to give them a thrashing. The Tipu's boys might be quaking, but they could clearly see the three battalions approaching, and their rocket men sent up a fiery barrage in greeting. The missiles climbed through the darkening sky, their exhaust flames unnaturally bright, as they spewed volcanoes of sparks into the smoke trails that mingled as the rockets reached their apogee and then plunged toward the British and Indian infantry. No breaking ranks, an officer shouted and the three battalions marched stolidly on as the opening barrage plunged down to explode all around them. Some jeers greeted the barrage's inaccuracy, but the officers and sergeants shouted for silence. More rockets climbed and fell. Most screamed erratically, of course, but a few came close enough to make men duck, and one exploded just a few feet from the 33rd's light company, so that the sharp-edged scraps of its shattered tin nose-cone whistled about their ears. Men laughed at their narrow escape. Then someone saw that Lieutenant Fitzgerald was staggering. Sir, it's nothing, boys, nothing, Fitzgerald called. A scrap of the rocket cylinder had torn open his left arm, and there was a gash on the back of his head that was dripping blood from the ends of his hair. But he shook off any help. "'Takes more than a black man's rocket to knock down an Irishman,' he said happily. "'Ain't that right, O'Reilly?' "'It is, sir,' the Irish private answered. "'Got skulls like bloody buckets we have,' Fitzgerald said, and crammed his tattered shako back on his head. His left arm was numb, and blood had soaked his sleeve to the wrist, but he was determined to keep going. He had taken worse injuries on the hunting field, and still been in his saddle at the death of the fox.' Hakeswell's resentment of Fitzgerald seethed. How dare a mere lieutenant overrule him? A bloody child, not nineteen years old yet, and still with the bog water wet behind his ears? Hakeswell slashed at a cactus with his halberd, and the savagery of the gesture dislodged the musket that was slung on his left shoulder. The sergeant never usually carried a musket, but tonight he was armed with a halberd, the musket, a bayonet, and a brace of pistols. Except for the brief fight at Malavelli, it had been years since Hakeswell had been in a battle, and he was not sure he wanted to fight another this night. But if he did, then he would make damn sure that he carried more weapons than any heathen enemy he might meet. The sun had long gone by the time Wellesley halted the three battalions, though a lambent light still suffused the western sky, and under its pale glow the 33rd formed line. The two sepoy battalions waited a quarter of a mile behind the 33rd. The rocket trails seemed brighter now as they climbed into a cloudless twilight sky, where the first few stars pricked the dark. The missiles hissed as they streaked overhead, their smoke trails made lurid by the spitting flames. Spent rockets lay on the ground, with small pale flames flickering feebly from their exhausts. The weapons were spectacular, but so inaccurate that even the inexperienced 33rd no longer feared them. But their relief was tempered by a sudden display of bright sparks at the lip of the aqueduct's embankment. The sparks were instantly extinguished by a cloud of powder smoke, and the sound of musketry followed a few seconds later. But the range was too great, and the balls spent themselves harmlessly. Wellesley galloped his horse to Major Shee's side, spoke briefly, then spurred on. "'Flank companies!' the colonel shouted. "'Advance in line!' "'That's us, boys,' Fitzgerald said, and drew his sabre. His left arm was throbbing now, but he did not need it to fight with a blade. He would keep going. The grenadier and light companies advanced from the two flanks of the battalion. Wellesley halted them, formed them into a line of two ranks, and ordered them to load their muskets. Ramrods rattled into barrels. 
Fix bayonets, the colonel called, and the men drew out their seventeen-inch blades and slotted them onto the musket muzzles. It was full night now, but the heat was still like a wet blanket. The sound of slaps echoed through the ranks as men swatted at mosquitoes. The colonel curbed his white horse at the front of the two ranks. We're going to chase the enemy off the embankment, he said, in his cold, precise voice. And once we've cleared them away, Major Shee will bring on the rest of the battalion to drive the enemy out of the trees altogether. Captain West? Sir. Francis West, the commander of the Grenadier Company, was senior to Morris, and so was in charge of the two companies. You may advance. At once, sir, West said. Detachment, forward. I'm in your hands, mother, Hakeswell said under his breath as the two companies began their advance. Look after me now. Oh, God in his heaven, but the black bastards are firing at us. Mother, it's your Obadiah here, mother. Steady in the line. Sergeant Green's voice called, Don't hurry, keep your ranks. Morris had discarded his horse and drawn his sabre. He felt distinctly unwell. Give them steel when we get there, he called to his company. We should give the buggers some bleeding artillery, someone muttered. Who said that? Hakeswell shouted. Keep your bleeding tongue still. The first balls were whistling past their ears now, and the crackle of the enemy's musketry filled the night. The Tipu's men were firing from the aqueduct's embankment, and the flames of their fusillades sparked bright against the dark background of the taupe. The two companies instinctively spread out as they advanced, and the corporals, charged to be file closers, bawled at them to close up. The ground was night dark, but the skyline above the trees still showed clearly enough. Lieutenant Fitzgerald glanced behind once, and was appalled to see that the western sky was still touched by a blazing streak, and he knew that crimson glow would silhouette the company once it climbed the embankment. But there was no going back now. He stretched his long legs, eager to be first into the enemy lines. Wellesley was advancing behind the companies, and Fitzgerald wanted to impress the colonel. The musketry fire blazed along the embankment's lip, each shot a spark of brightness that glowed briefly in the dark smoke. But the fire was wildly inaccurate, for the attackers were still in the night-shadowed low ground and concealed by the defenders' own powder smoke. Far off to their left, other battalions were assaulting the northern stretch of the embankment, and Fitzgerald heard a cheer as those men charged home. Then Captain West gave the order to charge, and the men of the 33rd's two flank companies let loose their own cheer as they were released from the leash. They ran hard toward the embankment. Musket balls whipped overhead. All the redcoats wanted now was to get this attack over and done. Kill a few bastards, loot a few bodies, then get the hell back to the camp. They cheered as they reached the embankment and clambered up its short, steep slope. Kill them, boys! Fitzgerald shouted as he reached the crest. But there was suddenly no enemy there, only a still stretch of dark, gleaming water. And as the attackers joined him, they all checked, rather than plunge into the aqueduct. A blast of musketry erupted from the farther bank. The light company, poised on the lip of the western bank, was silhouetted against the remnants of the daylight, while the Tipu's men were shrouded by the taupe's night-dark trees. Redcoats fell as the bullets thumped home. The aqueduct was only about ten paces wide, and at that range the Mysorean infantry could not miss. One man was lifted right off his feet and thrown back onto the ground behind the embankment. Rockets slashed across the dark water, their fiery trails slicing just inches above the twin embankments. For a few seconds no one knew what to do. A man gasped as a rocket snatched off his foot. Then he slid down into the weed-thick water, where his blood swirled dark. Some redcoats fired back at the trees, but they fired blind, and their bullets hit nothing. The wounded stumbled back down the embankment. The dead twitched as they were struck by bullets, while the living were dazed by the noise and dazzled by the rocket's dreadful red tails. Captain Morris stared in confusion, He'd somehow not expected to cross the aqueduct. 
He had thought the trees were on this side of the water, and he did not know what to do. But then Lieutenant Fitzgerald gave a shout of defiance and jumped down into the waterway. The black water came up to his waist. Come on, boys, come on. There's not so many of the bastards. He waded forward, his naked saber bright in the starlight. Let's flush them out. Come on, have a cakes. Follow him, lads. Sergeant Green shouted, and about half the light company jumped into the green scummed water. The others crouched, waiting for Morris's orders. But Morris was still confused, and Sergeant Hakeswell was crouching at the foot of the embankment out of the enemy's sight. Go on! Wellesley shouted, angered at their hesitation. Go on, don't let them stand there. Captain West, on, on, Captain Morris, move. Oh, Jesus, mother. Hakeswell called as he scrambled up the embankment. Mother, mother, he shouted as he dropped into the warm water. Fitzgerald and the first half of the company was already across the farther embankment and inside the tope now, and Hakeswell could hear shouts and shots and a chilling clash of steel scraped on steel. Wellesley saw his two flank companies at last advance across the aqueduct, and he sent an aide back to summon Major She and the rest of the battalion. The musket fire in the tope was dense, an unending crackle of shots, each flash momentarily illuminating the fog of powder smoke that spread between the leaves. It looked like something from hell, flash after flash of fire blooming in the dark, rocket trails blazing among the trees, and always the moans of dying men and shrieks of pain. A sergeant yelled at his men to close up. Another man shouted desperately, wanting to know where his comrades were. Fitzgerald was cheering his men forward, but too many of the redcoats were being penned back against the embankment, where they were in danger of being overwhelmed. Wellesley sensed he'd done this all wrong. He should have used the whole battalion instead of just the two flank companies, and the realization of his mistake annoyed him. He took pride in his profession, but if a professional soldier could not hurl a few enemy infantry and rocket men out of a small wood, then what good was he? He thought about spurring Diomed, his horse, across the aqueduct and into the flaring smoke patches among the tope. But he resisted the impulse, for then he would be among the trees and out of touch with the rest of the thirty-third, and he knew he needed She's remaining eight companies to reinforce the attackers. If necessary, he could summon the two sepoy battalions as reinforcements, but he was sure the remainder of the thirty-third would be sufficient to retrieve victory from confusion, and so he turned and galloped back to hurry the battalion forward. Hakeswell slithered down the farther embankment into the black shadows among the trees. He held the musket in his left hand and the halberd in his right. He crouched beside a tree trunk and tried to make sense of the chaos around him. He could see muskets flashing, their garish flames momentarily suffusing the smoke with light and glinting off the leaves. He could hear a man crying and he could hear shouts, but he had no idea what was happening. A handful of his men had stayed close to him, but Hakeswell did not know what to tell them. Then a terrible war cry sounded close to his left, and he whirled round to see a group of tiger striped infantry charging toward him. He screamed in pure panic, fired the musket one handed, and dropped the weapon immediately as he fled into the trees to avoid the assault. Some of the redcoats scattered blindly, but others were too slow. And were overrun by the Indians. Their shouts were cut short as bayonets did their work, and Hakeswell, knowing that the Tipu's men were slaughtering the small group of redcoats, blundered desperately through the tangling trees to get clear. Captain Morris was calling Hakeswell's name, a note of panic in his voice. I'm here, sir, Hakeswell called back. I'm here, sir. Where? Yes,、yeah, sir. A volley of musketry crashed in the trees, and the balls slashed through leaves and thumped into trunks. Rockets screamed up to clatter among the high branches. Their fiery exhausts blinded the men, and the explosions of their powder-filled cones rained down shards of hot metal and fluttering scraps of leaves. Mother, Hakeswell shouted and shrank down beside a tree. Form line, Morris shouted. Form line. He had a dozen men with him, and they formed a nervous line and crouched among the trees. The reflected flames of the burning rockets flickered red on their bayonets. Somewhere nearby, a man panted as he died. 
the blood bubbling in his gullet at the end of every laboured breath. A volley crackled and splintered a few yards away, but it was fired away from Morris, who nevertheless ducked. Then for a few blessed seconds the confusing noise of battle diminished, and in the comparative silence Morris looked around to try and find some bearings. "'Lieutenant Fitzgerald!' he shouted. "'I'm here, sir!' Fitzgerald called confidently from the darkness ahead. "'Up a front of you. Cleared the buggers out of here, sir, but some of the rascals are working about your flank. Watch the left, sir!' The Irishman sounded indecently cheerful. "'Ensign Hicks!' Morris called. "'I'm here, sir, right beside you, sir!' A small voice said from almost beneath Morris. "'Jesus Christ!' Morris swore. He had been hoping that Hicks could have brought reinforcements, but it seemed that no one except Fitzgerald had any control in the chaos. Fitzgerald! Morris shouted. Still here, sir. Got the buggers worried? We have. I want you here, Lieutenant, Morris insisted. Hakeswell, where are you? Yes, sir, Hakeswell said, but not moving from his hiding place among the bushes. He guessed he was a few paces north of Morris, but Hakeswell did not want to risk being ambushed by a tiger-striped soldier as he blundered about in search of his captain, and so he stayed put. I mean to join you, sir he called, then crouched even lower among the shrouding leaves. Fitzgerald! Morris shouted irritably. Come here! The bloody man! Fitzgerald said under his breath. His left arm was useless now, and he sensed it had been injured more badly than he'd supposed. He'd ordered a man to tie a handkerchief around the wound and hoped the pressure would staunch the blood. The thought of gangrene was nagging at him, but he pushed that worry away to concentrate on keeping his men alive. Sergeant Green! Sir! Green responded stoically. Stay with the men here, Sergeant! Fitzgerald ordered. The Irishman had led a score of the light company deep into the taupe, and he saw no point in surrendering the ground just because Morris was nervous. Besides, Fitzgerald was fairly sure that the Tipu's troops were just as confused as the British. And if Green stayed steady and used volley fire, he should be safe enough. I'd bring the rest of the company back here, Fitzgerald promised Sergeant Green. Then the lieutenant turned and called back through the trees. Where are you, sir? Here, Morris called irritably. Hurry, damn you! Back in a minute, Sergeant, Fitzgerald reassured Green and headed off through the trees in search of Morris. He strayed too far north, and suddenly a rocket flared up from the taupe's eastern edge to lodge with a tearing crash among the tangling branches of a tall tree. For a few seconds, the trapped missile thrashed wildly, startling scared birds up into the dark. Then it became firmly wedged in the crook of a branch. The exhaust poured an impotent torrent of fire and smoke to illuminate a whole patch of the thick woodland and in the sudden blaze, Hakeswell saw the lieutenant stumbling toward him. Mr. Fitzgerald, Hakeswell called. Sergeant Hakeswell, Fitzgerald asked. It's me, sir, right here, sir, this way, sir. Thank God. Fitzgerald crossed the clearing at a run, his left arm hanging uselessly at his side. No one knows what the hell they're doing, or where they are. I know what I'm doing, sir, Hakeswell said and as the fierce crackling fire in the high leaves died away, he lunged upward with a halberd's spear point at the lieutenant's belly. His face twitched as the newly sharpened blade ripped through the lieutenant's clothes and into his stomach. It isn't the soldierly thing, sir, to contradict a sergeant in front of his men, sir, he said respectfully. You do understand that, sir, don't you, sir? Hakeswell said, and grinned with joy for the pleasure of the moment. The spear point was deep in Fitzgerald's belly, so deep that Hakeswell was certain he had felt its razor-sharp point lodge against the man's backbone. Fitzgerald was on the ground now, and his body was jerking like a gaffed and landed fish. His mouth was opening and closing, but he seemed unable to speak, only to moan as Hakeswell gave the spear a savage twist in an effort to free its blade. We is talking about proper respect, sir. Hakeswell hissed at the lieutenant. Respect. Sergeants must be supported, sir. Says so in the scriptures, sir. Don't worry, sir. Won't hurt, sir. Just a prick. 
and he jerked the bloodied blade free and thrust it down again, this time into the lieutenant's throat. Won't be showing me up again, sir, will you, sir? Not in front of the men. Sorry about that, sir. And good night, sir. Fitzgerald, Morris shouted frantically. For Christ's sake, Lieutenant, where the hell are you? He's gone to hell. Hakeswell chuckled softly. He was searching the lieutenant's body for coins. He dared not take anything that might be recognized as the lieutenant's property. So he left the dead man's sabre and the gilded gorget he'd worn about his throat. But he did find a handful of unidentifiable small change, which he pushed into his pouch before scrambling a few feet away, to make sure no one saw him with his victim. Who's that? Morris called as he heard Hakeswell pushing through the undergrowth. Me, sir, Hakeswell called. I'm looking for Lieutenant Fitzgerald, sir. Come here instead, Morris snapped. Hakeswell ran the last few yards and dropped down between Morris and a frightened Ensign Hicks. I'm worried about Mr. Fitzgerald, sir, Hakeswell said. Heard him up in the bushes and there was Edens there, sir. I know, sir, because I killed a couple of the black bastards. He flinched as some muskets flamed and banged some yards away, but he could not tell who fired or at what. You think the bastards found Fitzgerald? Morris asked. I reckon so, Hakeswell said. Poor little bastard, I tried to find him, sir, but there was just Ethan's there. Jesus! Morris ducked as a volley of bullets flicked through the leaves overhead. What about Sergeant Green? Probably skulking, sir. Eyed in his precious eye, I don't wonder. We're all bloody skulking, Morris answered truthfully enough. Not me, sir. Not over dire Hakeswell, sir. Got me our bird proper wet, sir. Want to feel it, sir? Hakeswell held out the spear point. Ethan blood, sir, still warm. Morris shuddered at the thought of touching the spear, but took some comfort in having Hakeswell at his side. The tope was filled with shouts as a group of the Tipu's troops charged. Muskets hammered. A rocket exploded nearby. While another, this one with a solid shot in its cone, ripped through bushes and crashed into a tree. A man screamed, then the scream was abruptly chopped off. Jesus! Morris cursed uselessly. Maybe we should go back, Ensign Hicks suggested. Back across the aqueduct. Can't, sir, Hakeswell said. Buggers are behind us. You're sure? Morris asked. Fought the black buggers there myself, sir. Couldn't hold them. Old tribe of the bastards, sir. Did me best. Lost some good men. Hakeswell sniffed with pretended emotion. You're a brave man, Hakeswell, Morris said gruffly. Just following your lead, sir, Hakeswell said, then ducked as another enemy volley whipped overhead. A huge cheer sounded, followed by the screaming roar of rockets as the Tipu's reinforcements, sent from the city, came shouting and fighting through the trees to drive every last infidel from the tope. Lead it, L, Hakeswell said. But not to worry, I can't die, sir. I can't die. Behind him there was another cheer as the rest of the 33rd at last crossed the aqueduct. Forward! A voice shouted from somewhere behind the light company's scattered fugitives. Forward! Bloody hell! Morris snapped. Who the hell is that? 33rd! The voice shouted. To me! To me! Stay where you are! Morris called to a few eager men and so they crouched in the warm dark that was loud with the ripping of bullets, and filled by the whimpers of dying men, and bright with the glare of rockets, and foul with the stench of blood that was being spilt in a black place where only chaos and fear prevailed. Chapter 7 Sharp! Sharp! It was Colonel Goudin who at nightfall burst into the barracks room. Come quick, as you are. Hurry. What about me, sir? Lawford asked. The lieutenant had been idly reading his Bible as he lay on his cot. Come on, Sharp. Goudin did not wait to answer Lawford, but just ran across the barracks courtyard and out into the street which separated the European soldiers' quarters from the Hindu temple. Quick, Sharp, the Frenchman called back as he hurried past a pile of mud bricks that were stacked at the street corner.
This book is continued on Disc 7. Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell continued. Disc 7. Goudin did not wait to answer Lawford, but just ran across the barracks courtyard and out into the street which separated the European soldiers' quarters from the Hindu temple. Quick, Sharp! the Frenchman called back as he hurried past a pile of mud bricks that were stacked at the street corner. Sharp, dressed in tiger-striped tunic and boots, but with no hat, crossbelt, pouches or musket, ran after the colonel. He leapt over a half-naked man who was sitting cross-legged beside the temple wall, shoved a cow out of his way, then turned the corner and hurried after Goudin toward the Mysore gate. Lawford had paused to tug on his boots, and by the time he reached the street beside the temple, Sharp had already vanished. Can you ride a horse? Goudin shouted at Sharp when the two men reached the gate. I did a couple of times, Sharp said not bothering to explain that the beasts had been unsaddled draft horses that had ambled docilely around the inn-yard. "'Get on that one!' Goudin said, pointing to a small, excited mare that was being held by an Indian infantryman along with Goudin's own horse. "'She belongs to Captain Huamay, so for God's sake take care!' Goudin shouted as he swung himself up into the saddle. Captain Huamay was one of Goudin's two deputies— but as both the junior French officers spent most of their lives in the city's most expensive brothel, Sharp had yet to meet either of them. He climbed gingerly onto the mare's back, then kicked back his heels and clung desperately to the horse's mane as she followed Goudin's gelding into the gateway. The British are attacking a wood just north of Sultan Petta, the colonel explained as he pushed his horse through the crowded archway. Sharp could hear the distant fight. Muskets snapped, and shells exploded dully to flicker red bursts of light far to the city's west. It was very nearly night in the city. The first house lamps had long been lit, and flaming torches smoked in the archway of the Mysore Gate, through which a stream of men was hurrying. Some were infantry, others carried rockets. Goudin bellowed at them for passage, used his gelding to force the slower rocket men aside, and then, once through the gate, he soared on his reins to turn westward. Sharp followed, more intent on staying on the mare than watching the excitement that seethed around him. A narrow bridge led across the south corvery just outside the gate, and Goudin shouted at its guards to clear the roadway. Rocket men shrank back against the balustrades as Sharp and Goudin hurried between the bridge's small forts and then over the shallow shrunken river. Once on the far bank they galloped hard across a stretch of muddy grass, then splashed through another small branch of the river. Sharp clung to the mare's neck as she lurched up out of the stream. Rockets were flaring in the sky ahead, which still glowed from the last rays of the invisible sun. Your old friends are trying to clear the top, Goudin explained, pointing at the thick wood that showed black against the eastern skyline. He had slowed down, for now they were crossing more uneven ground, and the colonel did not want to break a horse's leg by being too reckless. I want you to confuse them. Me, sir? Sharp slipped half out of the saddle, gripped the pommel desperately, and somehow dragged himself upright. He could hear the snapping crack of muskets and see the small muzzle flames flickering all across the land ahead. It seemed to him like a major attack, especially when a British field gun fired in the distance and its muzzle flame lit the twilight like sheet lightning. Shout orders at them, Sharp, Goudin said, when the report of the gun had rolled past them. Confuse them. Lawford would have done better, sir, Sharp said. He's got a voice like an officer... Then you'll have to sound like a sergeant, Goudin said. And if you do it right, Sharp, I'll make you up to copper. Thank you, sir. Goudin had slowed his horse to a walk as they neared the wood. It was too dark to trot now, and there was a danger they could lose their way. To Sharp's north, where the field gun had fired, the musketry was regular, suggesting that the British soldiers or sepoys were steadily taking their objectives. But in the wood in front there seemed to be nothing but confusion. Muskets crackled irregularly, rockets streaked fire amongst the branches, and smoke boiled from small brush fires. 
Sharp could hear men shouting, either in fear or triumph. I wouldn't mind a gun, sir, he said to Gouda. You don't need one. We're not here to fight, just to mix them up. That's why I came back to get you. Dismount here. The colonel tied both horses' reins to an abandoned handcart that must have been used to bring more rockets forward. The two men were a hundred yards short of the tope now, and Sharp could hear officers shouting orders. It was hard to tell who was giving the orders, for the Tipu's army used English words of command. But as Sharp and Goudin hurried closer to the fight, Sharp could tell that it was Indian voices that shouted the commands to fire, to advance, and to kill. Whatever British or Indian troops were trying to capture the wood were evidently in trouble, and it had been Goudin's inspiration to snatch the first Englishman he could find in the barracks and use him to sow even more confusion among the attackers. Goudin drew a pistol. Sergeant Rotier, he called. Mon colonel. The big sergeant who had first used Captain Rome's horse to reach the fight materialized out of the gloom. He gave Sharp a suspicious, glowering look, then cocked his musket. Let's enjoy ourselves, Goudin said in English. Aye, sir, Sharp said, and wonder what the hell he should do now. In the dark, he reckoned there should be no trouble in slipping away from the Colonel and Rotier and joining the beleaguered attackers. But how would that leave Lieutenant Lawford? The trick of it, Sharp decided, was not to make it look as though he was deliberately trying to get back to the British, but rather to make it seem as though he was captured accidentally. That still might make things very awkward for Lawford. But Sharp knew that his overriding duty was to carry McCandless's warning to General Harris. Just as he knew that he might never get another opportunity as good as this one that Goudin had dropped so unexpectedly into his lap, Goudin paused at the edge of the top. Rocket men were enthusiastically blasting their weapons through the trees, where the missiles were being deflected off branches, to tumble erratically through the leaves. Muskets sounded deep inside the wood. Wounded men lay at the tree's edge. And somewhere not far off, a dying man alternately screamed and panted. So far, Goudin said, we seem to be beating them. Let's go forward. Sharp followed the two Frenchmen. Off to his right, there was a sudden blast of gunfire and the sound of bayonets clashing, and Goudin swerved toward the sound, but the fight was over before they ever reached it. The Tipu's men had encountered a small group of redcoats and had killed one and chased the others deeper into the wood. Goudin saw the redcoat's body in the fast dying flame light of an exhausted rocket, and knelt beside the man. The colonel took out a tinder box, struck a spark, blew the charred linen in the box alight, then held the tiny flame down beside the redcoat's chest. The man was not quite dead, but he was unconscious. Blood was bubbling slow in his throat, and his eyes were closed. Recognize the uniform? Goudin asked Sharp. The tinderbox's flickering glow revealed that the redcoat's turned backs and facings were scarlet, piped with white. Bloody hell! Sharp said. Excuse me, sir. He added. Then he gently moved Goudin's hand up to the dying man's face. Blood had poured out of the man's mouth to soak his powdered hair, but Sharp recognized him all the same. It was Jed Mallinson who usually paraded in the rearmost rank of Sharp's file. I know the uniform and the man, sir. Sharp told Goudin, "It's the thirty-third, my old battalion, West Riding, Yorkshire." Good. Goudin snapped the tinderbox shut, extinguishing the small flame. And you don't mind confusing them? That's why I'm here, sir. Sharp said with a suitable bloodthirstiness, "I think the British Army lost a good man in you, Sharp." Goudin said, standing and guiding Sharp deeper into the trees, "If you don't want to stay in India, you might think of coming home with me, to France, sir." Goudin smiled at Sharp's surprised tone. "It isn't the devil's country, Sharp. Indeed, I suspect it's the most blessed place on God's earth." And in the French army, a good man can be very easily raised to officer rank. Me, sir, an officer. Sharp laughed, like making a mule into a racehorse. You underestimate yourself. Goudin paused. There were feet trampling to the right, and a sudden blast of musketry off to the left. The musketry attracted an excited rush of the Tipu's infantry, who blundered through the trees. 
Sergeant Rotier bellowed at them in a mix of French and Canaries, and his sudden authority calmed the men who gathered around Colonel Goudin. Goudin smiled wolfishly. Let's see if we can mislead some of your old comrades, Sharp. Shout at them to come this way. Forward! Sharp obediently bellowed into the dark trees. Forward! He paused, listening for an answer. Thirty third to me, to me. No one responded. Try a name, Goudin suggested. Sharp invented an officer's name. Captain Fellows, this way. He called it a dozen times, but there was no response. Hakeswill, he finally shouted. Sergeant Hakeswill. Then, from maybe thirty paces away, the hated voice called back, "Who's that?" The sergeant sounded suspicious. "Come here, man!" Sharp snapped. Hakeswill ignored the order, but the fact that a man had replied at all cheered Goudin, who had quietly formed the stray unit of the Tipu's infantry into a line that waited to kill whoever came in response to Sharp's hailing. Chaos reigned ahead. Rockets banged into branches. Musket flames flared in the drifting smoke. While bullets thumped into trees or crackled through the thick leaves, a bloodthirsty cheer sounded a long way off. But whether it was Indian or British troops who cheered, Sharp could not tell. One thing was plain to Sharp: the thirty-third was in trouble. Poor Jed Mallinson should never have been abandoned to die, and that sad death, along with the scattered sounds of firing, suggested that the Tipu's men had succeeded in splitting the attacking force. And was now picking it off piece by piece. It was now or never. Sharp reckoned he had to get away from Goudin and somehow rejoin his battalion. I need to get closer, sir. He told the colonel, and without waiting for Goudin's consent, he ran deeper into the trees. Sergeant Hakeswell, he shouted as he ran. To me now, now! Come on, you miserable bastard! Move your bloody self! Come on! He could hear Goudin following him, so Sharp fell silent. And suddenly, deep in shadow, dodged off to his right. Sharp, Goudin hissed. But Sharp was well away from the colonel now, and he reckoned he'd done it without looking like a deserter. Sergeant Hakeswill, Sharp bellowed, then ran on again. There was a danger that by shouting he would keep Goudin on his heels, but it was a greater danger to let the Frenchman think that he was deliberately trying to rejoin the British, for then Lawford might suffer. And so Sharp ran the risk as he worked his way still farther into the dense trees. Eggswell, to me, to me! He pushed through thick foliage, tripped over a bush, picked himself up, and ran on into a clearing. Eggswell! He shouted. A rocket crashed into a branch high above Sharp and slashed straight down into the clearing ahead of him. Once on the ground, the missile circled furiously like a mad dog chasing its own tail. And the brilliant light of the exhaust lit the trees all around. Sharp flinched away from the lash of the fiery tail, and almost ran straight into Sergeant Hakeswell, who had suddenly appeared from the bushes to his left. "Sharpy!" Hakeswell shouted. "You bastard!" He slashed wildly at Sharp with his bloody halberd. Morris, hearing Hakeswell's name shouted, had ordered the sergeant to find whoever was summoning him, and Hakeswell had unwillingly obeyed. Now suddenly, Hakeswell was alone with Sharp, and the sergeant slammed the spear forward again. "Treacherous little bastard!" Hakeswell said. "For Christ's sake, drop it!" Sharp shouted, retreating before the quick lunges of the spearhead. "Running off to the enemy, Sharp?" He,、eh? Hakeswell said. "I should take you in, shouldn't I? It'll be another court martial and a firing party this time." But I won't risk that. I'm going to put your gizzards on a skewer, Sharpie, and send you back to your maker. And we're in a frock too. The sergeant stabbed again, and Sharp leapt back once more. But then the dying rocket fizzed across the clearing, and its long bamboo stick tangled Sharp's legs. He fell backward, and Hakeswill gave a shout of triumph as he sprang toward him with a halberd poised, ready to lunge downward. Sharp felt the rocket's iron tube under his right hand, gripped it, and threw it up at Hakeswell's face. The rocket's gunpowder fuel was almost gone, but there was just enough left to spurt one last sudden flame that licked across Hakeswell's blue-eyed face. The sergeant screamed, dropped the halberd, and clapped his hands to his eyes. 
To his surprise, he discovered he could still see and that his face was not badly burned. But in his panic, he'd stumbled past Sharp, and so now he turned back, and as he did so, he dragged a pistol out of his belt. Just then, a squad of redcoats burst into the clearing. The burning carcass of the rocket showed that there were men from the 33rd's Grenadier Company, who were as lost as every other redcoat on this night of chaos. One of the grenadiers saw Sharp, who, in his tiger-striped tunic, was scrambling to his feet. The grenadier raised his gun. Leave that bastard, Hicksville screamed. He's mine. Then a volley of musketry flamed from the trees, and half of the grenadiers spun around or were hurled backward. Blood hissed in the fiery remnants of the rocket as a company of tiger-striped troops burst out of the trees. Colonel Goudin and Sergeant Rottier led them. Hakeswell turned to run at the sight of the enemy, but one of the Tipu's men lunged forward with a bayonet-tipped musket and succeeded in driving the sergeant down to the ground, where he first twisted frantically aside, then screamed for mercy. Goudin ran past the fallen Hakeswell. "'Well done, Sharp!' Goudin called. "'Well done! Stop that! Stop that!' These last orders were to the Tipu's men, who had enthusiastically begun to bayonet the surviving grenadiers. "'We take prisoners!' Goudin roared. "'Prisoners!' Rotier knocked a bayonet aside to stop the soldier from slaughtering Hakeswell. Sharp was cursing. He'd so nearly got clean away. If Hakeswell had not attacked him, he might have run another fifty yards through the trees, discarded the tiger-striped tunic, and discovered some of his old friends. Instead, he'd become a hero to Goudin, who believed that Sharp had lured all the grenadiers into the clearing, where the twelve who had survived the enthusiastic attack were now prisoners, along with the twitching and cursing Hakeswell. "'You took a terrible risk, Corporal,' Goudin said, coming back to Sharp and sheathing his sword. "'You could have been shot by your old friends, but it worked, eh? And now you are a Corporal.' "'Aye, oh, sir, it worked,' Sharp said, though he took no pleasure in it. It had all gone so disastrously wrong. Indeed, a whole night had gone disastrously wrong for the British. The Tipu's men were now clearing the tope, yard by yard, and chasing British survivors back across the aqueduct. They pursued the beaten fugitives with jeers, volleys of musket fire, and salvos of rockets. Thirteen prisoners had been taken, all by Sharp and Goudin, and those unfortunate men were herded back toward the city, while the red-coat dead were looted for weapons and valuables. "'I'll make sure the Tipu hears of your bravery, Sharp,' Goudin said as he retrieved his horse. "'He's a brave man himself, and he admires it in others. "'I don't doubt he'll want to reward you.' "'Thank you, sir,' Sharp said, though without enthusiasm. "'You're not wounded, are you?' Goudin asked anxiously, struck by the forlorn tone of Sharp's voice. "'Burn me hand, sir.' Sharp said. He'd not realized it when he snatched up the rocket tube to fend off Hakeswell, but the metal cylinder had scorched his hand, though not badly. Nothing much, he added. I'll live. Of course you'll live, Goudin said, then laughed delightedly. Gave them a beating, didn't we? Trounced them proper, sir. And we'll trounce them again, Sharp, when they attack the city. They don't know what's waiting for them. What is waiting for them, sir? Sharp asked. You'll see. You'll see, Goudin said, then hauled himself up into his saddle. Sergeant Rottier wanted to stay in the taupe to retrieve British muskets, so the colonel insisted that Sharp ride the second horse back to the city with the disconsolate prisoners who were under the guard of a gleeful company of the Tipu's troops. Hakeswell looked up at Sharp and spat. Bloody traitor! Ignore him! Goudin said, Snake. Hakeswell hissed, Piece of no good shit, that's what you are, Sharpie. Jesus Christ. This last imprecation was because one of the escorting soldiers had hit the back of Hakeswell's head with a musket barrel. Black bastard. Hakeswell muttered, I'd like to kick his bloody teeth in, sir, Sharp said to Goudin. In fact, if you've no objection, sir, I'll take the bastard into the dark and finish him off. Goudin sighed. I do object, the colonel said mildly, because it's rather important we treat prisoners well, Sharp. I sometimes fear that Tipu doesn't understand the courtesies of war, but so far I've managed to persuade him that if we treat our prisoners properly, 
then our enemies will treat theirs properly in return. I'd still like to kick the bastard's teeth in, sir. I assure you the Tipu might do that without any help from you, Gudal said grimly. Sharp and the colonel spurred ahead of the prisoners to cross the bridge back to the city, where they dismounted at the Mysore gate. Sharp handed the mayor's reins to Gudal, who thanked him yet again, and tossed him a whole golden hydari as a reward. Go and get drunk, Sharp, the colonel said. You deserve it. Thank you, sir. And believe me, I'll tell the Tipu. He admires bravery. Lieutenant Lawford was among the curious crowd who waited just inside the gate. What happened? he asked Sharp. I buggered up, Sharp said bitterly. I bloody well buggered it up. Come on, let's spend some money, get drunk. No, wait! Lawford had seen the redcoats coming through the flame light of the gate torches, and he pulled away from Sharp to watch as the thirteen prisoners were pushed at bayonet point into the city. The crowd began jeering. Come away! Sharp insisted, and he tugged at Lawford's elbow. Lawford shook off the tug and stared at the prisoners, unable to hide his chagrin at the sight of British soldiers being herded into captivity. Then he recognized Hakeswell, who at the same instant stared into the lieutenant's face, and Sharp saw Hakeswell's look of utter astonishment. For a second the world seemed to pause in its turning. Lawford appeared unable to move, while Hakeswell was gaping with disbelief and seemed about to shout his recognition. Sharp was reaching to snatch a musket from one of the Tipu's infantrymen, but then Hakeswell turned deliberately away and composed his features, as though sending a silent message that he would not remark on Lawford's presence. The twelve grenadier prisoners were still a few yards behind, and Lawford, suddenly realizing that yet more men of his battalion might recognize him, at last turned away. He pulled Sharp with him. Sharp protested. I want to kill Hakeswell. Come on. Lawford hurried down an alley. The lieutenant had gone pale. He stopped beside the arched doorway of a small temple that was surmounted by a carving of a cow resting beneath a parasol. Little flames sputtered inside the sanctuary. Will he say anything? Lawford asked. That bastard, Sharp said. Anything's possible. Surely not. He wouldn't betray us. Lawford said, then shuddered. What happened, for God's sake? Sharp told him of the night's events, and how close he'd come to making a clean break back to the British lines. It were bloody eggs, Will, that stopped me, he complained. He could have misunderstood you, Lawford said. Not him. But what happens if he does betray us? Lawford asked. Then we join your uncle in the bloody cells, Sharp said gloomily. You should have let me shoot the bastard back at the gate. Don't be a fool, Lawford snapped. You're still in the army, Sharp. So am I. He suddenly shook his head. God Almighty, he swore. We need to find Ravi Shekhar. Why? Because if we can't get the news out, then maybe he can, Lawford said angrily. His anger was at himself. He'd been so beguiled by exploring the existence of a common soldier that he'd forgotten his duty, and that dereliction now filled him with guilt. We have to find him, Sharp. Oh, we can't ask in the streets for him. Then find Mrs. Bickerstaff, Lawford said urgently. Find her, Sharp. He lowered his voice. And that's an order. I outrank you, Sharp said. Lawford turned on him furiously. What did you say? I'm a corporal now, Private. Sharp grinned. This is not a joke, Sharp, Lawford snapped. There was a sudden authority in his voice. We're not here to enjoy ourselves. We're here to do a job. We've done it bloody well so far, Sharp said defensively. No, we haven't, Lawford said firmly, because we haven't got the news out, have we? And until we do that, Sharp, we've achieved nothing, absolutely nothing. So talk to your woman and tell her what we know and get her to find Shekhar. That's an order, Private Sharp, so do it. Lawford abruptly turned and stalked away. Sharp felt the comforting weight of the Hyderi in his tunic pocket. He thought about following Lawford, then decided to hell with it. Tonight he could afford the best, and life was too short to pass up that sort of chance. He decided he would go back to the brothel. He'd like the place, a house filled with curtains, rugs, and shaded oil lamps, where two giggling girls had given Lawford and Sharp baths before letting them go up the stairs to the bedrooms. A high dairy would buy a whole night in one of those rooms, 
perhaps with Lali, the tall girl who had left Lieutenant Lawford exhausted and guilt-ridden. So he went to spend his gold. The 33rd marched unhappily back to the encampment. The wounded were carried or limped back, and one man cried out every time he put his left foot down. But otherwise the battalion was silent. They'd been whipped, and the distant cheers of the Tipu's men rubbed salt into their wounds. A last few rockets pursued them, their flames streaking wildly askew across the stars. The grenadier and light companies had taken the casualties. Men were missing, and Wellesley knew that some of those missing were dead, and he feared that others were prisoners, or else still lying wounded among the dark trees. The remaining eight companies of the battalion had marched to support the flank companies, but in the dark they'd crossed the aqueduct too far to the south, and while Wellesley tried to find his beleaguered flank companies, Major Shi had stolidly marched straight through the tope and out across the aqueduct on the far side without encountering the enemy or firing a shot. The two sepoy battalions could easily have turned the night's disaster into a victory, but they'd received no orders, though one of the battalions, fearing disaster, had fired a panicked volley that had killed their own commanding officer, while a half-mile to their front, the 33rd had floundered about in unsoldierlike chaos. It was that lack of professionalism that galled Wellesley. He had failed. The northern stretch of the aqueduct had been efficiently captured by other battalions, but the 33rd had blundered. Wellesley had blundered, and he knew it. General Harris was sympathetic enough when the young colonel reported his failure. Harris murmured about the uncertainty of night attacks and how everything could be put right in the morning, but Wellesley still felt the failure keenly. He knew only too well that experienced soldiers like Baird despised him, believing that his promotion to second-in-command was due solely to the fact that his elder brother was Governor-General of the British Regions in India. And Wellesley's shame had been made worse because Major General Baird had been waiting with Harris when Wellesley arrived to report his failure, and the tall Scotsman seemed to smirk as Wellesley confessed to the night's disasters. Difficult things, night attacks, Harris said yet again, while Baird said nothing, and Wellesley smarted under the Scotsman's telling silence. We'll clear the tope in the morning, Harris tried to console Wellesley. My men will do it, Wellesley promised quickly. No, no, they won't be rested, Harris said. Better if we use fresh troops. My fellows will be quite ready, Baird spoke for the first time. He smiled at Wellesley. The Scotch Brigade, I mean. I request permission to command the attack, sir, Wellesley said very stiffly, ignoring Baird. Whatever troops you use, sir, I'll still be duty officer. I'm sure, I'm sure, Harris said vaguely, neither granting nor denying Wellesley's request. You must get some sleep, he said to the young colonel, so let me wish you a restful night. He waited till Wellesley was gone, then shook his head mutely. A whipper snapper, Baird said loudly enough for the retreating colonel to hear him, with his nursery maid's apron string still trapped in his sword belt. He's very efficient, Harry said mildly. My mother was efficient, God rest her soul, Baird retorted vigorously. But you wouldn't want her running a damn battle. I tell you, Harris, if you let him lead the assault on the city, you'll be asking for trouble. Give the job to me, man. Give it to me. I've got a score to settle with the Tipu. So you have, Harris agreed. So you have. And let me take the damn tope in the morning. God, man, I could do it with a corporal's guard. Wellesley will still be officer of the day tomorrow morning, Bad, Harris said then pulled off his wig as a sign that he wanted to go to bed. One side of his scalp was curiously flattened, where he'd been wounded at Bunker Hill. He scratched at the old injury, then yawned. I'll bid you good night. You know how to spell Wellesley's name for the dispatch, Harris? Baird asked. Three L's. Good night. Harris said firmly. At dawn, the Scotch Brigade and two Indian battalions paraded east of the encampment, while a battery of four twelve-pounder guns unlimbered to their south. 
As soon as the sun was up, the four guns began throwing shells into the taupe. The missiles left filmy smoke traces in the air from their burning fuses, then plunged into the trees where the explosions were muffled by the thick foliage. One shell fell short, and a great gout of water spurted up from the aqueduct. Birds wheeled above the smoking taupe, squawking their protests at the violence that had once again disturbed their nests. Major General Baird waited in front of the Scotch Brigade. He itched to take his countrymen forward, but Harris insisted it was Wellesley's privilege. He's officer of the day till noon, Harris said. He ain't up, Baird said. He's sleeping it off. If you wait for him to wake up, it'll be past noon anyway. Just let me go, sir. Give him five minutes, Harris insisted. I sent an aide to wake him. Baird had intercepted the aide to make certain Wellesley did not wake in time, but just before the five minutes expired, the young colonel came racing across the ground on his white horse. He looked dishevelled, like a man who had made too hasty a toilet. My sincerest apologies, sir," he greeted Harris. "You're ready, Wellesley. Indeed, sir. Then you know what to do," Harris said curtly. "Look after my Scots boys," Baird called to Wellesley. And received, as he expected, no answer. The Scots colours were unfurled. The drummer boys sounded the advance. The pipers began their fierce music, and the brigade marched into the rising sun. The sepoys followed. Rockets streaked up from the taupe, but the missiles were no more accurate in the morning than they had been at night. The four brass field guns fired shell after shell, only stopping when the Scotsmen reached the aqueduct. Harris and Baird watched as the brigade attacked in a four-deep line that climbed the nearer embankment, dropped out of sight into the aqueduct, briefly reappeared on the farther embankment, then finally disappeared into the trees beyond. For a few moments, there was the disciplined sound of musket volleys, then silence. The sepoys followed the Scots, spreading left and right to attack the fringes of the battered woodland. Harris waited. Then a galloper came from the northern stretch of the aqueduct. Which had been captured during the night, to report that the land between the taupe and the city was thick with enemy fugitives running back to Seringapatam. That news was proof that the taupe was at last taken, and that the whole aqueduct was now in Allied hands. Time for breakfast, Harry said happily. You'll join me, Baird. I'll hear the butcher's bill first, sir, if you don't mind. Baird answered. But there was no butcher's bill, for none of the Scots or Indian troops had died. The Tipu's men had abandoned the taupe once the artillery shells began to fall among the trees, and they left behind only the plundered British dead of the previous night. Lieutenant Fitzgerald was among them, and he was buried with honours, killed by an enemy bayonet, as the report said. And now, with the approach ground west of the city in Harris's hands, the siege proper could begin. It did not prove difficult to find Mary. Sharp merely asked Goudin, and after the night's events in the Taupe, the Colonel was eager to give Sharp whatever he wanted. The loss of the Taupe the following dawn had in no way diminished the Frenchman's delight at the night-time victory, nor the optimism inside the city, for no one had seriously expected the Taupe to resist for more than a few minutes, and the previous night's victory, with its catch of prisoners and its tales of British defeat. Had convinced the Tipu's forces that they would prove more than a match for the enemy armies. Your woman, Sharp, Goudin teased. You become a corporal, and all you want is your woman back. I just want to see her, sir. She's in Aparau's household. I'll have a word with the general, but first you have to go to the palace at midday. Me, sir. Sharp felt an instant pang of alarm, fearing that Hakes will have betrayed him. To get an award, Sharp. Goudin reassured him, but don't worry. I'll be there to steal most of your glory. Yes, sir. Sharp grinned. He liked Goudin, and he could not help contrasting the kind and easy-going Frenchman with his own colonel, who always appeared to treat common soldiers as if they were a nuisance that had to be endured. Of course, Wellesley was sheltered from his ranks by his officers and sergeants, while Goudin had such a small battalion. That in truth he was more like a captain than a colonel. Goudin did have the assistance of a Swiss adjutant, and the occasional help of the two French captains, when they were not drinking in the city's best brothel. 
but the battalion had no lieutenants or ensigns and only three sergeants, which meant that the rank and file had an unprecedented access to their colonel. Goudin liked it that way, for he had little else to occupy him. Officially, he was France's adviser to the Tipu, but the Tipu rarely sought anyone's advice. Goudin confessed as much as he walked with Sharp to the palace at midday. Knows it all, does he, sir? Sharp asked. He's a good soldier, Sharp. Very good. What he really wants is a French army, not a French adviser. What's he want a French army for, sir? To beat you British out of India. But then he'd just be stuck with you French instead. Sharp pointed out. But he likes the French Sharp. You find that strange? I find everything in India strange, sir. I've not a proper meal since I got here. Goudin laughed. And a proper meal is what? Bit of beef, sir, with some potatoes and a gravy thick enough to choke a rat. Goudin shuddered. <laughs> La cuisine anglaise. Sir? Never mind, Sharp, never mind. A half-dozen men waited to be presented to the Tipu, all of them soldiers who had somehow distinguished themselves in the defence of the Tope the previous night. There was also one prisoner, a Hindu soldier who had been seen to run away when the attackers had first crossed the aqueduct. All of them, coward and heroes alike, waited in the courtyard, where Sharp and Lawford had been tested by the Tipu, though today five of the six tigers had been taken away leaving only a big old docile male. Goudin crossed to the beast and tickled its chin, then scratched it between the ears. This one's tame as a cat sharp. I'll let you stroke it, sir. Wild horses wouldn't get me near a beast like that. The tiger liked being scratched. It closed its yellow eyes, and for a few seconds Sharp could almost persuade himself the big beast was purring. Then it yawned hugely, displaying a massive mouth with old, worn teeth. And when it had yawned, it stretched out its long forepaws, and from its furry pads, two sets of long, hooked claws emerged. That's how it kills, Goudin said, gesturing at the claws as he backed away. Holds you down with its teeth, then slits your belly open with the claws. Not this one, though. He's just an old, soft pet. Flea bitten too. Goudin picked a flea off his hand, then turned as a doorway to the courtyard was opened, and a procession of palace attendants filed into the sunlight. It was led by two robed men, who carried staffs tipped with silver tiger heads. They served as chamberlains, mustering the heroes into line and pushing the coward to one side, and behind them came two extraordinary men. Sharp gaped at them. They were both huge, tall and muscled like prize fighters. Their dark skin, naked to their waists, was oiled to a glistening shine, while their long black hair had been twisted round and round their heads and then tied with white ribbons. They had bristling black beards and wide moustaches that had been stiffened into points with wax. Jetties, good arm whispered to Sharp, Jetties? What are they, sir? Strong men, Goudin said, and executioners. The soldier who had fled from the attacking British dropped to his knees and shouted an appeal to the chamberlains. They ignored him. Sharp stood at the left-hand end of the line of heroes, who straightened proudly when the Tipu himself entered the courtyard. He was escorted by six more servants, four of whom held a tiger-striped canopy above his head. The silken canopy was supported by poles with tiger finials and had a fringe of pearl drops. The tipu was in a green robe hung with more pearls and with his tiger-hilted sword hanging in its jeweled scabbard from a yellow silk sash. His broad turban was also green and wrapped about with more pearls, while in a plume at its crown there glittered a ruby so huge that Sharp at first assumed it must be made of glass for surely no precious stone could be that massive, except perhaps for the big yellow-white diamond that formed the pommel of a dagger that the Tipu wore in his yellow sash. The Tipu glanced at the quivering soldier, then nodded at the jetties. 
This is not pleasant, Sharp. Colonel Goudin warned softly from just behind Sharp. One of the jetties seized the terrified prisoner and dragged him upright, then half carried and half led him so that he stood directly in front of the tipu. There the jetty forced the man to make a half turn, then pushed him down to his knees, knelt behind him and wrapped his arms around the prisoner's arms and torso so that he could not move. The condemned man called piteously to the tipu, who ignored the plea as the second jetty stood in front of the prisoner. The tipu nodded, and the standing jetty placed his big hands on either side of the doomed man's head. The man screamed, then the scream was cut off as the jetty tightened his grip. God Almighty, Sharp said in wonderment, as he watched the man's head being wrung like a chicken. He'd never seen such a thing, nor dreamed it was even possible. Behind him, Colonel Goudin made a small noise of disapproval, but Sharp had been impressed. It was a quicker death than being flogged, and quicker too than most hangings where the prisoners were left to dangle and dance as the rope choked them. The tipu applauded the jetty's display, rewarded him, then ordered the dead man to be dragged away. Then, one by one, the knight's heroes were led up to the tiger-striped canopy and to the short, plump man who stood in its shade. Each soldier knelt, as he was named, and each time the tipu leaned down and used both hands to lift the man up before talking to him and presenting the hero with a large medallion. The medallions looked as if they were gold, but Sharp guessed they had to be made of polished brass, for surely no one would give away that much gold. Each of the men kissed the gift, then shuffled backward to his place in the line. At last it was Sharp's turn. You know what to do, Goudin said encouragingly. Sharp did. He disliked going on his knees to any man, let alone this plump little monarch who was his country's enemy. But there was no future in unnecessary defiance, and so he obediently went down on one knee. The yellow-white stone in the dagger's hilt glinted at him, and Sharp could have sworn it was a real diamond, a huge diamond. Then the tipu smiled, leaned forward, and raised Sharp by putting his hands under his armpits. He was surprisingly strong. Gouda had come forward with Sharp, and now spoke to the tipu's interpreter in French, and the interpreter translated into Persian, which left Sharp none the wiser. So far as he was concerned, the events of the previous night had been a shambles, but it was evident that Gouda was telling a tale of high heroics, for the tipu kept giving Sharp appreciative glances. Sharp stared back in fascination. The tipu had grey eyes, a dark skin, and a finely trimmed black moustache. At a distance he looked plump, even soft. But closer there was a grimness to his face, which persuaded Sharp that Colonel Gouda had been right when he claimed that this man was a fine soldier. Sharp towered over the tipu so much that if he looked straight ahead he found himself gazing at the huge stone in the tipu's plume. It did not look like glass. It looked like one giant ruby, the size of a piece of grape shot. It was held in a delicate gold clasp and had to be worth a bloody fortune. Sharp remembered his promise to give Mary a proper ruby on the day he married her, and he almost grinned at the thought of stealing the tipu's stone. Then he forgot the stone as the tipu asked some questions, but Sharp was not required to answer for Colonel Goudin did all his speaking for him. Once the questions were answered, the tipu looked up into Sharp's eyes and spoke directly to him. He says, Goudin translated the interpreter's words, that you have proved yourself a worthy soldier of my sort. He is proud to have you in his forces, and he looks forward to the day when, with the infidel beaten back from the city, you can become a full and proper member of his army. Does that mean I'll have to be circumvented, sir? Sharp asked. It means you are extraordinarily grateful to his majesty, as I shall now tell him. Goudin said, and duly did so. And when that statement had been translated, the tipu smiled and turned to an attendant, took the last of the medallions from its silk-lined basket, and reached up to put it round Sharp's neck. Sharp stooped to make it easier, and blushed as the tipu's face came close. He could smell a pungent perfume on the monarch. Then Sharp stepped back, 
and just like the other soldiers, he lifted the medallion to his lips. He almost swore as he did so, for the thing was not made of brass at all, but of heavy gold. Back away, Gudan muttered. Sharp bowed to the tipu and backed clumsily to his place in the line. The tipu spoke again, though this time no one bothered to translate for Sharp. And then the small ceremony was over, and the tipu turned and went back into his palace. You are now officially a hero of my saw, Gouda said dryly. One of Tipu's beloved tigers. Don't deserve to be, sir, Sharp said, peering at the medallion. One side was patterned with an intricate design, while the other showed a tiger's face, though the face seemed to be cunningly constructed from the walls of an intricate script. Does he say something, sir? He asked Gouda. It says, Sharp. Asad Allah al Khalib, which is Arabic and it means the lion of God is victorious. Lion, not tiger. It's a verse from the Quran, Sharp, the Muslim Bible, and I suspect the holy book does not mention tigers. It can't, otherwise I'm sure the Tipo would use the quotation. Funny, isn't it? Sharp said, peering at the heavy gold medallion. What is? The British beast is the lion, sir. Sharp chuckled, then hefted the gold in his hand. Is he a rich bugger, the Tipu? As rich as can be, Gudan said dryly. And those are real stones, that ruby in his hat, and the diamond in his dagger. Both worth the king's ransom, Sharp. But be careful. The diamond is called the Moonstone, and is supposed to bring ill luck to anyone who steals it. I wasn't thinking of thieving it, sir, Sharp said. Though he had been thinking exactly that, but what about this? He lifted the heavy medallion again. Do I get to keep it? Of course you do. Though I might say you only received it because I somewhat exaggerated your exploits. Sharp unlooped the medallion. You can have it, sir. He pushed the heavy gold toward the Frenchman. Really, sir, go on. Goudin backed away and held up his hands in horror. If the tipu discovered you had given it away, Sharp, he would never forgive you. Never. That's a badge of honor. You must wear it always. The colonel pulled out a breguet watch and clicked open its lid. I have duty, Sharp, and that reminds me, your woman will be waiting for you in the small temple beside Aparau's house. You know where that is? No, sir. Go to the north side of the big Hindu temple, the colonel said, and keep walking. You will come almost to the city wall. Turn left there, and you will see the temple on your left. It has one of those cows over the gate. Why do they put cows over the gate, sir? For the same reason we put images of a tortured man in our churches. Religion. You ask too many questions, Sharp. The colonel smiled. Your woman will meet you there. But remember, Corporal, guard duty at sundown. With those words, Gudan strode away, and Sharp, with one final glance at the somnolent tiger, followed. It was not hard to find the small temple that lay opposite an old gateway that led through the western defences. It was these walls that McCandless had warned against, but Sharp, staring at them from the temple entrance, could see nothing strange about them. A long ramp ran up to the fire step, and a pair of soldiers were struggling to push a hand cart loaded with rockets to the ramparts. Where a dozen great guns stood unattended in their embrasures, but he could see nothing sinister, no trap to destroy an army. One of the Tipu's sun-blazoned flags flew on a tall staff above the gatehouse itself, flanked by two smaller green flags that showed a silver device. The wind lifted one of the flags, and Sharp saw that it was the same calligraphic tiger head that was engraved on his medal. He grinned. That was something to show Mary. He went into the temple, but Mary had not yet arrived. Sharp found a patch of shade in a niche to one side of the open courtyard, from where he watched a stark naked man with a white stripe painted across his bald pate, who was sitting cross-legged in front of an idol that had a man's body, a monkey's head, and was painted red, green, and yellow. Another god, this one with seven cobra heads. 
stood in a niche that was littered with fading flowers. The cross-legged man did not move. Sharp could swear he did not even blink, not even when two other worshippers came to the temple. One was a tall, slim woman in a pale green sari with a small diamond glinting in the side of her nose. Her companion was a tall man dressed in the Tipu's tiger-striped tunic, with a musket slung on one shoulder and a silver-hilted sword hanging at his side. He was a fine-looking man, a fitting companion for the elegant woman who crossed to a third idol, this one a seated goddess with four sets of arms. The woman touched her joined hands to her forehead, bowed low, then reached forward and rang a tiny handbell to attract the goddess's attention. It was only then that Sharp recognized her. Mary, he called, and she turned in alarm to see Sharp standing in the deep shadows at the side of the shrine. The look of terror on Mary's face checked Sharp. The tall young soldier had put a hand on the hilt of his sword. Mary. Sharp called again. Lass, brother, Mary called aloud, and then, almost in a panic, she repeated the word, brother. Sharp grinned, disguising his confusion. Then he saw there were tears in Mary's eyes, and he frowned. Are you all right, lass? I'm very well, she said deliberately, and then, in an even more stilted voice, brother. Sharp glanced at the Indian soldier and saw that the man had a fiercely protective look. "Is that the general?" he asked Mary. "No, it's Kunwar Singh," Mary said. And she turned and gestured toward the soldier, and Sharp saw a look of tenderness on her face. And all at once he understood what was happening. "Does he speak English?" Sharp asked, and then, with a grin, "Sister." Mary threw him a look of pure relief. "Sam," she said, "how are you? How's your back? Mending all right, it is. That Indian doctor does magic. He does. I still feel it now and then, but not like it was. No, I'm doing all right. I even won a medal. Look." He held the gold toward Mary, but I need to talk to you privately," he added, as she leaned close to peer at the medallion. "It's urgent, love," he hissed. Mary fingered the gold, then looked up at Sharp. "I'm sorry, Richard," she whispered. "There's nothing to be sorry for, lass," Sharp said, and he spoke truthfully. For ever since he'd seen Mary in her sari, he had sensed that she was not for him. She looked too sophisticated, too elegant, and the wives of common soldiers were usually neither. "You and him, eh?" he asked, glancing at the lean and handsome Kunwar Singh. Mary gave a tiny nod. "Good for you," Sharp called to the Indian and gave him a smile. "Good girl, my sister." "Half sister," Mary hissed. "Make up your bloody mind, lass." "And I've taken an Indian name," she said. "Aruna." "Sounds good, Aruna." Sharp smiled. "I like it." "It was my mother's name," Mary explained. Then fell into an awkward silence. She glanced at the man with the white stripe on his head, then tentatively touched Sharp's elbow, and so led him back into the shaded niche where he'd been waiting. A ledge ran round the niche, and Mary sat on it, facing Sharp with her hands held modestly on her lap. Kunwar Singh watched them, but did not try to come close. For a second, neither Sharp nor Mary had anything to say. "I've been watching that naked fellow," Sharp said, "and he ain't moved an inch." It's one way to worship," Mary said softly. "Bloody odd, though. Old thing's odd." Sharp gestured around the decorated shrine. "Looks like a circus, don't it? Can't imagine it at home. Painted clowns in church, eh? Can you imagine that?" Then he remembered Mary had never seen England. "It ain't the same," he said weakly. Then jerked his head towards the ever watchful Kunwar Singh. "You and him, eh?" Sharp said again. Mary nodded. "I'm sorry, Richard. Truly, it happens, lass," Sharp said. "But you don't want him to know about you and me, is that it?" She nodded and again looked fearful. "Please," she begged him. Sharp paused, not to keep Mary on tenterhooks, but because the naked man had at last moved, he had slowly clasped his hands together. 
but that seemed the extent of his exertions, for he went quite still again. Richard, Mary pleaded, you won't tell him, will you? He looked back to her. I want you to do something for me, he said. She looked wary, but nodded. Of course, if I can. There's a fellow in this city called Ravi Shekhar. Got my name? He's a merchant. God knows what he sells, but he's here right enough, and you've got to find him. Do they ever let you out of the house? Yes. Then you get out, lass, and find this Ravi Shekhar, and tell him to get a message to the British. And the message is this. They mustn't attack the West Wall. That's it, just that. The daft buggers are setting themselves to attack it right now, so it's urgent. Will you do that? Mary licked her lips, then nodded. And you won't tell Conva about us? I wouldn't have told him anyway, Sharp said. Of course I wouldn't. I wish you joy of the fellow, sister. Eh? He smiled. Sister Aruna, it's nice to have some family, and you're all I've got. And I hate to ask you to find this Shekhar fellow, but the lieutenant and me, we just can't manage to escape. So someone else has to send the message out. Looks like you. Sharp grinned. But it looks like you've changed sides now, and I don't blame you, so you don't mind doing this for me. I'll do it for you, I promise. You're a good lass, he stood. Do brothers kiss sisters in India? Mary half smiled. I think they do, yes. Sharp gave her a very respectable kiss on the cheek, smelling her perfume. You look grand, Mary, he said. Too grand for me, eh? You're a good man, Richard. That won't get me very far in this world, will it? He backed away from Mary, then grinned at Kunwa Singh, who offered him a stiff, slight bow. You're a lucky man, Sharp said. And then, with a backward glance at the tall, elegant woman, who now called herself Aruna, he walked away from Mary Bickerstaff. Easy come, easy go, he thought. But there was also a pang of jealousy for the tall, good-looking Indian. But what the hell? Mary was doing her best to survive, and Sharp could never blame someone for doing that. He was doing the same himself. He had turned back toward the barracks where Goudin's battalion was quartered. He was thinking about Mary and about how graceful, even unapproachable, she'd looked. And he was hardly looking where he was going when a cheerful shout warned him of an approaching bullock cart that was loaded with great barrels. Sharp stepped hastily aside as the bullocks, their horns painted yellow and blue and tipped with small silver bells, lumbered past. He saw that the brightly painted cart was heading down a narrow alley which led toward the gatehouse and the western wall, and the sentries at the gate, seeing the cart approach, heaved back the huge double doors. And Sharp instinctively knew something was amiss. He stood watching and suspected he was on the edge of solving the city's mystery. The guards were opening the gates, yet so far as Sharp knew there were no gates in the city's western wall which faced the South Corvary River. He knew of the Bangalore Gate to the east, the Mysore Gate to the south, and the much smaller Water Gate to the north. But no one had ever spoken of a fourth gate, yet there it was. Once, plainly, there'd been another Water Gate here, a gate that opened onto the South Corvary, and presumably that entrance to the city had long ago been sealed up. Yet now Sharp was watching the gates being opened, and he impulsively turned and followed the cart down the alley. The cart had already vanished into the deep gloom inside the gate's tunnel, and the two guards were dragging the big double doors closed, but then they saw the bright gold medallion on Sharp's chest, and maybe that rare token convinced them that he had the authority to enter. Looking for Colonel Goudin, Sharp offered in brazen explanation, when one of the two men nervously moved to intercept him. Got a message for the Colonel, see? Then he was through the gate, and he saw that it was not a passage out of the city at all, but was rather a long tunnel that led only to a blank stone wall. It had once been a gateway, that much was obvious. But at some time the old outer gate had been walled shut to leave this gloomy tunnel that was now stacked with barrels. They had to be powder barrels, for Sharp could see pale lengths of fuses coming from their stoppered bungholes. The whole northern side of the tunnel was crammed with the powder barrels, just the northern side. 
An officer saw him and shouted angrily. Sharp played the innocent. Colonel Goudin, he asked. Have you seen Colonel Goudin, Saib? The Indian officer ran toward him, and as he came, he drew a pistol. But then in the tunnel's dim, dusty light, he saw the gold medal on Sharp's chest, and he pushed the pistol back into his sash. Goudin, he asked Sharp. Sharp smiled eagerly. He's my officer, Saib. I've got a message for him. The Indian did not understand, but he did know the significance of the medal, and it was enough to make him respectful. But he was still firm. He pointed Sharp toward the door and gestured that he was to leave. Goudin, Sharp insisted. The man shook his head and Sharp, with a grin, left the tunnel. He'd forgotten Mary now, for he knew he was on the verge of understanding what was being kept so secret. He went back down the alley, and at its end he turned and looked at the wall above, and he wondered why there were no gunners standing by the brass guns, and why no sentries stood in the embrasures, and why no flags were hung on the battlements. Everywhere else on the walls there were flags and sentries and gunners, but not here. He waited until the tunnel gates had been closed, then he hurried up the nearby ramp that led to the wall's fire step. The wall here was made of red mud bricks, and was not nearly so formidable as the southern wall, which was constructed from massive granite blocks. Nor was this wall more than twenty feet thick, whereas the tunnel had been nearer a hundred feet long. He ran up to the parapet where the big guns waited, and when he reached the fire step, he understood everything. For there was not one wall here, but two. The one he was standing on was the inner wall, and it was new, so new that some short stretches of the wall were still festooned with scaffolding and ropes, where the Tipu's labourers hastened to complete the work. And sixty feet away, beyond an empty inner ditch, was the city's outer wall, where the flags were hung, and where the gunners and sentries stood guard. That old outer wall was a couple of feet higher than this new inner wall. But opposite Sharp, and close to where he'd seen the powder-crammed tunnel, those older ramparts had crumbled at their top. That decay would surely serve as a beacon to the British, enticing them to aim their guns at that stretch of decayed wall, in the certainty that they could soon finish its destruction with their bombardment. The big eighteen and twenty-four pounder guns would hammer away until the older outer wall collapsed to leave a ramp-like breach. The British, staring across the river at that breach, would doubtless see the new inner wall, but they might well think it was nothing but the flank of a warehouse or a temple. And so the assault would come storming across the shallow river and up the ramp of the breach in the outer wall, and then spill down into the space between the two walls. More and more men would come, those behind forcing the ones in front ever onward, and slowly the crush between the walls would grow. The guns and rockets on the inner wall would rain down death, but after a while, when the attackers filled the space between the walls, the huge charge of powder stored in what remained of the old elaborate gateway would be detonated, and that explosion, its force funneled by the old and new walls, would tear into the narrow gap and flood the ditch between the walls with blood. Sharp looked to his left. And saw that the tunnel was built beneath a squat gate tower. That ancient tower would surely collapse, spilling stones onto any troops who might survive the terrible blast. Bloody hell, Sharp said, and then he slipped back down the inner walls ramp and went to find Lawford. If Mary did not get the news out, he thought there would be slaughter when the assault came. It would be pure slaughter, and it seemed that only Mary, who was now in love with the enemy, could prevent it. Chapter Eight. The siege works advanced steadily, hampered only by the Tipu's guns and by a shortage of the heavy timber needed to shore up the trenches, and construct the batteries where the big siege guns would be emplaced. Colonel Ghent, an engineer of the East India Company, supervised the work, and he agreed wholeheartedly with General Harris that the decayed stretch of the city's western walls was the obvious and opportune target. Then. Just days after the construction of the siege works had begun, a local farmer revealed the existence of a new second wall behind the first. The man insisted the new wall was unfinished, 
but Harris was worried enough by the farmer's news to call his deputies to his tent. Where Colonel Ghent delivered the gloomy intelligence about the new inner ramparts. The fellow says his sons were taken away to help build the walls, the engineer reported, and he seems to be telling the truth. Baird broke the brief silence that followed Ghent's words. They can't surely garrison both walls, the Scotsman insisted. The Tipu has no shortage of men, Wellesley pointed out. Thirty or forty thousand we hear. More than enough to defend both walls, I should think. Baird ignored the young colonel, while Harris, uncomfortably aware of the bad feeling between his two deputies, stared fixedly at his map of the city, in the hope that some new inspiration would strike. Colonel Gant sat beside Harris. The engineer unfolded a pair of wire-framed spectacles and hooked them over his ears as he peered down at the map. Harris sighed. I still think it has to be the West, he said, despite this new wall. The North? Wellesley asked. According to our farmer fellow, Gent answered, the new inner wall goes all the way round the North. He picked up a pencil and sketched the line of the new inner wall on the map to show that wherever the river flowed close to the city there was now a double rampart. And the West is infinitely preferable to the North, Gent added. The South Corver is shallow, while the main river can still be treacherous at this time of year. If our fellows have to wade through the Corvary, let them do it here. He tapped the city's western approach. Of course, he added optimistically, maybe that fellow was right, and maybe that inner wall ain't finished. Harris wished to God that McCandless was still with the army. That subtle Scotsman would have dispatched a dozen disguised sepoys and discovered within hours the exact state of the new inner wall. But McCandless was lost, and so, Harris suspected, were the two men sent to rescue him. We could cross the Arakeri Ford, Baird suggested, then blast our way in from the east like Cornwallis did. Harris lifted the hem of his wig and scratched at his old scalp wound. We discussed all this before, he said wearily. He offered Baird a wan smile to take the sting from his mild reproof then explained his reasons for not assaulting from the east. First, we have to force the crossing, and the enemy has the river banks entrenched. Then we must get through the new wall around their encampment. He touched the map, showing where the Tipu had constructed a stout mud wall, well served with guns, that surrounded the encampments which lay outside the city's southern and eastern walls. And after that, we have to lay siege to the city proper and we know that both the east and south ramparts already have inner walls. And to breach those walls, every round shot and pound of powder will have to be carried across the river. And one good rainfall will make the ford impassable, Ghent put in gloomily, not to mention bringing those damn crocodiles back. He shook his head. I wouldn't want to be carrying three tons of supplies a day across a half-flooded river full of hungry teeth. So whenever we attack, Wellesley asked, we have to pierce two walls. That's what the man said, Baird growled. This new inner wall, Wellesley asked Ghent, ignoring Baird. What do we know of it? Mud, Ghent said, red mud bricks, just like Devon mud. Mud will crumble, Wellesley pointed out. If it's dry, it will, Ghent agreed. But the core of the wall won't be dry. Thoroughly good stuff, mud. Soaks up the cannon fire. I've seen 24-pounder shots bounce off mud like currents off a suet pudding. Give me a good stone wall to break down any day. Break its crust and the guns turn the rubble core into a staircase. But not mud. Ghent stared at the map, picking his teeth with the sharpened nib of a quill. Not mud. He added in a gloomy undertone. But it will yield? Harris asked anxiously. Oh, it'll yield, sir, it'll yield, I can warrant you that. But how much time do we have to persuade it to yield? The engineer peered over his spectacles at the bewigged general. The monsoon ain't so far off, and once the rains begin we might as well go home for all the good we'll ever do. You want a path through both walls? It'll take two weeks more, and even then the inner breach will be perilously narrow. Perilously narrow? can't enfilade it, you see, and the breach in the outer wall will serve as a glacis to protect the base of the inner wall. 
Straight on fire, sir, and all aimed a deal higher than any respectable gunner would want. We can make you a breach of sorts, but it'll be narrow and high, and God only knows what'll be waiting on the other side. Nothing good, I dare say. But we can breach this outer wall quickly enough, Harris asked, tapping the place on his map. Aye, sir, it's mostly mud again, but it's older, so the centre will be drier. Once we break through the crust, the thing should fall apart in hours. Harris stared down at the map, unconsciously scratching beneath his wig. Ladders, he said after a long pause. Baird looked alarmed. You're not thinking of an escalade, God save us. We've no timber, Kent protested. Bamboo scaling ladders, Harris said. Just a few. He smiled as he leaned back in his chair. Make me a breach, Colonel Kent, and forget the inner wall. We'll assault the breach, but we won't go through it. Instead, we'll attack the shoulders of the breach. We'll use ladders to climb off the breach, onto the walls, then attack around the ramparts. Once those outer walls are ours, the beggars will have to surrender. There was silence in the tent as the three officers considered Harris's suggestion. Colonel Ghent tried to clean his spectacle lenses with a corner of his sash. You better pray our fellows get up in the walls damn fast, sir. Ghent broke the silence. You'll be sending whole battalions across the river, General. And the lads behind will be pushing the fellows in front, and if there's any delay, they'll spill into the space between the walls like water seeking its level. And God knows what's in between those walls. A flooded ditch, mines. But even if there's nothing there, the poor fellows will still be trapped between two fires. Two forlorn hopes, Harris said, thinking aloud and ignoring Ghent's gloomy comments, instead of one. They both attack two or three minutes ahead of the main assault. Their orders will be to climb off the breach and onto the walls. One hope turns north along the outer ramparts, the other south. That way they don't need to go between the walls. It'll be a desperate business, Ghent said flatly. Assaults always are, Baird said stoutly. That's why we employ forlorn hopes. The forlorn hope was the small band of volunteers who went first into a breach to trigger the enemy's surprises. This book is continued on Disc 8. Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell continued. Disc 8. The forlorn hope was the small band of volunteers who went first into a breach to trigger the enemy's surprises. Casualties were invariably heavy, though there was never a shortage of volunteers. This time, though, it did promise to be desperate, for the two forlorn hopes were not being asked to fight through the breach, but rather to turn toward the walls either side of the breach and fight their way up onto the ramparts. You can't take a city without shedding blood, Baird went on, then stiffened in his chair. And once again, sir, I request permission to lead the main assault. Harris smiled. Granted, David. He spoke gently, using Baird's Christian name for the first time. And God be with you. God be with the damn tipu, Baird said, hiding his delight. He's the one who'll need the help. I thank you, sir. You do me honor. Or I send you to your death, Harris thought, but kept the sentiment silent. He rolled up the city map. Speed, gentlemen, he said. Speed. The rains will come soon enough, so let's get this business done. The troops went on digging, zigzagging their way across the fertile fields between the aqueduct and the south branch of the Corvary. A second British army, six and a half thousand men from Cannonore on India's western Malabar coast, arrived to swell the besiegers' ranks. The newcomers camped north of the Corvary and placed gun batteries that could sweep the approach to the proposed breach so that the city, with its 30,000 defenders, was now besieged by 57,000 men half of whom marched under British colours, and half under the banners of Hyderabad. Six thousand of the British troops were actually British, the rest were sepoys, and behind all the troops, in the sprawling encampments, more than a hundred thousand hungry civilians waited to plunder the supplies rumoured to be inside Seringapatam. Harris had men enough for the siege and assault, but not enough to ring the city entirely. 
and so the Tipu's cavalry made daily sallies from the unguarded eastern side of the island to attack the foraging parties who ranged deep into the country in search of timber and food. The Nizam of Hyderabad's horsemen fought off the daily attacks. The Nizam was a Muslim, but he had no love for his co-religionist, the Tipu, and the men of Hyderabad's army fought fiercely. One horseman came back to the camp with the heads of six enemies tied by their long hair to his lance. He held the bloody trophies aloft and galloped proudly along the tent lines to the cheers of the sepoys and redcoats. Harris sent the man a purse of guineas, while Mayor Alum, the commander of the Nizam's forces, more practically ordered a concubine to express his gratitude. The trenches made ground daily, but one last formidable obstacle prevented their approach close enough to the city for the siege guns to begin their destructive work. On the southern bank of the Corvary, a half mile west of the city, stood the ruins of an old water mill. Built of stone, the ancient walls were thick enough to withstand the artillery fire from Harris's camp and from the new British positions across the river. The ruined buildings had been converted into a stout fort that was equipped with a deep defensive ditch and was strongly garrisoned by two of the Tipu's finest koshoons, reinforced by cannon and rocket men. And so long as the mill fort existed, no British gun could be dragged within battering range of the city's walls. The two flags that flew over the mill fort were shot away every day, but each dawn the flags would be hoisted again, albeit on shorter staffs. And once again the British and Indian gunners would blaze away with round shot and shell, and once again the sun, flag, and the banner of the Lion of God would be felled. But whenever skirmishers went close to the fort to discover if any defender survived, there would be a blast of cannon, rockets, and musketry to prove that the Tipu's men were still dangerous. The Tipu could even reinforce the garrison thanks to a deep trench that ran close to the south branch of the Corvary, and up which his men could creep through the night to relieve the fort's battered garrison. The fort had to be taken. Harris ordered a dusk attack that was led by Indian and Scottish flank companies, supported by a party of engineers whose job was to bridge the mill's deep ditch. For an hour before the assault, the artillery on both banks of the river rained shells into the mill. The twelve-pounder guns were loaded with howitzer shells, and the wispy trails of their burning fuses sputtered across the darkening sky to plunge into the smoke which churned up from the battered fort. To the waiting infantry, who would have to wade through the little corvary, cross the ditch, and assault the mill, it seemed as if the small fort was being obliterated, for there was nothing to be seen but the boiling smoke and dust, amongst which the shells exploded with dull red flashes. But every few moments, as if to belie the destruction that seemed so complete, an Indian gun would flash back its response, and a round shot would scream across the fields towards the British batteries or else a rocket would flare up from the defenders and snake its thicker smoke trail across the delicate tracery left by the fuses of the howitzer shells. The largest guns on the city wall were also firing, trying to bounce their shot up from the ground so that the ricochets would reach the besiegers' artillery. Sharp, inside the city, heard the vast hammering of the guns and wondered if it presaged an assault on the city's walls. But Sergeant Rottier assured the men that it was only the British wasting ammunition on the old mill. The bombardment suddenly ceased, and the Tipu's men came scrambling out of the mill's damp cellars to take their places at their fire-scorched ramparts. They reached their broken fire steps just in time, for the leading engineers were already hurling lit carcasses into the ditch. The carcasses were bundles of damp straw, tight-wrapped about a paper-cased shell of saltpeter, corned gunpowder, and antimony. The carcasses burned fiercely, consuming the straw from the inside to billow choking streams of smoke through vents left in the casings, so that within seconds the ditch was filled with a dense fog of grey smoke, into which the frightened defenders poured a badly aimed musket volley. More carcasses were hurled, adding to the blinding smoke, 
and under this cover a dozen planks were thrown across the ditch, and screaming attackers charged across with fixed bayonets. Only a few of the Tipu's men still had loaded muskets. Those men fired, and one of the attackers fell through the smoke to fall on the hissing carcasses. But the rest were already scrambling over the walls. Half the attackers were MacLeod's Highlanders from Perthshire. The others were Bengali infantry, and both came into the mill like avenging furies. The Tipu's men seemed stunned by the suddenness of the assault, or else they had been so shaken by the shelling and were so confused by the choking smoke that they were incapable of resistance, and incapable too of surrender. Bengalis and Highlanders hunted through the ruins. Their war cries shrill as they bayoneted and shot the garrison. While behind them, before the smoke of the carcasses had even begun to fade, or the fighting in the mills died down, the engineers were constructing a stouter bridge, across which they could haul their siege guns, so they could turn the old mill into a breaching battery. The smoke of the carcasses at last died and drifted away; its remnants touched red by the setting sun, and in the lurid light, a Highlander capered on the ramparts. With the captured sun banner at the end of his bayonet, while a Bengali havildar waved the Tipu's lion flag in celebration, the assault had turned into a massacre, and the officers now tried to calm the attackers down as they pierced ever deeper into the mill's vaults. The innermost cellar was grimly defended by a group of the Tipu's infantry, but an engineer brought the last remaining carcass into the mill. Lit its fuse, waited until the smoke began to pour from the vents, and then hurled it down the steps. There were a few seconds of silence, then dazed and gasping defenders came scrambling up the steep stairs. The mill fort was taken, and astonishingly, only one of the attackers had been killed. But a shocked Highlander lieutenant counted two hundred dead bodies dressed in the Tipu's tiger-striped tunic. And still more enemy dead were piled bloodily in every embrasure. The rest of the garrison was either taken prisoner, or else had managed to flee down the connecting trench to the city. A Scottish sergeant, finding one of the Tipu's rockets in a magazine, stuck it vertically between two of the ruins' bigger stones, then lit the fuse. There were cheers as the rocket flamed and smoked, then louder cheers as it screamed up into the sky. It began to corkscrew, leaving a crazy trail of smoke in the twilight air, and then, reaching its apogee, and by now almost invisible, it tumbled and fell into the corvary. Next morning, the first eighteen pounders were already in place in the mill. The range to the city was long, but not impossible, and Harris gave the order for the guns to open fire. The eighteen-pounder cannon were among the heavy siege guns that would make the breach. But for now, they were employed to batter the enemy's own guns. Sir Ringabatam's outer wall was protected by a glacis, but there was not enough distance between the river and the wall to construct a full glacis with a gently sloping outer face, high enough to bounce cannon shot over the city's walls, and so the low glacis could only protect the wall's base, not the parapet. And the eighteen-pounders' first shots were aimed to scour that parapet of its guns. The good fortune that had accompanied the Bengalis and the Highlanders in their assault on the old mill now seemed to settle on the shoulders of the gunners, for their very first shot cracked apart an embrasure, and the second dismounted the gun behind it, and after that every shot seemed to have an equally destructive effect. British and Indian officers watched through spy glasses as embrasure after embrasure was destroyed, and as gun after gun was thrown down. A dozen heavy cannon were tumbled forward into the flooded ditch between the city wall and the glacis, and every tumbling fall was greeted by a cheer from the besiegers. The city's western wall was being stripped of guns, and the artillerymen's prowess seemed to promise an easy assault. Spirits in the Allied ranks soared, while inside the city, watching his precious cannon being destroyed, the Tipu fumed. The mill fort, on which he'd pinned such high hopes of delaying the enemy till the monsoon washed them away, had fallen like a child's wooden toy, and now his precious guns were being obliterated. It was time the Tipu decided to show his soldiers that these red-coated enemies were not invulnerable demons, but mortal men, 
and that like any other mortal men, they could be made to whimper. It was time to unsheathe the tiger's claws. A half-hour's walk east of the city, just outside the embrasured wall that protected the Tipu's encampment, lay his summer palace, the Daria Daulat. It was much smaller than the inner palace within the city, for the inner palace was where the Tipu's enormous harem lived and where his government had its offices and his army its headquarters. And so it was a sprawl of stables, storehouses, courtyards, state rooms, and prison cells. The inner palace seethed with activity, a place where hundreds of folk had their daily living. While the summer palace, set in its wide green gardens and protected by a thick hedge of aloe, was a haven of peace. The Daria Dalat had not been built to impress, but rather for comfort. Only two stories high, the building was made from huge teak beams, over which stucco had been laid, then modelled and painted so that every surface glittered in the sunlight. The whole palace was surrounded by a two-storied veranda, and on the western outer wall, under the veranda where the sun could not fade it, the Tipu had ordered painted a vast mural, showing the Battle of Polilua, at which, fifteen years before, he had destroyed a British army. That great victory had extended Mysore's dominion along the Malabar coast, and in honour of the triumph, the palace had been built and received its name, the Daria Daulat, or Treasure of the Sea. The palace lay on the road leading to the island's eastern tip, the same road on which was built the fine, elegant mausoleum, in which the Tipu's great father, Haidar Ali, and his mother, the Begum Fatima, were buried. There, too, one day, the Tipu prayed he would lie at rest. The Daria Dalat's garden was a wide lawn dotted with pools, trees, shrubs, and flowers. Roses grew there, and mangoes. But there were also exotic strains of indigo and cotton, mixed with pineapples from Africa and avocados from Mexico, all of them plants that the Tipu had encouraged or imported in the hope that they would prove profitable for his country. But on this day, the day after the mill fort had been swamped with smoke, fire, and blood, the garden was filled with 2,000 of the Tipu's 30,000 troops. The men paraded in three sides of a hollow square to the north of the palace, leaving the Daria Daulat's shadowed façade as the fourth side of their square. The Tipu had ordered entertainment for his troops. There were dancers from the city, two jugglers, and a man who charmed snakes. But best of all, the Tipu's wooden tiger organ had been fetched from the inner palace, and the soldiers laughed as the life-size model tiger ricked its claws across the red coat's blood-painted face. The bellow-driven growl did not carry very far, any more than did the pathetic cry of the tiger's victim, but the action of the toy alone was sufficient to amuse the men. The Tipu arrived in a palanquin just after midday. None of his European advisers accompanied him, nor were any of his European troops present, though Aparao was in attendance, for two of the five Kushuns parading in the palace gardens came from Rao's brigade, and the Hindu general stood tall and silent just behind the Tipu, on the palace's upper veranda. Aparao disapproved of what was about to happen, but he dared not make a protest, for any sign of disloyalty from a Hindu was enough to rouse the Tipu's suspicions. Besides, the Tipu could not be dissuaded. His astrologers had told him that a period of ill luck had arrived, and that it could only be averted by sacrifice. Other sages had peered into the smoke-misted surface of a pot of hot oil, the Tipu's favourite form of divination, and had deciphered the strange coloured and slow-moving swirls, to declare that they told the same grim tale. A season of bad fortune had come to Seringapatam. That bad luck had caused both the fall of the mill fort and the destruction of the guns on the outer western wall, and the Tipu was determined to avert this sudden ill fortune. The Tipu let his soldiers enjoy the tiger for a few moments longer. Then he clapped his hands and ordered his servants to carry the model back to the inner palace. 
The tiger's place was taken by a dozen jetties, who strode onto the forecourt with their bare torsos gleaming. For a few moments they amused the soldiers with their more commonplace tricks. They bent iron rods into circles, lifted grown men on both hands, or juggled with cannonballs. Then a goatskin drum sounded, and the jetties, obedient to its strokes, went back to the shadows under the Tipu's balcony. The watching soldiers fell into an expectant silence, then growled as a sorry party of prisoners was herded onto the forecourt. There were thirteen prisoners, all in red coats, all of them men of the 33rd who had been captured during the night battle at the Sultan Petar Tope. The thirteen men stood uncertainly amidst the ring of their enemies. The sun beat down. One of the prisoners, a sergeant, twitched as he stared at the ranks of tiger-striped soldiers. And still his face twitched as he turned around and gazed with a curious intensity when the Tipu stepped to the rail of the upper veranda and in a clear, high voice spoke to his troops. The enemy, the Tipu said, had been fortunate. They had gained some cheap victories to the west of the city, but that was no reason to fear them. The British sorcerers, knowing they could not defeat the tigers of Mysore by force alone, had made a powerful spell. But with the help of Allah, that spell would now be confounded. The soldiers greeted the speech with a long and approving sigh, while the prisoners, unable to understand any of the Tipu's words, looked anxiously about, but could make no sense of the occasion. Guards surrounded the prisoners and pushed them back to the palace, leaving just one man alone on the forecourt. That man tried to go with his companions, but a guard thrust him back with a bayonet, and the uneven contest between a confused prisoner and an armed guard sparked a gust of laughter. The prisoner, driven back to the centre of the forecourt, waited nervously. Two jetties walked toward him. They were big men, formidably bearded, tall, and with their long hair bound and tied about their heads. The prisoner licked his lips. The jetties smiled, and suddenly the red coat sensed his fate and took two or three hurried steps away from the strong men. The watching soldiers laughed as the red coat tried to escape but he was penned in by three walls of tiger-striped infantry, and there was nowhere to run. He tried to dodge past the two jetties, but one of them reached out and snatched a handful of his red coat. The prisoner beat at the jetty with his fists, but it was like a rabbit cuffing at a wolf. The watching soldiers laughed again, though there was a nervousness in their amusement. The jetty drew the soldier into his body, then hugged him in a terrible last embrace. The second jetty took hold of the redcoat's head, paused to take breath, then twisted. The prisoner's dying scream was choked off in an instant. For a second his head stared sightlessly backward. Then the jetties released him, and as the twisted neck grotesquely righted itself, the man collapsed. One of the jetties picked up the corpse in one huge hand, and contemptuously tossed it high into the air like a terrier tossing a dead rat. The watching soldiers were silent for a second, then cheered. The Tipu smiled. A second red coat was driven to the jetties, and this man was forced to kneel. He did not move as the nail was placed on his head. He uttered one curse, then died in seconds as his blood spurted out onto the gravel forecourt. A third man was killed with a single punch to his chest, a blow so massive that it drove him back a full twelve paces before, shuddering, his ruptured heart gave up. The watching soldiers shouted that they wanted to see another man's neck wrung like a chicken, and the jetties obliged. And so, one by one, the prisoners were forced to their killers. Three of the men died abjectly, calling for mercy and weeping like babes. Two died saying prayers, but the rest died defiantly. Three put up a fight, and one tall grenadier raised an ironic cheer from the watching troops by breaking a jetty's finger, but then he too died like the rest, one after the other they died, and those who came last were forced to watch their comrades' deaths and to wonder how they would be sent to meet their maker, whether they would be spiked through the skull or have their necks twisted north to south, or simply be beaten to bloody death. And all of the prisoners once dead were decapitated by a sword blow before the two parts of their bodies were wrapped in reed mats and laid aside. The jetties saved the sergeant till last, 
The watching soldiers were in a fine mood now. They'd been nervous at first, apprehensive of cold-blooded death on a sun-drenched afternoon. But the strength of the jetties and the desperate antics of the doomed men trying to escape had amused them. And now they wanted to enjoy this last victim, who promised to provide the finest entertainment of the day. His face was twitching in what the spectators took to be uncontrollable fear. But despite that terror, he proved astonishingly agile, forever scuttling out of the jetty's way and shouting up toward the tipu. Again and again he would appear to be cornered, but somehow he would always slide or twist or duck his way free, and with his face shuddering would call desperately to the tipu. His shouts were drowned by the cheers of the soldiers who applauded every narrow escape. Two more jetties came to help catch the elusive man, and, though he tried to twist past them, they at last had the sergeant trapped. The jetties advanced in a line, forcing him back toward the palace, and the watching soldiers fell silent in expectation of his death. The sergeant fainted to his left, then suddenly twisted and ran from the advancing jetty toward the palace. The guards moved to drive him back toward his executioners, but the man stopped beneath the veranda and stared up at the tipu. I know the traitors are here, he shouted in the silence. I know. A jetty caught the sergeant from behind and forced him to his knees. Get these black bastards off me, the sergeant screamed. Listen, Your Honour, I know what's going on here. There's a British officer in the city wearing your uniform. For God's sake, mother! This last cry was torn from Obadiah Hexwell as a second jetty placed his hands on the sergeant's head. Hexwell wrenched his face round and bit down hard on the ball of the jetty's thumb, and the astonished man jerked his hands away, leaving a scrap of flesh in the sergeant's mouth. Hexwell spat the morsel out. Listen, your grace, I know what the bastards are up to. Traitors, on my oath, get away from me, you heathen black bastard. I can't die. I can't die. Mother! The jetty with the bitten hand had gripped the sergeant's head and begun to turn it. Usually the neck was wrung swiftly, for a huge explosion of energy was needed to break a man's spine. But this time the jetty planned a slow and exquisitely painful death in revenge for his bitten hand. Mother! Hakeswell screamed as his face was forced farther around. And then, just as it was twisted back past his shoulder, he made one last effort. I saw a British officer in the city. No! Wait, the tipu called. The jetty paused, still holding Hexwell's head at an unnatural angle. What did he say? The tipu asked one of his officers who spoke some English and who had been translating the sergeant's desperate words. The officer translated again. The tipu waved one of his small, delicate hands, and the aggrieved jetty let go of Hexwell's head. The sergeant cursed as the agonizing tension left his neck, then rubbed at the pain. Bleeding heathen bastard, he said, you murdering black bugger. He spat at the jetty, shook himself out of the grip of the man holding him, then stood and walked two paces toward the palace. I saw him, didn't I, with my own eyes, in a frock like them. He gestured at the watching soldiers in their tiger-striped tunics. A lieutenant he is, and the army says he went back to Madras, but he didn't, did he? Cause he's here, cause I saw him. Me, Obadiah X, will your highness, and keep that bleeding heathen darky away from me. One of the jetties had come close, and Hakeswell, his face twitching, turned on the looming man. Go on, bugger off back to your star, you bloody great lump. The officer who spoke English called down from the veranda. Who did you see? he asked. I told you, Your Honour, didn't I? No, you didn't. Give us a name. Hexwell's face twitched. I'll tell you, he wheedled, if you promise to let me live. He dropped to his knees and stared up at the veranda. I don't mind being in your dungeons, my lord, for Obadiah Hexwell never did mind a rat or two. But I don't want these bleeding heathens screwing me neck back to front. It ain't a Christian act. The officer translated for the tipu, who at last nodded, and so prompted the officer to turn back to Hexwell. You will live, he called down. Word of honour, Hexwell asked. Upon my honour. 
Cross your heart and hope to die like it says in the scriptures. You will live, the officer snapped, so long as you tell us the truth. I always do that, sir. Honest Akeswell, that's my name, sir. I saw him, didn't I? Lieutenant Lawford, William he's called, tall, lanky fellow with fair hair and blue eyes. And he ain't alone. Private Bleeding Sharp was with him. The officer had not understood everything that Hakeswell had said, but he had understood enough. You are saying this man Lawford is a British officer? He asked. Of course he is. In my bleeding company, what's more. And they said he'd gone back to Madras on account of carrying dispatches. But he never did, because there weren't no dispatches to be carried. He's here, your grace, and up to no bleeding good. And, like I said, dolled up in a stripy frock. The officer seemed sceptical. The only Englishmen we have here, Sergeant, are prisoners or deserters. You're lying. Hakeswell spat on the gravel that was soaked with the blood from the decapitated prisoners. How can he be a deserter? Officers don't desert. They sell their commissions and bugger off home to mummy. I tell you, sir, he's an officer. And the other one's a right bastard. Flogged he was, and quite right too. He should have been flogged to bleeding death, only the general sent for him. The mention of the flogging woke a memory in the tipu. When was he flogged? The officer translated the tipu's question. Just before he ran, sir. Raw he must have been, but not raw enough. And you say the general sent for him? The officer sounded disbelieving. Harris, sir. The bugger what lost a lump out of his skull in America. He sent our colonel, he did, and Colonel Wellesley stopped the flogging. Stopped it! Hakeswell's indignation was still keen. Stopped the flogging was been properly ordered. Never seen anything so disgraceful in all me born days. Going to the dogs, the army is. Going to the dogs! The Tipu listened to the translation, then stepped back from the railing. He turned to Aparau, who had once served in the East India Company's army. Do British officers desert? None that I've ever heard of, Your Majesty, Aparau said, glad that the shadows of the balcony were hiding his pale and worried face. They might resign and sell their commission, but desert? Never. The Tipu nodded down to the kneeling Hakeswell. Put that wretch back in the cells, he ordered, and tell Colonel Goudin to meet me at the inner palace. Guards dragged Hexwell back to the city. And he had a bibby with him, Hexwell shouted as he was pulled away, but no one took any notice. The sergeant was shedding tears of pure happiness as he was taken back through the Bangalore gate. Thank you, mother! He called to the cloudless sky, Thank you, mother, for I cannot die. The twelve dead men were hidden in a makeshift grave. The troops marched back to their encampment, while the Tipu, being carried to the inner palace beneath the tiger-striped canopy of the palanquin, reflected that the sacrifice of the twelve prisoners had not been in vain, for it had revealed the presence of enemies. Allah be thanked, he reflected, for his luck had surely turned. You think Mrs. Bickerstaff has gone over to the enemy? Lawford asked Sharp for the third or fourth time. She's gone to his bed, Sharp said bleakly, but I reckon she'll still help us. Sharp had washed both his and Lawford's tunics, and now he patted the cloth to see if it had dried. Looking after Kit in this army, he reflected, was a deal easier than in the British. There was no pipe clay here to be caked onto cross belts and musket slings. No black ball to be used on boots, and no grease and powder to be slathered on the hair. He decided the tunics were dry enough and tossed one to the lieutenant, then pulled his own over his head, carefully freeing the gold medallion so that it hung on his chest. His tunic also boasted a red cord on his left shoulder, the tipu's insignia of a corporal. Lawford seemed to resent Sharp bearing these marks of rank that were denied to him. Suppose she betrays us, Lawford asked. Then we're in trouble, Sharp said brutally. But she won't. Mary's a good lass. Lawford shrugged. She jilted you. Easy come, easy go, Sharp said, then belted the tunic. 
Like most of the Tipu's soldiers, he now went bare-legged beneath the knee-length garment, though Lawford insisted on keeping his old British trousers. Both men wore their old shakos, though George the Third's badge had been replaced by a tin tiger with an upraised paw. Listen, Sharp said to a still worried Lawford, I've done what you asked, and the last says she'll find this Ravi, whatever his name is, and all we have to do now is wait. And if we get a chance to run, we run like buggery. You reckon that musket's ready for inspection? It's clean, Lawford said defensively, hefting his big French firelock. Christ, you'd be on a charge for that musket back in the proper army. Give it here. Sergeant Rotier's daily inspection was not for another half hour, and after that the two men would be free until mid-afternoon, when it would be the turn of Goudin's battalion to stand guard over the Mysore gate. That guard duty ended at midnight, but Sharp knew there would be no chance of an escape. For the Mysore gate did not offer an exit from the Tipu's territory, but rather led into the city's surrounding encampment, which in turn had a strong perimeter guard. The previous night Sharp had experimented to see whether his red cord and gold medallion would be authority enough for him to wander through the encampment, maybe allowing him to find a shadowed and quiet stretch of its earthworks, over which he could scramble in the dark. But he'd been intercepted within twenty yards of the gate, and politely but firmly ushered back. The tipu, it seemed, was taking no chances. I already had Wazzy clean that, Lawford said, nodding at the musket in Sharp's hands. Wazir was one of the small boys who hung around the barracks to earn pice for washing and cleaning equipment. I paid him, Lawford said indignantly. If you want a job done properly, Sharp said, you do it yourself. Hell! He swore because he'd pinched his finger on the musket's main spring, which he'd uncovered by unscrewing the lock plate. Look at that rust! He managed to unseat the main spring without losing the trigger mechanism, then began to file the rust off the spring's edge. Bloody rubbish, these French muskets, he grumbled. Nothing like a proper Birmingham bunduk. Do you clean your own musket like that? Lawford asked, impressed that Sharp had unscrewed the lock plate. Of course I do. Not that Hakeswell ever cares. He only looks at the outside. Sharp grinned. You remember that day you saved my skin with the flint? Hakeswell had changed it for a bit of stone, but I caught it before he could do any damage. He's a fly bastard, that one. He changed it? Lawford seemed shocked. Bloody snake, that Obadiah. How much you pay, was he? An Anna. He robbed you. you. Want to pass me that oil bottle? Lawford obliged, then settled back against the stone water trough in which Sharp had washed the tunics. He felt strangely content, despite the apparent failure of his mission. There was a pleasure in sharing this intimacy with Sharp. Indeed, it felt oddly like a privilege. Many young officers were frightened of the men they commanded, fearing their scorn, and they concealed their apprehension with a display of careless arrogance. Lawford doubted he could ever do that now, for he no longer felt any fear of the crude, hard men who formed the ranks of Britain's army. Sharp had cured him of that, by teaching him that the crudity was unthinking and the hardness a disguise for conscientiousness. Not that every man was conscientious, any more than all Britain's soldiers were crude. But too many officers assumed they were all brutes and treated them as such. Now Lawford watched as Sharp's capable fingers forced the cleaned mainspring back into its cavity, using his picklock as a lever. Lieutenant, a voice called respectfully across the yard. Lieutenant Lawford? Sir, Lawford responded without thinking, turning toward the voice and rising to his feet. Then he realized what he'd done and blanched. Sharp swore. Colonel Goudin walked slowly across the yard, rubbing his long face as he approached the two Englishmen. Lieutenant William Lawford, he inquired gently, of His Majesty's 33rd Regiment of Foot. Lawford said nothing. Goudin shrugged. Officers are supposedly men of honor, Lieutenant. Are you going to continue to lie? No, sir, Lawford said. Goudin sighed. So are you a commissioned officer or not? I am, sir. Lawford sounded ashamed, though whether it was because he'd been accused of dishonorable behavior or because he'd betrayed his true rank, Sharp could not tell. 
un dieu, caporal, sharp? Goudin asked sadly. I ain't an officer, Colonel. No, Goudin said. I did not think you were. But are you a true deserter? Course I am, sir. Sharp lied. Goudin smiled at Sharp's confident tone. And you, Lieutenant? He asked Lawford. Are you truly a deserter? Lawford made no reply, and Goudin sighed. Answer me on your honor, Lieutenant, if you would be so kind. No, sir, Lawford admitted. Nor is Private Sharp, sir. Goudin nodded. That is what the sergeant said. The sergeant, sir? Lawford asked. Goudin grimaced. I fear the Tipu executed the prisoners taken the other night. He spared just one because that man told him of you. The bastard! Sharp said, throwing the musket down in disgust. Bloody Hakeswill! He swore again, far more viciously. Sir? Lawford said to Goudin, ignoring Sharp's anger. Lieutenant? Goudin responded courteously. We were captured by the Tipu's men while wearing our red coats, sir. That means we should be protected as legitimate prisoners of war. Goudin shook his head. It means nothing of the sort, Lieutenant, for you lied about your rank and your intentions. He sounded disapproving. But I shall still plead for your lives. Goudin sat on the water trough's edge and flapped a hand at a persistent fly. Will you tell me why you came here? No, sir. Lawford said, no, I suppose not, but I warn you that the Tipu will want to know. Goudin smiled at Sharp. I had come to the conclusion, Sharp, that you are one of the best soldiers I've ever had the pleasure to command. But only one thing worried me about you, and that was why a good soldier would desert from his allegiance, even if he had been flogged. But now I see you are a better man than I thought. He frowned because Sharp while this elegant compliment was being paid, had lifted the back of his tunic and seemed to be scratching his bottom. Sorry, sir, Sharp said, noticing the colonel's distaste and dropping his tunic's hem. I'm sorry to be losing you, Sharp, Goudin went on. I'm afraid there's an escort waiting for you outside the barracks. You're to be taken to the palace. Goudin paused but must have decided there was nothing he could add that might ameliorate the implied threat of his words. Instead, he turned and snapped his fingers to bring a disapproving Sergeant Rotier into the courtyard. Rotier carried their red coats and Sharp's white trousers. They may help a little, Goudin said, though without any real hope in his voice. The colonel watched as they discarded their newly cleaned tunics and pulled on their red coats. About your woman, he said to Sharp, then hesitated. She had nothing to do with her, sir, Sharp said hurriedly as he pulled on the trousers. He buttoned his old jacket, and the red coat felt strangely confining after the looser tunic. On my honor, sir, and besides, he added, she gave me the push. Twice unlucky, Sharp. Bad in a soldier, that. Goudin smiled and reached out a hand. Your muskets, gentlemen, if you please. Sharp handed over both guns. Sir? Private Sharp. Sharp reddened and became awkward. It was an honor to serve you, sir. I mean that. I wish we had more like you in our army. Thank you, Sharp. Goudin gravely acknowledged the compliment. Of course, he added, if you tell me now that your experiences here have changed your loyalties and that you would truly like to continue serving the Tipu, then you might be spared whatever is in store for you. I think I could persuade His Majesty of your change of heart, but you'd need to tell me why you came here in the first place. Lawford stiffened as this offer was made to Sharp. Sharp hesitated and shook his head. No, sir. He said, I reckon I'm a proper red coat. Goudin had expected the reply. Good for you, Sharp. And by the way, Private, you might as well hang the medallion around your neck. They'll find it anyway. <laughs> yes, sir. Sharp retrieved the gold from his trouser pocket, where he had optimistically concealed it, and looped the chain over his head. 
Goudin stood and gestured toward the barracks room. This way, gentlemen. That was the end of the pleasantries, and Sharp suspected it would be the last pleasantry for a very long time. For now, they were the Tipu's prisoners. Upper Rao had Mary fetched to a room off the courtyard of his house. Kunwar Singh was waiting there, but Mary was frightened and dared not look at Kunwar Singh for fear of seeing a hint of bad news on his handsome face. Mary had no particular reason to expect bad news, but she was ever wary, and something about Upper Rao's stiff demeanour told her that her presentiments were justified. Your companions, Upper Rao told her when the servant had closed the door behind her. Have been arrested, Lieutenant Lawford and Private Shop. The one you say is your brother, my half brother, sir. Mary whispered, "If you say so." Upper Rao conceded. Kunva Singh spoke a little English, though not enough to follow the conversation, which was why Upper Rao had chosen to question Mary in that language, even though his mastery of it was uncertain. Upper Rao doubted whether Sharp and Mary were related. But he liked the girl, nevertheless, and he approved of her as Kunwa Singh's bride. The gods alone knew what the future would bring to Mysore, but it was likely that the British would be involved, and if Kunwa Singh had a wife who spoke English, there would be an advantage for him. Besides, Appa Rao's wife Lakshmi was convinced that the girl was a good, modest creature, and that her past, like the past of Kunwa Singh's family, was best forgotten. Why did they come here? The general asked. I don't know, sir. Appa Rao took a pistol from his belt and began loading it. Both Mary and Kunwa Singh watched with alarm, as the general carefully measured powder from a silver horn into the pistol's chased barrel. Aruna, he said, using the name Mary had taken from her mother. Let me tell you what will happen to Lieutenant Lawford, and Private Sharp. He paused to tap the horn's spout against the pistol's muzzle to shake loose the last specks of powder. The Tipu will have them questioned, and doubtless the questioning will be painful. In the end, Aruna, they will confess. All men do. Maybe they will live. Maybe not. I cannot tell. He looked up at her, then pushed a scrap of wadding into the pistol. The Tipu. He went on as he selected a bullet from the pistol's wooden case. We'll want to know two things: first, why they came here, and second, whether they were told to make contact with any person inside the city. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. The general placed the bullet in the barrel, then pulled out the pistol's short ramrod. They're going to tell him, Aruna. However brave they are, they will talk in the end. Of course. He paused as he rammed the bullet hard down. The Tipu might remember your existence, and if he does, Aruna, then he will send for you, and you will be questioned too, but not so gently as I am questioning you now. No, sir," Mary whispered. Appa Rao slotted the short ramrod back in its hoops. He primed the gun, but did not cock it. I want no harm to come to you, Aruna. So tell me why the two men came to Seringapatam. Mary stared at the pistol in the general's hand. It was a beautiful weapon with a butt inlaid with ivory and a barrel chased with silver whorls. Then she looked up into the general's eyes and saw that he had no intention of shooting her. She did not see threat in those eyes, just fear, and it was that fear which decided her to tell the truth. They came, sir. She said, "Because they had to reach a man called Macanless." It was the answer Rao had feared. And did they? No, sir. So what did they find out? Rao asked, laying the pistol down on the table. What did they find out? He asked in a harder voice. Private Sharp told me that the British shouldn't attack in the west, sir. Mary said, forgetting to describe Sharp as her brother. That's all he said, honestly, sir. Or, Rao asked, surely not. Why would he tell you that? Did he think you could get the news out of the city? Mary stared down at the pistol. I was to find a man, sir, she said at last. Oh. She looked up at the general, fear in her eyes. 
a merchant sir called Ravi Shekhar. Anyone else? No, sir, truly. Rao believed her and felt a wash of relief. His greatest fear was that Sharp and Lawford might have been given his own name. For although Colonel McCandless had promised to keep Rao's treachery a secret, Rao could not be certain that the promise had been kept. McCandless himself had not been questioned under torture, for the Tipu seemed convinced that the elderly Colonel Ross had indeed been foraging when he'd been captured. But Rao still felt the threat of discovery moving insidiously closer. Lawford and Sharp could not identify Rao himself as a traitor, but they very well might identify McCandless, and then the Tipu's jetties would turn their attention to the elderly Scotsman. And how long would he endure their merciless treatment? The general wondered if he should make a dash from the city to the British lines, but rejected the thought almost as soon as it occurred to him. Such an escape might secure Upper Rao's own safety, but it would sacrifice his large family and all the faithful servants who were in his employment. No, he decided. This dangerous game must be seen to its finish. He pushed the pistol closer to Mary. Take it, he ordered her. Mary looked astonished. The pistol, sir? Take it. Now listen, girl. Ravi Shekhar is dead, and his body was fed to the tigers. It's possible the Tipu will forget you even existed, but if he remembers, then you might need that pistol. Upper Rao wondered if he could smuggle the girl clean out of the city. It was a tempting thought, but every civilian was stopped at the gates and had to produce a pass stamped by the Tipu himself, and very few received that pass. A soldier might succeed in escaping the city, but not a civilian. Upper Rao gazed into Mary's dark eyes. I am told that placing it in your mouth and pointing it slightly upwards is the most effective. Mary shuddered, and the general nodded to Convar Singh. I give her to your care, he said. Convar Singh bowed his head. Mary went back to the women's quarters while Appa Rao made an offering at his household shrine. He lingered there, thinking how he envied the certainty of men like the Tipu or Colonel McCandless. Neither man seemed to have any doubts, but rather believed that destiny was whatever they themselves made of it. They were not subject to other men's wills, and Appa Rao would have liked such certainty for himself. He would have liked to live in a Mysore ruled by its ancient Hindu house, and a Mysore in which no other nations intruded. No British, no French, no Maharatas, and no Muslims. But instead he found himself caught between two armies, and somehow he had to keep his wife, his children, his servants, and himself alive. He closed his eyes, touched his hands to his forehead, and bowed to Ganesh, the elephant-headed god who guarded Aparao's household. Just keep us alive, he prayed to the god. Just keep us alive. The Tipu himself came to the courtyard where the tigers had been restored to their long chains. Four infantrymen guarded the two Englishmen. The Tipu did not come in state with chamberlains and courtiers, but was accompanied by only one officer and two jetties who watched impassively as the Tipu strode to Sharp and tugged the medallion from around his neck. He pulled so hard that the chain cut into the back of Sharp's neck before it snapped. Then the Tipu spat into Sharp's face and turned away. The officer was a suave young Muslim who spoke good English. His Majesty, he said, when the Tipu turned back to face the prisoners, wishes to know why you came to this city. Lawford stiffened. I'm an officer in his Britannic Majesty's, he began, but the Indian cut him off with a gesture. Quiet, the officer said wearily. You are nothing except what we make you. So why are you here? Why do you think? Sharp said. The officer looked at him. I think, he said judiciously, that you came here to spy. So now you know, Sharp said defiantly. The officer smiled. But maybe you are given the name of a man who might help you inside the city. That is the name we want. Sharp shook his head. Didn't give us any names, not one. Maybe, 
the officer said, then nodded at the two jetties who seized hold of Sharp, then ripped the coat down his back so that its buttons tore off one by one as it was dragged down. He wore no shirt beneath, only the bandages that still covered the wounds caused by the flogging. One of the jetties drew a knife and unceremoniously sliced through the bandages, making Sharp flinch as the blade cut into the almost healed wounds. The bandages were tossed aside, and the smell of them made one of the tigers stir. The other jetty had crossed to the four soldiers, where he'd drawn out one of their muskets' ramrods. Now he stood behind Sharp, and when the tipu nodded, he gave Sharp's back a vicious cut with the metal rod. The sudden pain was every bit as bad as the flogging. It stabbed up and down Sharp's spine, and he gasped with the effort not to scream aloud, as the force of the blow threw him forward. He broke his fall with his hands, and now his back faced the sky, and the jetty slashed down three more times, opening the old wounds, cracking a rib, and spurting blood onto the courtyard sand. One of the tigers growled, and the links of its chain jangled as the beast lunged toward the smell of fresh blood. "'We shall beat him until we have the name,' the officer told Lawford mildly, "'and when he is dead, we shall beat you until you are dead.' The jetty struck down again, and this time Sharp rolled onto his side, but the second jetty pushed him back onto his belly. Sharp was grunting and panting, but was determined not to cry aloud. "'You can't do this!' Lawford protested. "'Of course we can,' the officer answered. "'We shall start splintering his bones now. "'But not his spine, not yet. "'We want the pain to go on.' "'He nodded, and the jetty slashed down again, "'and this time Sharp did cry aloud, "'as the stab of pain brought back all the agony of the flogging. "'A merchant!' Lawford blurted out. "'The officer held up his hand to stop the beating. "'A merchant, Lieutenant? "'The city is full of merchants.' He deals in metals, Lawford said. I don't know more than that. Of course you do, the officer said, then nodded at the jetty who raised the ramrod high in the air. Ravi Shekhar, Lawford shouted. The lieutenant was bitterly ashamed for giving the name away, and the shame was obvious on his face, but nor could Lawford stand by and watch Sharp beaten to death. He believed, or he wanted to believe, that he could have endured the pain of the beating himself without betraying the name, but it was more than he could bear to watch another man pounded into a bloody pulp. Ravi Shekhar, the officer said, checking the jetty's stroke. And how did you find him? We didn't, Lawford said. We didn't know how. We were waiting till we spoke some of your language. Then we were going to ask for him about the city, but we haven't tried yet. Sharp groaned. Blood trickled down his sides and dripped onto the stones. One of the tigers staled beside the wall, and the smell of urine filled the courtyard with its thin, sour stench. The officer, who was wearing one of the prized gold tiger medallions about his neck, talked with the tipu, who stared dispassionately at Sharp, then asked a question. And what, lieutenant? The officer translated. Would you have told Ravi Shekhar? Everything we've discovered about the defences, Lawford said miserably. That's why we were sent. And what did you discover? How many men you have, how many guns, how many rockets. That's all. It's enough, isn't it? Lawford retorted. The officer translated the answers. The tipu shrugged, glanced at Lawford, then took a small brown leather bag from inside a pocket of his yellow silk tunic. He unlaced the bag's mouth, stepped to sharp side, then trickled salt onto the beaten man's open wounds. Sharp hissed with the pain. Who else would you have told in this city? The officer asked. There was no one else, Lawford pleaded. In the name of God, there was no one else. We were told Ravi Shekhar could get a message out. That was all. The tipu believed him. Lawford's chagrin was so clear and his shame so palpable that he was utterly believable. Besides, the story made sense. And so you've never seen Ravi Shekhar? the officer asked. Never. You're looking at him now, the officer said, gesturing at the tigers. His body was fed to the tigers weeks ago. Oh, God, Lawford said, 
and he closed his eyes as he realized just what an utter failure he'd been. For a moment he wanted to retch, then he controlled the impulse and opened his eyes to watch as the tipu picked up Sharp's red coat and dropped it onto the bloody back. For a second, the tipu hesitated, wondering whether to release the tigers onto the two men. Then he turned away. Take them to the cells, he ordered. The sacrifice of prisoners had yielded up the traitors and turned the tipu's luck. There was no need for a further sacrifice. Not yet. But the tipu knew that fortune was ever capricious, and so the prisoners could wait until another sacrifice was needed. And then, to guarantee victory or to stave off defeat, they would die. And till then, the Tippo decided, they could just rot. Chapter 9 The dungeons lay in one of the palace's northern courtyards, hard under the city's inner mud wall. The courtyard stank of sewage, the smell powerful enough to make sharp half-rich as he staggered beside Lawford at the point of a bayonet. The courtyard was a busy place. The families of the palace servants lived in low, thatched buildings surrounding the yard, where their lives were spent cheek by jowl with the Tipu's stables, and the small enclosure where he kept eight cheetahs he used for hunting gazelles. The cheetahs were taken to the hunt in wheeled cages, and at first Sharp thought they were to be placed inside one of the barred vehicles. But then one of the escorts pushed him past the ponderous carts towards a flight of stone steps that descended to a long, narrow trench of stone that lay open to the sky. A tall fence of iron bars surrounded the pit that was guarded by a pair of soldiers. One of them used a key to open a padlock the size of a mango. Then the escort shoved Sharp and Lawford through the open gate. The dungeon guards did not carry muskets, but instead had coiled whips in their belts and bell-mouthed blunderbusses on their shoulders. One of them pointed mutely down the steps, and Sharp, following Lawford down the stairs, saw that the trench was a stone-flagged, dead-end corridor, lined on either side with barred cells. There were eight cells in the pit, four on each side, and each separated from its neighbours and from the central trench-like corridor, by iron bars alone, but bars that were as thick as a man's wrist. The turnkey indicated that they should wait while he unlocked a cell, but the first padlock he attempted to open had become stiff, or else had rusted, for it would not budge, and then he could not find a key to fit another of the big old locks. Something stirred in the straw of the cell that lay at the far right-hand end of the corridor. Sharp, waiting as the guard sorted through his keys, heard the straw rustle again. Then there was a growl as a huge tiger heaved up from its bed to stare at them with blank yellow eyes. More straw stirred in the first cell on the left, close by where Sharp and Lawford were standing. Look who it is it. Aquel had come to the bars. Sharp, eh? Be quiet, Sergeant, Lawford snapped. Yes, sir, Mr. Lieutenant Lawford, sir. Quiet it is, sir. Hakeswell clung to the bars of his cage, staring wide-eyed at the two newcomers. His face twitched. Quiet as a grave, sir, but no one talks to me down here. He won't. He nodded toward the cell opposite that the guard was now unlocking. Likes it quiet, he does. Hakeswell went on. Like a bleeding church. Says his prayers, too. Always quiet it is here, except when the darkies are having a shout at each other. Dirty bastards they are. Smell the sewage, can you? One giant jakes. Hexwell's face twisted in rictus, and in the gloom of the shadowed cells his eyes seemed to glitter with an unholy delight. Been missing company, I have. Bastard. Sharp muttered. Quiet, both of you, Lawford insisted. And then, with his innate politeness, the lieutenant nodded thanks to the guard, who had finally opened the cell directly opposite Hakeswell's lair. Come on, Sharp, Lawford said, then stepped fastidiously into the filthy straw. The cell was eight foot deep and ten foot long, and a little over the height of a man, 
The sewage smell was rank, but no worse than in the courtyard above. The barred door clashed shut behind them, and the key was turned. Well, eh? A tired voice said from the shadows of the cell, "How very good of you to visit me." Sharp, his eyes accustoming themselves to the dimness of the dungeons, saw that Colonel McCandless had been crouching in one corner, half shrouded by straw. The Colonel now stood to greet them, but he was weak, for he tottered as he stood, though he shook off Lawford's attempt to help him. A fever, he explained,、uh, comes and goes. I've had it for years. I suspect the only thing that will cure it will be some soft Scottish rain, but that seems an ever more unlikely prospect. It is good to see you, Willie. You too, sir. You've met Private Sharp, I think. McCandless gave Sharp a grim look. I have a question for you, young man. It wasn't gunpowder, sir. Sharp said, remembering his first confrontation with the Colonel and thus anticipating the question. It tasted wrong, sir. It wasn't salty. I, it didn't look like powder. The Scotsman said it was blowing in the wind like flour. But that wasn't my question, Private. My question, Private, is what would you have done if it had been gunpowder? I'd have shot you, sir. Sharp said, begging your pardon, sir. Sharp, Lawford remonstrated. Quite right, man. McCandless said. The wretched fellow was testing you, wasn't he? He was giving you a recruitment test, and you couldn't fail it. I'm glad it wasn't powder, but I don't mind saying you had me worried for a brief while. Do you mind if I sit, Willie? I'm not in my usual good health. He sank back into his straw from where he frowned up at Sharp. Nor are you, Private. Are you in pain? Buster's cracked a rib, sir, and I'm bleeding a bit. Do you mind if I sit? Sharp gingerly sat against the side bars of the cell and carefully lifted away the coat that had been draped over his back. "Bit of fresh air will heal it, sir," he said to Lawford, who was insisting on examining the newly opened wounds, though there was nothing he could do to help them mend. "You won't get fresh air here," McCandless said. "You smell the sewage." "You can't miss that smell, Uncle," Lawford said. "That's the new inner wall," McCandless explained. When they built it, they cut the city drains, so now the night soil can't reach the river, and the sewage puddles just east of here. Some of it seeps away through the water gate, but not enough. One learns to pray for a west wind. He smiled grimly, among other things. McCandless wanted news not only of what had brought Lawford and Sharp into Seringapatam, but of the siege's progress. And he groaned when he heard where the British had placed their works. So Harris is coming from the west. Yes, sir. Straight into the Tipu's loving arms. The Scotsman sat quietly for a moment, sometimes shivering because of his fever. He had wrapped himself in straw again, but he was still cold despite the day's intense damp heat. And you couldn't get a message out. No, I suppose not. Those things are never easy. He shook his head. Let's hope that Tipu doesn't finish his mine. It's near finished, sir. Sharp delivered yet more bad news. I saw it. Aye, it would be. He's an efficient man, the Tipu. McCandless said, efficient and clever, cleverer than his father and old Hyder Ali was canny enough. I never met him, but I think I'd have liked the old rogue. The son now. I never met him either until I was captured, and I wish I hadn't. He's a good soldier, but a bad enemy. McCandless closed his eyes momentarily as a shudder racked his body. What will he do with us? Lawford asked. That I cannot say. Colonel McCandless replied, "It depends probably on his dreams. He's not as good a Muslim as he'd like us to think, for he still believes in some older magic, and he sets great store by his dreams." If his dreams tell him to kill us, then doubtless we'll have our heads turned back to front like the unfortunate gentlemen who shared these cells with me until quite recently. You heard about them? We heard. Lawford said, "Murdered to amuse the Tipu's troops." McCandless said disapprovingly, "And there were some good Christian men among them too. 
Only that thing over there survived. He jerked his head toward Hakeswell's cell. He survived, sir, Sharp said vengefully, because he betrayed us. It's a lie, sir. Hakeswell, who had been avidly listening to Sharp and Lawford's tale, snapped indignantly from across the corridor. A filthy lie, sir, as I expect from a gutter soldier like Private Sharp. McCandless turned to gaze at the sergeant. Then why were you spared? He asked coldly. Touched by God, sir. Always have been, sir. Can't be killed, sir. Mad, McCandless said quietly. You can be killed, Obadiah, Sharp said. Christ, if it wasn't for you, you bastard, I'd have taken our news to General Harris. Lies, sir. More lies. Hakeswell insisted. Quiet, both of you, McCandless said. And Private Sharp. Sir? I'd be grateful if you did not blaspheme. Remember that thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Exodus 20, verse 7. Amen, sir. Hakes will call. And praise the Lord, sir. Sorry, sir, Sharp muttered. You do know your Ten Commandments, don't you, Sharp? McCandless asked. No, sir. Not one of them? McCandless asked, shocked. I shall not be found out, sir. Is that one of them? Sharp asked guilelessly. McCandless stared at him in horror. Do you have any religion, Sharp? No, sir. Never found a need for it. You were born with a hunger for it, man. The colonel spoke with some of his old energy. And for a few things else, sir. McCandless shivered under his mantle of straw. If God spares me sharp, I may attempt to repair some of the damage to your immortal soul. Do you still have the Bible your mother gave you, Willie? They took it from me, sir, Lawford said. But I did manage to save one page. He took the single page from his trouser pocket. He was blushing, for both he and Sharp knew why the page had been torn from the holy book. And it was not for any purpose that Colonel McCandless would have approved. Just the one page, sir, Lawford said apologetically. Give it here, man, McCandless said fiercely, and let us see what the good Lord has to say to us. He took the crumpled page, smoothed it, and tipped it to the light. Ah, the revelation! He seemed pleased. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. He read aloud, Amen to that. Not very cheerful, sir, Sharp ventured. That is the most cheerful thing I can contemplate in this place, Private. A promise from the Lord God Almighty himself that when I die I shall be carried into his glory. The colonel smiled for that consolation. Might I assume, Private, that you cannot read? Me, sir? No, sir. Never taught, sir. Big stupid, sir, he is, sir. Hakes will offer from across the corridor. Always was, sir. Dumb as a bucket. We must teach you your letters, McCandless said, ignoring the sergeant's comments. Mr. Lawford was going to do that, sir, Sharp said. Then I suggest he begin now, McCandless said firmly. Lawford smiled diffidently. It's difficult to know where to begin, Uncle. Why not with tea for tiger, McCandless suggested. The beast growled, then settled in its straw, and Sharp, some years late, began his lessons. The siege works advanced fast. Redcoats and sepoys worked day and night, sapping forward and shoring up the trench sides with bamboo mats. Rockets continually harassed the work, and the Tipu succeeded in remounting some of his guns on the western walls, though their fire did little to disturb the work, and the gunners suffered grievously from the counterfire of the British 18-pounders emplaced in the captured mill fort. Smaller guns, 12-pounders and short-barreled howitzers, joined the bombardment of the ramparts, and their shells and round shots seared above the ground, where yard by yard the red earth was broken until at last the big, short-range breaching batteries were dug, and the rest of the massive siege guns were rolled forward in the night and concealed in their gun pits. To the Tipu's troops, watching from the battered summit of the western wall, the approaches to the city were now a maze of newly turned earth. Approach trenches angled their way across the farmland, ending in larger mounds of earth thrown up from the deeper pits that held the breaching guns. 
Not all those bigger mounds concealed guns. For some of the spoil heaps were deliberately thrown up as deceptions so that the tipu could not guess where the real guns were emplaced until they opened fire. The tipu only knew that the British would aim at his western wall, but he did not yet know the exact stretch of wall that the enemy engineers had chosen, and it suited General Harris that the tipu should not learn that spot until it was necessary for the breaching batteries to open fire. If the defenders had too much warning of the place chosen for the storm, then they would have time to build elaborate new defences behind it. This book is continued on disc 9. Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell continued. Disc 9. If the defenders had too much warning of the place chosen for the storm, then they would have time to build elaborate new defences behind it. But the Tipu was gambling that he already knew where the British would choose to make their breach, and in the old gatehouse where the massive mine was concealed, his engineers finished their preparations. They stacked stone around the vast powder charge so that its explosion would be directed northward into the space between the walls. For the mine to be effective, the British had to sight their breach in the short stretch of wall between the old gatehouse and the city's northwest bastion. And the Tipu's gamble was not an outrageous risk, for it was not difficult to forecast that the breach would indeed be blasted in that section of wall. The site was dictated by the outer wall's decay and by the shortcomings of the low glacis that lay outside that inviting wall. The rudimentary glacis half-protected most of the city's western battlements, its raw earth slope designed to deflect cannonballs up from the wall's base. But where the city wall was most decayed, the river ran very close to the defences, and there'd been no room to construct even the pretense of a glacis. Instead, a low mud wall continued the line of the glacis, and that wall penned in the water that had been pumped into the ditch between the outer ramparts and the glacis. That low wall was no obstacle compared to a glacis, and the Tipu reckoned it would be an irresistible target for the enemy engineers. He did not put all his faith in the single massive mine. That mine could well kill or maim hundreds of the assaulting troops, but there were thousands more enemy soldiers who could be sent against the city, and so the Tipu prepared his army for its test. The western walls would be crammed with men when the time came, and those men would each have at least three loaded muskets, and behind each fighting soldier would be men trained to reload the discharged weapons. The British storm would thus be met with a blistering hail of musket fire, and mixed with that maelstrom of lead would be round shot and canister, fired from the cannons that had replaced the destroyed guns, and which were now concealed behind the mutilated ramparts. Thousands of rockets were also ready. At long range, the weapon was erratic, but in the close confines of a breach, where men were crammed as tight as sheep in a pen, the rockets could inflict a dreadful slaughter. We shall stuff hell with infidel souls, the Tipu boasted, though at every prayer time he took care to beseech Allah for an early monsoon, and every dawn he would look at the sky in hope of seeing some signs of rain. But the skies remained obstinately clear. An early monsoon would drown the British in torrential rain before the rockets and guns could cut them to bloody shreds, but it seemed the rains would not come early to Mysore this year. The skies might be clear, but every other omen was good. The ill luck that had led to the loss of the mill fort had been diverted by the sacrifice of the British prisoners, and now the Tipu's dreams and auguries spoke only of victory. The Tipu recorded his dreams each morning, writing them down in a large book before discussing their portents with his advisers. His diviners peered into pots of heated oil to read the shifting coloured swirls on the surface. And those shimmering signs, like the dreams, forecast a great victory. The British would be destroyed in southern India, and then, when the French sent troops to reinforce Mysore's growing empire, the redcoats would be scoured from the north of the country. Their bones would bleach on the sites of their defeats, and their silken colours would fade on the walls of the Tipu's great palaces. The tiger would rule from the snowy mountains of the north to the palm-edged beaches of the south, and from the Coromandel coast to the seas off Malabar. 
All that glory was foretold by the dreams and by the glistening auguries of the oil. But then, one dawn, it seemed the auguries might be deceiving, for the British suddenly unmasked four of their newly made breaching batteries, and the great guns crashed back on their trails, and the intricate network of trenches and earthworks was shrouded by the giant gusts of smoke that were belched out with every thunderous recoil. The balls were not aimed where the tipper had hoped, at the vulnerable part of the wall behind the missing section of Glacis, but at the city's mighty northwest bastion, a complex of battlements that loomed high above the river, and from its topmost ramparts dominated both the northern and western walls. The whole city seemed to shake as the balls slammed home again and again, and every strike sprang dust from the old masonry, until at last the first stones fell. From the north bank of the river, where the smaller British camp was sighted, more guns added their fire, and still more stones tumbled down into the ditches as the gunners gnawed away at the great bastion. Next day, more of the siege guns opened fire, but these new weapons were aimed at the cavaliers at the very southern end of the western wall. There were small cannon mounted in those cavaliers, but their embrasures were destroyed in less than a morning's work. And the defenders' guns were hurled back off their carriages, and still the batteries hammered at the northwest bastion until, an hour after midday, the great fortification collapsed. At first, the sound of the bastion's fall was like the creak and groan of a deep earthquake. Then it turned into a rumble like thunder, as the massive battlements disintegrated beneath a huge cloud of dust, that slowly drifted to settle on the corvary. So that, for almost a mile downstream, the water was turned as white as milk. There was an eerie silence after the bastion had been toppled, for the besiegers' guns had fallen silent. The Tipu's troops rushed to the walls, their muskets and rockets ready, but no attackers stirred from the British lines. Their impudent flags flapped in the breeze, but the redcoats and their native allies stayed in their trenches. A brave man of the Tipu's army ventured up the mound of rubble that had been the northwest corner of the city's defences. Dust coated the tiger stripes of his tunic, as he clambered across the unsteady ruins, to find the green flag that had been flying from the bastion's topmost rampart. He retrieved the flag, shook the dust from its folds, and waved it in the air. One enemy gunner saw the movement on top of the rubble heap and fired his huge gun. The ball screamed through the dust, ricocheted from a boulder, and bounced on up over the northern defences, to fall into the whitened river. The soldier, unscathed, waved the flag again, then planted its broken staff at the summit of the bastion's ruins. The tipu inspected the damage to his western defences. The guns were gone from the southern cavaliers, and the northwest bastion was untenable. But there was no breach in either place, and both the outer and inner walls were undamaged. The low glacis had protected the bottom part of the walls, and though some of the northwest bastion stones had fallen into the flooded ditch, there was no ramp up which a storming party could climb. What they were doing, the Tipu announced to his entourage, was destroying our flanking guns, which means they still plan to attack in the center of the wall. Which is where we want them to attack. Colonel Goudin agreed. For a time, like the Tipu, he had been worried that the British bombardment meant that they planned to enter the city at its northwestern corner. But now, in the lull after the collapse of the towers, the enemy's strategy seemed plain. They had not been trying to make a breach, but instead had knocked down the two places where the Tipu could mount high guns to plunge their fire onto the flanks of the storming troops. The breach would be made next. It will be where we want it to be. I'm sure. Goudin confirmed the Tipu's guess. The man who had planted the flag on the crest of the fallen bastion was brought to the Tipu on the western wall, close to where the towers had fallen. The Tipu rewarded him with a purse of gold. The man was a Hindu, and that pleased the Tipu, who worried about such men's loyalties. Is he one of yours? He asked Aparau, who was accompanying the Tipu on the inspection, "No, Your Majesty." The Tipu suddenly turned and gazed up into the tall Aparau's face. He was frowning. "Those wretched men of Gudas," the Tipu said, 
Wasn't there a woman with them? Yes, your majesty. And didn't she go to your house? The tipu charged Apa Rao. She did, highness, but she died. Apa Rao told the lie smoothly. The tipu was intrigued. Died? She was a drab, sick creature, Apa Rao said carelessly, and just died, as should the men who brought her here. He still feared that the arrest of Sharp and Lawford could lead to his own betrayal, and though he did not truly wish them dead, nor did he wish the Tipu to believe that he desired them to live. Those two will die. The Tipu promised grimly, his query about Mary apparently forgotten. They will surely die. He promised again, as he clambered up the ruins of the northwestern bastion, We shall either offer their black souls to avert ill fortune, or we shall sacrifice them as thanks for our victory. He would prefer the latter, and he imagined killing the two men on the very same day that he first ascended the silver steps of his tiger throne, the throne he'd sworn never to use until his enemies were destroyed. He felt a fierce pang of anticipation. The redcoats would come to his city, and there they would be seared by the fires of vengeance and crushed by falling stone. Their groans would echo through the days of their dying, and then the rains would come and the sluggish corvary would swell into its full drowning spate, and the remaining British, who were already low on food, would have no choice but to withdraw. They would leave their guns behind and begin their long journey across Mysore, and every mile of their retreat would be dogged by the Tipu's lances and sabermen. The vultures would grow fat this year, and a trail of sun-whitened bones would be left across India, until the very last red-coated man died. And there, the Tipu decided, where the last Englishman died, he would erect a high pillar of marble, white and gleaming, and crowned with a snarling tiger's head. The Muezzin's call echoed across the city, summoning the faithful to prayer. The sound was beautiful in the silence after the guns. The Tipu, obedient to his god, hurried toward his palace with one last backward glance at the damned. They could make their bridge, they could cross the river, and they could come to his walls. But once at the walls, they would die. P-I-K, Sharp said, scratching the letters in the dust of the cell's floor where he'd cleared a patch of straw. L-O-K. Picklock. Lawford said, very good, but you've left out two C's. But I've got the pick lock, sir, Sharp said, and produced it from his coat pocket. It was a small cluster of metal shafts, some curiously bent at their tips, which he quickly hid once he'd shown it to Lawford. Why didn't they find it? Lawford asked. Both men had been searched when they'd been taken to the palace after their arrest, and though the guards had left the page of the Bible in Lawford's pocket, They'd taken everything else of value. I had it somewhere it couldn't be found, sir, Sharp said. Colonel Goudin thought I was scratching me ass, if you follow me, but I was hiding it. I'd rather not know, Lawford said primly. A good picklock like that can take care of those old padlocks in seconds, sir, Sharp said, nodding at the lock on their cell door. Then we just have to rush the guards. And get a belly full of lead, Lawford suggested. When the assault comes, Sharp said, the guards will like us not be at the top of the steps, trying to see what's happening. They won't hear us. Sharp's back was still painful, and the wounds inflicted by the jetty were crusted with dried blood and pus that tore whenever he moved too quickly. But there was no gangrene, and he had been spared any fever, and that good fortune was restoring his confidence. When the assault comes, Sharp, Colonel McCandless intervened. Our guards are more likely to be on the walls, leaving our security to the tiger. I hadn't thought of that, sir. Sharp sounded disappointed. I don't think even you can rush a tiger, McCandless said. No, sir, I don't suppose I can, Sharp admitted. Each night at dusk the guards left the cells, but first they released the tiger. It was a difficult process for the tiger had to be held away from the guards with long spears as they retreated up the steps. 
It had evidently tried to charge the guards once, for it bore a long scar down one muscular striped flank. And these days, to prevent another such attack, the guards tossed down a great chunk of raw goat meat to satisfy the tiger's hunger before they released it. And the prisoners would spend the night hours listening to the creature grinding and slavering as it ripped the last pieces of flesh from the bones. Each dawn, the tiger was herded back to its cell, where it slept through the heat of the day until its time for guard duty came again. It was a huge and mangy beast, not nearly so sleek as the six tigers kept in the palace yard, but it had a hungrier look, and sometimes, in the moonlight, Sharp would watch it pacing up and down the short corridor, the fall of its pads silent on the stone, as it endlessly went up and down, up and down, and he wondered what tiger thoughts brewed behind its night-glossed yellow eyes. Sometimes, for no reason, it would roar in the night, and the hunting cheetahs would call back, and the night would be loud with the sound of the animals. Then the tiger would leap lithely up the steps and roar another challenge from the bars at the head of the staircase. It always came back down, its approach silent, and its gaze malevolent. By day, when the tigers twitched in its sleep, the guards would watch the cells. Sometimes there were just two guards, but at other times there were as many as six. Each morning a pair of prisoners from the city's civilian jail arrived in leg irons, to take away the night soil buckets. And when these had been emptied and returned, the first meal was served. It was usually cold rice, sometimes with beans or scraps of fish in it, with a tin jug of water. A second pail of rice was brought in the afternoon, but otherwise the prisoners were left alone. They listened to the sounds above them, ever fearful that they might be summoned to face the Tipu's dreaded killers. And while they waited, McCandless prayed, Hakeswell mocked, Lawford worried, and Sharp learned his letters. At first the learning was hard, and it was made no easier by Hakeswell's constant scoffing. Lawford and McCandless would tell the sergeant to be quiet, but after a while Hakeswell would chuckle again and start talking, ostensibly to himself, in the far corner of his cage. Above himself, ain't he? Hakeswell would mutter just loud enough for Sharp to hear. Got hairs and bleeding graces. That's what Sharp has got, hairs and graces. Learning to read. Might as well teach a stone to fart. It ain't natural, ain't right. A private soldier should know his place. Says so in the scriptures. It says nothing of the sort, Sergeant. McCandless would always snap after such an assertion. And always, every daylight hour of every day... There was the sound of the besiegers' guns. Their thunderous percussions filled the sky and were echoed by the crack of iron on sun-dried mud as the eighteen-pound round shot struck home. While nearer, the Tipu's own guns answered. Few such cannon had survived on the western walls, but closer to the dungeons on the northern rampart, the Tipu's gunners traded shot for shot with the batteries across the corvary and the sound of the weapons punched the warm air incessantly. "'Working hard, them gunners,' Hakeswell would say, "'doing a proper job like real soldiers should, "'working up a proper muck sweat, "'not wasting their time with bleeding letters. "'C-A-T. "'Who the hell needs to know that? "'It's still a bleeding pussycat. "'All you need to know is how to skin the thing, "'not how to spell it. "'Quiet, sergeant!' McCandless would growl, Yes, sir, I shall be quiet, sir, like a church mouse, sir. But a few moments later the sergeant could be heard grumbling again, Private Morgan. I remember him and he could read and he wasn't nothing but trouble. He always knew more than anyone else, but he didn't know better than to be flogged, did he? Would never have happened if he hadn't had his letters. His mother taught him the silly Welsh bitch. He read his Bible when he should have been cleaning his musket. Died under the lash, he did. And good riddance. A private soldier's got no business reading. Bad for the eyes, sends you blind. Hakes will even talk at night. Sharp would wake to hear the sergeant talking in a low voice to the tiger. And one night even the tiger stopped to listen. 
You're not such a bad puss, are you? Hakes were crooned. Down here all alone, you are just like me. The sergeant reached a tentative hand through the bars and gave the beast's back a swift pat. He was rewarded with a low snarl. Don't you growl at me, puss, or I'll have your bleeding eyes out. And how will you catch mouses then, eh? You'll be a hungry, blind pussy cat. That's what you'll be. That's it. Lay you down now and rest your big head. See, doesn't hurt, does it? And the sergeant reached out and, with remarkable tenderness, scratched the big cat's flank. And to Sharp's wonder, the huge beast settled itself comfortably against the bars of the sergeant's cell. You're awake, aren't you, Sharpy? Hakes will call softly as he scratched the tiger. I know you are. I can tell. So what happened to little Mary Bickerstaff, eh? You gonna tell me, boy? Some heathen darky got his filthy hands on her, has he? She'd have done better lifting her skirts to me. Instead, she's being rogered by some blackie, ain't she? Is that what happened? Still now, still. He soothed the tiger. Sharp pretended to be asleep, but Hakeswell must have sensed his attention. Officer's pet, Sharpie. Is that what you are? Learning to read so you can be like them. Is that what you want? It won't do you no good, boy. There's only two sorts of officers in this army, and the one sort's good and the other sort ain't. The good sort knows better than to get their hands dirty with you, rankers. They leave it all to the sergeants. The bad sort interfere. That young Mister Fitzgerald, he was an interferer, but he's gone to hell now, and hell's the best place for him. Seeing as how he was an upstart Irishman with no respect for sergeants, and your Mister Lawford, he ain't no good either, no good at all. Hakeswell suddenly quietened as Colonel McCandless groaned. The Colonel's fever was growing worse, though he tried hard not to complain. Sharp, abandoning his pretense of sleep, carried the water bucket to him. Drink, sir. That's kind of you, Sharp. Kind. The colonel drank, then propped his back against the stone wall at the back of the cell. We had a rainstorm last month, he said. Not a severe one, but these cells were flooded all the same, and not all of the flooding was rain. A good deal was sewage. I pray God gets us out of here before the monsoon. No chance of us still being here, then, is there, sir? It depends, Sharp, whether we take the city or not. We will, sir, Sharp said. Maybe. The colonel smiled at Sharp's serene confidence, but the tipu might decide to kill us first. McCandless fell silent for a while, then shook his head. I wish I understood the tipu. Nothing to understand, sir. He's just an evil bastard, sir. No, he's not that. The colonel said severely, "He's actually rather a good ruler, better, I suspect, than most of our Christian monarchs. He's certainly been good for my sir. He's fetched it a deal of wealth, given it more justice than most countries enjoy in India, and he's been tolerant to most religions. Though I fear he did persecute some unfortunate Christians." The colonel grimaced as a shudder racked his body. He's even kept the rajah and his family alive, not in comfort but alive, and that's more than most monarchs would ever do. Most usurpers kill their country's old ruler, but not here. I can't forgive him for what he did to those poor prisoners of ours, of course, but I suppose some capricious cruelty is probably necessary in a ruler. All in all, I think, and judging him by the standards of our own monarchy, we should have to give the Tipu fairly high marks. So why the hell are we fighting him, sir? McCandless smiled. Because we want to be here, and he doesn't want us to be here. Two dogs in a small cage, Sharp. And if he beats us out of my sword, he'll bring in the French to chase us out of the rest of India, and then we can bid farewell to the best part of our eastern trade. That's what it's about, Sharp. Trade. That's why you're fighting here. Trade. Sharp grimaced. 
Seems a funny thing to be fighting about, sir. Does it? McCandless seemed surprised. Not to me, Sharp. Without trade, there's no wealth, and without wealth, there's no society worth having. Without trade, Private Sharp, we'd be nothing but beasts in the mud. Trade is indeed worth fighting for, though the good Lord knows we don't appreciate trade much. We celebrate kings, we honor great men, we admire aristocrats, we applaud actors, we shower gold on portrait painters, and we even sometimes reward soldiers. But we always despise merchants. But why? It's the merchant's wealth that drives the mills sharp. It moves the looms. It keeps the hammers falling. It fills the fleets. It makes the roads. It forges the iron. It grows the wheat. It bakes the bread, and it builds the churches and the cottages and the palaces. Without God and trade, we would be nothing. Sharp laughed softly. Trade never did out for me, sir. Did it not? McCandless asked gently. The colonel smiled. So what do you think is worth fighting for, Private? Friend, sir, and pride. We have to show that we're better bastards than the other side. You don't fight for a king or a country. I've never met the king, sir. Never even seen him. He's not much to look at, but he's a decent enough man when he's not mad. McCandless stared across at Hakeswill. Is he mad? I think so, sir. Poor soul. He's evil too," Sharp said, speaking too softly for Hakeswell to hear him. "Takes a joy, sir, in having men punished. He thieves, he lies, he rapes, he murders. And you've done none of those things. Never raped, sir. And as for the others, only when I had to. Then I pray God you'll never have to again," McCandless said fervently. And with that, he leaned his grey head against the wall and tried to sleep. Sharp watched the dawn light seep into the dungeon pit. The last bats of the night wheeled in the patch of sky above, but soon they were gone, and the first gun of the day spoke. It was clearing its throat, so the gunners like to say, for the city and its besiegers were waking, and the fight would go on. The opening shot of the day was aimed at the low mud wall that plugged the gap in the glacis and kept the water dammed in the ditch behind. The wall was thick, and the shot, which fell low and so lost much of its force as it ricocheted up from the river bank, did little more than shiver dust from the wall's crevices. One by one, the other siege guns woke and had their throats blasted clear. The first few shots were often lackadaisical, as the gun barrels were still cool, and thus caused the balls to fly low. A handful of guns answered the fire from the city walls, but none of them was large. The tipper was hiding his big guns for the assault, but he permitted his gunners to mount and fire their small cannon, some of which discharged a ball no bigger than a grape shot. The defenders' fire did no damage. But even the sound of their guns gave the citizens a feeling that they were fighting back. This morning, the British guns seemed erratic. Every battery was at work, but their fire was uncoordinated. Some aimed at the wall and the glacis, while others targeted the higher ramparts. But an hour after dawn, they all fell silent, and a moment later, the Tipu's gunners also ceased firing. Colonel Goodin, staring through a spy glass from the western ramparts. Distinctly saw the sepoy gunners in one breaching battery, heaving at the trail of their piece. Goudin reckoned that the big guns were at last being carefully aligned on the section of wall that had been chosen for the breach. The guns were hot now; they would fire true, and soon they would concentrate a dreadful intensity of iron against the chosen spot in the city's defences. With his spyglass, he could see men straining at the gun. But he could not see the gun itself, for the embrasure had been momentarily stopped up with wicker baskets filled with earth. Goudin prayed that the British would take the Tipu's bait, and aim their pieces at the weakest section of the wall. He trained his glass on the nearest battery, which was scarce four hundred yards from the vulnerable section of wall. The gunners were stripped to the waist, and no wonder, for the temperature would soon be well over ninety degrees, and the humidity was already stifling. And these men had to handle enormous weights of gun and shot. An eighteen-pounder siege gun, 
weighed close to twelve tons, and all that mass of hot metal was hurled back with each shot, and the gun then had to be manhandled back into its firing position. The shot of such a gun measured a little over five inches across, and each gun could fire perhaps one such ball every two minutes. And the Tipu's spies had reported that General Harris now had thirty-seven of these heavy guns, and two more cannon, even heavier, that each fired a twenty-four-pound missile. Goudin, waiting for the gunfire to start again, made a simple computation in his head: each minute, he reckoned, about three hundred and fifty pounds of iron, travelling at unimaginably high velocities, would hammer into the city wall, and to that hefty weight of metal. The British could add a score of howitzers and several dozen twelve-pounders, that would be used to bombard the walls either side of the place General Harris had chosen to make his breach. Goudin knew that the serious business of making the breach was about to begin, and he almost held his breath as he waited for the first shot, for that opening gun would tell him whether or not the Tipu's gamble had succeeded. The waiting seemed to stretch forever. But at last, one of the batteries unmasked a gun, and the great brute belched a jet of smoke fifty yards in front of its embrasure. The sound came a half second later, but Goudin had already seen the shot fall. The British had swallowed the bait; they were coming straight for the trap. The rest of the breaching guns now opened fire. For a moment, a rumbling thunder filled the sky that was flapping with the wings of startled birds. The shots seared over the dry land, across the river, and slammed into the brief curtain wall that joined the section of Glassy. The wall lasted less than ten minutes before an eighteen-pounder shot pierced through it, and suddenly the water of the inner ditch was gushing out into the South Corvary. For a few seconds, the water was a clear, thin spurt, arcing out to the river. Then the force of the flow abraded the remaining mud, and the wall collapsed. So that a murky flood washed irresistibly down the river bank. The guns scarcely paused; only now they raised their aim very slightly, so that the balls could strike against the base of the outer rampart, which had been completely unmasked by the collapse of the glassy's brief connecting wall. Shot after shot slammed home, their impacts reverberating down the whole length of the ancient battlements, and each shot punched out a handful of mud bricks. The water from the punctured ditch kept flowing out, and the shots kept slamming home as the gunners sweated and hauled and spiked and sponged out and rammed and fired again. All day long they fired, and all day long the old wall crumbled. The shots were kept low, aimed to strike at the foot of the wall so that the bricks above would collapse to make a ramp of rubble that would lead up and through the gap that the guns were making. By nightfall, the wall still stood, but at its base there was a crumbling, dusty cavern that had been carved deep into the rampart. A few British guns fired in the night, mostly scattering canister or grape shot in an attempt to stop the Tipu's men from repairing the cavern. But in the dark, it was difficult to keep the guns aimed true, and most of the shots went wild. And in the morning, the British gunners pointed their telescopes. And saw that the cavern had been plugged with earth-filled wicker gabions and balks of timber. The first few shots made short shrift of those repairs, scattering the timber and soil in huge gouts as the balls bit home. And once the cavern was re-exposed, the gunners went to work on it. The land between the aqueduct and the river became shrouded with a mist of powder smoke as the artillery poured in their fire. Until at midday, a cheer from the British lines marked the wall's collapse. It crumpled slowly, jetting a cloud of dust into the air—a cloud so thick that at first no man could see the extent of the damage. But as the small wind cleared the smoke away from the guns and the dust from the wall, they could see that a breach had been made. The lime-washed wall now had a gap twenty yards wide, and the gap was filled with a mound of rubble. Up which a man could climb, so long as he was unencumbered by anything other than a musket, a bayonet, and his cartridge box. That made the breach practicable. Yet still, the guns fired. Now the gunners were trying to flatten the slope of the breach, and some of their shots ricocheted up to the inner wall. And for a time, Goudin feared that the British were planning to blast a passage clean through that new inner rampart. 
But then the gunners lowered their aim to keep their balls hammering at the newly made breach, or else to gnaw at the shoulders of the outer wall's gap. A half mile away from Gudan, in the British lines, General Harris and General Baird stared at the breach through their telescopes. Now, for the first time, they could inspect a short stretch of the new inner wall. It isn't as high as I feared, Harris commented. Let's pray it's unfinished, Baird growled. But I still think it's better to ignore it, Harris decreed. Capture the outer wall first. Baird turned to stare at some clouds that lay heavy and low on the western horizon. He feared the clouds presaged rain. We could go tonight, sir," he suggested. Baird was remembering the forty-four months he had endured in the Tipu's dungeons. Some of them spent chained to the wall of his cell, and he wanted revenge. He was also eager to get the bloody business of storming the city done. Harris collapsed his glass. Tomorrow," he said firmly, and scratched beneath the edge of his wig. We risk more by rushing things. We'll do it properly, and we'll do it tomorrow. That night, a handful of British officers crept out from the leading trenches with small white cotton flags attached to bamboo poles. The sky was laced with a tracery of thin clouds that intermittently hid the waning moon, and in the cloud shadows, the officers explored the South Corvary to find the river's treacherous deep pools. They marked the shallows with their flags, and so pointed the path toward the breach. And all through that night, the assault troops filed down the long trenches. Harris was determined that his assault would be overwhelming. He would not tickle the city, he told Baird, but swamp it with men. And so Baird would lead two columns of troops, half of them British and half sepoys. But nearly all of them prime men from the army's elite flanking companies. The six thousand attackers would either be grenadiers, who were the biggest and strongest men, or else from the light companies, who were the quickest and cleverest soldiers. And those picked men would be accompanied by a detachment of Hyderabad's finest warriors. The attackers would also be accompanied by engineers carrying fascines to fill in any ditches that the defenders might have dug on the breach's summit. And bamboo ladders to scale the edges of the breach. Volunteer gunners would follow the leading troops up onto the ramparts, and there turn the Tipu's own cannon against the defenders on the inner wall. Two forlorn hopes would go ahead of the columns, each hope composed solely of volunteers, and each led by a sergeant who would be made an officer if he survived. Both the forlorn hopes would carry the British colours into the breach. And those colour bearers would be the very first men to climb into the enemy's guns. Once on the breach, the forlorn hopes were ordered not to go on into the space between the walls, but to climb the broken stumps of the shoulders either side of the breach's ramp, and from there lead the fight north and south, around the whole ring of Seringapatam's ramparts. God knows, Harris said that night at supper. But I can think of nothing left undone. Can you, Baird? No, sir, I can't. Baird said, "Upon my soul, I can't." He was trying to sound cheerful, but it was still a subdued meal, though Harris had done his best to make it festive. His table was spread with a linen cloth and was lit by fine spermaceti candles that burned with a pure white light. The general's cooks had killed their last chickens to provide a change from the usual half ration of beef, but none of the officers around the table had much appetite. Nor it seemed any enthusiasm for conversation. Mayor Alum, the commander of the Hyderabad army, did his best to encourage his allies, but only Wellesley seemed capable of responding to his remarks. Colonel Ghent, who, as well as being Harris's chief engineer, had taken on himself the collation of what intelligence came out of the city, poured himself some wine. It was rancid stuff. Soured by its long journey from Europe and by the heat of India, there's a rumor," he said heavily, when a break in the desultory conversation had stretched for too long, "that the heathen bastards have planted a mine. There are always such rumors," Baird said curtly. "A bit late to tell us, surely," Harris remonstrated mildly. "Only heard of it today, sir," Kent said defensively. 
One of their cavalry fellows deserted. He could be making up tales. Of course, these people do. Maybe the Tipu sent him. Wants to scare us into delay. I dare say. He fell silent, toying with a blue glass salt cellar. The salt was crusted from the humidity, and he attacked it with a small silver spoon, crumbling it as the city wall had crumbled under the onslaught of the guns. But the fellow seemed sure of himself. He said after a while. Says it's a big mine. Baird grimaced. So the bastards will blow it when the forlorn hopes attack. That's why we have forlorn hopes to die. He'd not meant to sound so callous, but he had wanted to silence the engineer. Somewhere in the far distance, there was a grumble of thunder. Everyone around the table waited for the patter of rain on the tent's canvas, but no such sound came. My worry, Gent said, apparently unmoved by Baird's brusqueness, is that they'll blow their mine once we're on the ramparts, and if it's a big enough brute, it'll clear our fellows clean off the walls. He thrust the spoon hard down into the salt, clean off. Then let us hope the rumours are untrue. Harris said firmly, squashing the engineer's pessimism. Colonel Wellesley, can I persuade you to another glass? Wellesley shook his head. I've drunk enough, sir. Thank you. But then the young colonel looked down the table to where his rival Baird was sitting. Though maybe, sir, I should accept a glass and drink to your success and renown. Baird, whose distaste for the young colonel had only increased over the last few days, managed to look pleased. Obliged to you, Wellesley. He forced himself to be courteous. Greatly obliged to you. Harris was grateful for Wellesley's generosity. He disliked having his deputies at odds, especially as Harris had decided that it should be Wellesley, the younger and more junior man, who should be made governor of Mysore if the city fell. Baird would undoubtedly be displeased, for the Scotsman would regard the appointment as a slight. Yet, in truth, Baird's hatred of all things Indian disqualified him from such a post. Britain needed a friendly Mysore, and Wellesley was a tactful man who harboured no prejudice against natives. Good of you, Wellesley," Harris said when the toast had been drunk. "Very good of you, I'm sure." This time tomorrow, Mayor Alum said in his odd English accent, "We shall all dine in the Tipu's palace, drink from his silver, and eat from his gold." I pray that we do," Harris said. And I pray we manage it without grievous loss. He scratched his old wound beneath his wig. The officers were still sombre when the meal ended. Harris bade them a good night, then stood for a while outside his tent, staring at the moon-glossed walls of the distant city. The lime-washed ramparts seemed to glow white, beckoning him. But to what? He went to his bed where he slept badly. And in his waking moments, found himself rehearsing excuses for failure. Baird also stayed awake for a while, but drank a good measure of whisky, and afterward, in full uniform and with his big claymore propped beside his cot, he slipped in and out of a restless sleep. Wellesley slept well. The men crammed in the trenches hardly slept at all. Bugles greeted the dawn. The storm clouds had thickened in the west, but there was no rain. And the rising sun soon burned the small wispy clouds from above the city. The assaulting troops crouched in the trenches, where they could not be seen from Seringapatam's walls. The small white flags fluttered in the river. The siege guns kept firing, some attempting to open the breach wider, but most just trying to discourage the defenders from making any attempt to repair the breach, or place obstacles on its forward slope. The undamaged ramparts gleamed white in the sun, while the breach appeared as a red-brown scar in the long city wall. The Tipu had spent the night in a small sentry shelter on the north walls. He woke early, for he expected an attack at dawn, and he had ordered that all his soldiers should be ready on the walls. But no assault came, and as the sun climbed higher, he allowed some of the defenders back to their barracks to rest. While he himself went to the inner palace, he sensed a nervous expectancy in the crowded streets, 
and he himself was a troubled man, for during his restless night he had dreamed of monkeys. And monkeys were ever a bad omen. And the Tipu's mood was not helped when his diviners reported that the oil in their pots had been clouded. Today, it seemed, was an inauspicious day. But luck, as the Tipu knew, was malleable, and he attempted to change the day's ill-starred beginning by giving gifts. He summoned a Hindu priest and presented the man with an elephant, a sack of oil seed, and a purse of gold. To the Brahmins who accompanied the priest, he gave a bullock, a nanny goat, two buffalo, a black hat, a black coat, and one of his precious pots of divining oil. Then he washed his hands and donned a cloth-padded war helmet that had been dipped in a sacred fountain to make its wearer invulnerable. On his right arm, his sword arm, he wore a silver amulet inscribed with verses from the Koran. A servant pinned the great red ruby onto the helmet's plume. The tipu slung the gold-hilted sword at his waist, then went back to the western walls. Nothing had changed. Beyond the gently flowing South Corvary, the sun baked the ground where the British guns still fired. Their massive round shots churned up the rubble ramp. But no redcoats stirred from their trenches, and the only signs that an assault might be imminent were the small pennants stuck in the riverbed. They want another day to widen the breach, an officer opined. Colonel Goudin shook his head. They'll come today, he insisted. The tipu grunted. He was standing just north of the breach from where he watched the enemy trenches through a spyglass. Some of the British round shots struck dangerously close to where he stood and his aides tried to persuade him to move to a safer place. But even when a stone shard thrown up by a cannonball flicked at his white linen tunic, he would not move. They would have come at dawn. He finally said, if they were coming today. They want us to think that, Goudin protested, to lull us, but they will come today. They won't give us another night to make preparations. And why plant the flags? He pointed at the river. The tipu stepped back from the remains of the parapet. Was his luck changed? He had given gifts to the enemies of his god in the hope that his god would then reward him with victory. But he still felt an unease. He would much have preferred that the storming should be delayed another day, so that another set of auspices could be taken. But perhaps Allah willed it otherwise, and nothing would be lost by assuming that the attack would come this day. Assume they will come this afternoon, he ordered. Every man back to the walls. The walls, already thick with troops, now became crowded with defenders. One company of Muslims had volunteered to face the first enemy who came into the breach, and those brave men, armed with swords, pistols and muskets, crouched just inside the breach, but hidden from the enemy's guns by the mound of rubble. Those volunteers would almost certainly die, if not at the hands of the attackers, then when the great mine blew. But each man had been assured of his place in paradise, and so they went gladly to their deaths. Rockets were piled on the ramparts, and guns that had stayed hidden from the bombardment were manhandled into position to take the attackers in the flanks. Others of the Tipu's finest troops were posted on the outer wall, above the edges of the breach. Their job was to defend the shoulders of the breach, for the Tipu was determined to funnel the attackers into the space between the walls, where his mind could destroy them. Let the British come, the Tipu prayed, but let them be shepherded across the breach and into the killing ground. The Tipu had decided to lead the fight on the wall north of the breach. Colonel Goudin's battalion would fight south of the breach, but Gouda himself had responsibility for blowing the great mine. It was ready now, a hoard of powder, crammed into the old gate passage and shored up by stones and timber, so that the blast of the explosion would be forced northward between the walls. Gouda would watch the killing space from his place on the inner rampart, then signal to Sergeant Rotier to light the fuse. Rotier and the fuse were guarded by two of Gouda's steadiest men, and by six of the Tipu's jetties. 
The tipu assured himself that all had been done that could be done. The city was ready, and in honour of the slaughter of infidels, the tipu had arrayed himself in jewels, then consigned his soul and his kingdom into Allah's keeping. Now he could only wait, as the late morning sun climbed higher and yet higher, to become a burning whiteness in the Indian sky, where the vultures circled on their wide, ragged wings. The British guns fired on. In the mosque, some men prayed, but all of them were old men, for any man young enough to fight was waiting on the walls. The Hindus prayed to their gods, while the women of the city made themselves ragged and dirty, so that, should the city fall, they would not attract the enemy's attention. Midday came. The city baked in the heat. It seemed strangely silent. For the fire of the siege guns was desultory now. The sound of each shot echoed dully from the walls, and each strike would start a trickle of stone and a small cloud of dust, and afterward there would be silence again. On the walls, a horde of men crouched behind their fire steps, while in the trenches across the river, an opposing horde waited for the order that would send them against an expectant city. The tipu had a prayer mat brought to the walls, and there, facing toward the enemy, he knelt and bowed in prayer. He prayed that Colonel Goudin was wrong, and that his enemies would give him one more day. And then, as in a waking dream, a message came to him. He had given gifts, and gifts of charity were blessed, but he'd not made sacrifice. He'd been saving his sacrifice for the celebration of victory. But perhaps victory would not come unless he made his offerings now. Luck was malleable, and death was a great changer of fortune. He made a last obeisance, touching his forehead to the mat's weave, then climbed to his feet. Send for three jetties, he ordered an aide, and tell them to bring me the British prisoners. All of them, Your Majesty? The aide asked. Not the sergeant. The tipu said, "Not the one who twitches. The others, tell the jetties to bring them here." For his victory needed one last sacrifice of blood before the corvary was made dark with it. Chapter Ten. Aparau was an able man; otherwise, he would not have been promoted to the command of one of the tipu's brigades. But he was also a discreet man. Discretion had kept Rao alive, and discretion had enabled him to preserve his loyalty to the unthroned Raja of the House of Wadiyar, while serving the Tipu. Now, ordered to take his men to the walls of Seringapatam and there fight to preserve the Muslim dynasty of the Tipu, Appa Rao at last questioned his discretion. He obeyed the Tipu, of course. And his cushions filed dutifully enough onto the city ramparts, but Appa Rao, standing beneath one of the sun banners above the Mysore Gate, asked himself what he wanted of this world. He possessed family, high rank, wealth, and ability, yet he still bowed his head to a foreign monarch, and some of the flags above his men's heads were inscribed in Arabic, to celebrate a god who was no god of Appa Rao's. His own monarch lived in poverty, ever under the threat of execution, and it was possible, more than possible, Rao allowed, that victory this day would raise the Tipu so high that he would no longer need the small advantage of the Raja's existence. The Raja was paraded like a doll on Hindu holy days, to placate the Tipu's Hindu subjects. But if Mysore had no enemies in southern India. Why should the Hindus of Mysore need to be placated? The Raja and all his family would be secretly strangled, and their corpses, like the bodies of the twelve murdered British prisoners, would be wrapped in reed mats and buried in an unmarked grave. But if the Tipu lost, then the British would rule in Mysore. True, if they kept their word, the Raja would be restored to his palace and to his ancient throne. But the power of the palace would still rest with the British advisers, and the Raja's treasury would be required to pay for the upkeep of British troops. But if the Tipu won, Appa Rao thought, then the French would come. And what evidence was there that the French were any better than the British? 
He stood above the southern gate, waiting for an unseen enemy to erupt from their trenches and assault the city, and he felt like a man buffeted between two implacable forces. If he had been less discreet, he might have considered rebelling openly against the Tipu and ordering his troops to help the invading British. But such a risk was too great for a cautious man. Yet if the Tipu lost this day's battle, and if Appa Rao was perceived to be loyal to the defeated man, then what future did he have? Whichever side won, Appa Rao thought, he lost. But there was one small act that might yet snatch survival from defeat. He walked out to the end of a jutting cavalier, waved the gunners posted there away from their cannon, and beckoned Kunva Singh to his side. Where are your men? he asked Singh. At the house, Lord. Kunwa Singh was a soldier, but not in any of the Tipu's koshoons. His loyalty was to his kinsman, Appa Rao, and his duty was to protect Appa Rao and his family. Take six men, the general said, and make sure they are not dressed in my livery. Then go to the dungeons, find Colonel McCandless, and take him back to my house. He speaks our tongue, so gain his trust by reminding him that you came with me to the temple at Somanathapura, and tell him that I am trusting him to keep my family alive. The general had been staring southwards as he spoke, but he now turned to look into Kunva Singh's eyes. If the British do get into the city, then McCandless will protect our women. Appa Rao added this last assurance as though to justify the order he was giving, but Kunva Singh still hesitated. Singh was a loyal man, but that loyalty was being dangerously stretched, for he was being asked to rebel against the Tipu. He might need to kill the Tipu's men to free this enemy soldier, and Appa Rao understood his hesitation. Do this for me, Kunwar Singh, the general promised, and I shall restore your family's land. Lord, Kunwar Singh said, then stepped back, turned, and was gone. Appa Rao watched him go, then stared past the city's southwestern corner to where he could see a portion of the enemy trenches. It was past noon, and there were still no signs of life from the British lines, except for a desultory gunshot once in a while. If the Tipu won this day, Appa Rao thought, then his anger at McCandless's disappearance would be terrible, in which case, Appa Rao decided, McCandless must die before he could ever be discovered, and have the truth beaten out of him. But if the Tipu lost, then McCandless was Appa Rao's best guarantor of survival. And a Hindu living in a Muslim state was an expert at survival. Appa Rao, despite the risk he was running, knew he'd acted for the best. He drew his sword, kissed its blade for luck, then waited for the assault. It took only a minute for Kanwar Singh to reach the general's house. He ordered six of his best men to discard their tunics, which bore Appa Rao's badge, and to put on tiger-striped tunics instead. He changed his own coat, then borrowed a gold chain with a jeweled pendant from the general's treasure chest. Such a jewel was a sign of authority in the city, and Kunwa Singh reckoned he might need it. He armed himself with a pistol and a sword, then waited for his picked squad. Mary came to the courtyard and demanded to know what was happening. There was a strange stillness in the city, and the tempo of the British guns, which had been firing so hard and fast for days, was now muted, and the ominous silence had made Mary nervous. We think the British are coming, Kunwa Singh told her, then blurted out that she would be safe, for he'd been ordered to free the British colonel from the dungeons and bring him to the house where McCandless's presence would protect the women. If the British even get through the wall, he added dubiously, what about my brother? Mary asked. Kunva Singh shrugged. I have no orders for him. Then I shall come with you, Mary declared. You can't, Kunva Singh insisted. He was often shocked by Mary's defiance, though he also found it appealing. You can stop me, she said, by shooting me, or you can let me come. Make up your mind. She did not wait to hear his answer, but hurried to her quarters where she snatched up the pistol that Appa Rao had given her. Kunwa Singh made no further protest. He was confused by what was happening, and though he sensed that his master's loyalties were wavering, 
he still did not know which way they would ultimately fall. I can't let your brother come back here, he warned Mary when she came back to the courtyard. We can free him, Mary insisted, and after that he can look after himself. He's good at that. The streets of the city were oddly deserted. Most of the Tipu's soldiers were on the ramparts, and anyone who had no business in the coming battle had taken care to lock their doors and stay hidden. A few men still trundled handcarts of ammunition and rockets towards the walls, but there were no bullock carts and no open shops. A few sacred cows wandered the city with sublime unconcern, but otherwise it was like a place of ghosts. And it only took Kunwar Singh's small party five minutes to reach the complex of small courtyards that lay to the north of the inner palace. No one questioned Kunwar Singh's right to be in the palace precincts, for he wore the Tipu's uniform, and the jewels hanging about his neck were glittering proof of his authority. The difficulty Kunwar Singh had anticipated would lie in persuading the guards to unlock the gate of the dungeon's outer cage. Once that gate was open, the rest should be easy. For his men could swiftly overwhelm the guards and so find the key to McCandless's cell. Kunwar Singh had decided that his best course was simply to pretend to an authority he did not have, and claimed bearer summons from the Tipu himself. Arrogance went far in Mysore, and he would give it a try. Otherwise, he must order his men to use their muskets to blast the cage doors down, and he feared that such a commotion would bring guards running from the nearby inner palace. But when he reached the cells, he found there were no guards. The space within the outer cage and around the stone steps was empty. A soldier on the inner wall above the cells saw the small group standing uncertainly beside the dungeon gate, and assumed they'd come to fetch the guards. They've already gone. The man shouted down, "Ordered to the walls, gone to kill some Englishmen." Kunwar Singh acknowledged the man, then rattled the gate, vainly hoping that the padlock would fall off. You don't want to go inside," the helpful man called down. "The tiger's on duty." Kunwar Singh instinctively stepped back. The soldier above him lost interest and went back to his post. As Kunwar Singh stepped back to the gate and tugged a second time at the huge padlock, "Too big to shoot open," he said. "That lock will take five or six bullets at least." "We can't get inside," Mary asked. "No, not without attracting the guards." He gestured toward the palace. The thought of the tiger had made him nervous, and he was wondering whether he would do better to wait until the assault started and then, under the cover of its huge noise, try to shoot the padlock away from the gate, then kill the tiger, or else just give up the errand. The courtyard stank of sewage, and the smell only reinforced Kunwar Singh's presentiments of failure. Then Mary stepped to the bars, Richard. She called Richard. There was a momentary pause. Lass, the answer came at last. Kunwar Singh's nervousness increased. There were a dozen soldiers on the inner wall immediately above him, and a score of other people were peering through windows or above stable doors. No one was yet taking a suspicious interest in his party, but it seemed likely that someone of true authority would soon pass by the dungeons. We should leave. He hissed to Mary. We can't get inside," Mary called to Sharp. "Have you got a gun, lass?" Sharp called back. Mary could not see him, for the outer cage was far enough back from the dungeon steps to hide the cells. "Yes, chuck it down here, lass. Chuck it as close to the bottom of the steps as you can. Make sure the bugger's not cocked." Kunwar Singh rattled the gate again. The sound of the clangorous iron prompted a growl from the pit, and a moment later the tiger loped up the steps. Stared blank-eyed at Kunwar Singh, then turned and went back to the remnants of a half carcass of goat. We can't wait, Kunwar Singh insisted to Mary. Throw us a gun, love! Sharp shouted. Mary groped inside the folds of her sari to find the ivory inlaid pistol that Appa Rao had given to her. She pushed it through the bars and then, very nervously, she tried to gauge how much effort would be needed to toss the gun into the pit. But not too far from the bottom of the steps, Kunwar Singh hissed at her, but made no move to stop her. Here, Richard, she called, and she tossed the gun under arm. It was a clumsy throw, and the pistol fell short of the steps. 
but its momentum carried it over the edge, and Mary heard the gun clattering down the stone stairs. Sharp cursed for the pistol had lodged three steps up. Have you got another one? He shouted. Give me your pistol, Mary said to Kunrasing. No, we can't get in. Kunrasing was close to panic now, and his six men had been infected by his fear. We can't help them, he insisted. Mary, Sharp called. I'm sorry, Richard. Not to worry, lass, Sharp said, staring at the pistol. He did not doubt he could pick the lock open, but could he reach the gun before the tiger reached him? And even if he did, would one small pistol ball stop eight feet of hungry tiger? Jesus Christ! He swore. Sharp, McCandless chided him. I was praying, sir, because this is a right booger up, sir, a right booger up. Sharp took out the pick lock, and unfolded one of the shafts. He put his hands through the bars and grabbed hold of the padlock, then explored the big keyhole with the hooked shaft. It was a crude lock that ought to be easy to open. But the mechanism was not properly oiled, and Sharp feared that the pick lock might snap rather than move the levers aside. Lawford and McCandless watched him, while from across the corridor Hakeswill stared with huge blue eyes. "Go on, good boy, good boy," Hakeswill said. "Get us out of here, boy. Shut your ugly face, Obadiah," Sharp muttered. He had moved one lever. Now only the second remained. But it was much stiffer than the first. Sweat was pouring down Sharp's face. He was working half blind, unable to pull the padlock to an angle where he could see the keyhole. The tiger had paused in its eating to watch him, intrigued by the hands protruding through the bars. Sharp maneuvered the picklock, felt the hook lodge against the lever, and gently pressed. He pressed harder, and suddenly the hook scraped off the lever's edge, and Sharp swore. And just as he swore, the tiger twisted and sprang. It attacked with appalling speed. A sudden unleashing of coiled muscles that ended with a swipe of one unsheathed paw, as it tried to hook a claw into the protruding hands. Sharp recoiled, dropping the picklock, and cursing as the tiger's slash missed him by inches. Bastard! He swore at the beast. Then he stooped and reached through the bars for the fallen picklock that lay a foot away. He moved fast, but the tiger was faster. And、this time, Sharp got a deep scratch on the back of his hand. Sergeant Hakeswill, Sharp hissed, "Get the beast over on your side." Nothing I can do, Hakeswill protested, his face twitching. The tiger was watching Sharp. It was only two feet away from him. Its teeth were bared and its claws unsheathed, and there was a glint in its yellow eyes. You want to fight a tiger, Sharpy? Hakeswill said, "That's your business, not mine. Man doesn't have to fight pussy cats. Says so in the scriptures." You say that one more time, McCandless roared in sudden and unexpected fury, "and I'll make sure you never wear stripes again. Do you understand me, man?" Hakeswill was taken aback by the Colonel's anger. "Sir," he said weakly. "So do as Private Sharp says," Colonel McCandless ordered, "and do it now." Hakeswill beat his hands against the bars. The tiger turned its head, and Sharp immediately snatched the picklock back into the cell and stood again. The tiger leapt at Hakeswill, shaking the bars of his cell with its violence, and Hakeswill backed hurriedly away. "Keep provoking it, man!" McCandless ordered Hakeswill, and the sergeant spat at the tiger, then threw a handful of straw towards its face. Sharp worked on the lock. He had the hook against the lever again. The tiger, roused to a petulant fury, stood with its paws against the bars of Hakeswill's cell, as Sharp pressed on the lever and at last felt it move. His hands trembled, and the hook grated as it slipped across the lever's face. But he steadied himself and pressed harder. He was holding his breath, willing the lever to unlatch. Sweat stung his eyes. Then suddenly the lever clicked across, and the lock sprang open in his hands. That was the easy part, he said grimly. He folded the picklock and put it back in his pocket. Mary, he called. There was no answer. Mary, he shouted again, but still there was no reply. Kunvar Singh had pulled his men away from the cells and was now in a deep gateway on the courtyard's far side, trapped between his wish to obey Aparau and the apparent impossibility of that obedience. What do you need her for? 
Colonel McCandless asked. I don't even know if the bloody gun's loaded, sir. I never asked her. Assume it is, McCandless said. Easy for you, sir, Sharp said respectfully, being as you ain't the one who's got to go out and kill the beast. I'll do it, Lawford offered. Sharp grinned. It's either you or me, sir, he said. I'm being honest, sir. Who do you think will do the best job? You, Lawford admitted, which is what I reckon, sir. But one thing, sir, how do you shoot a tiger? In the head? Between the eyes, McCandless said, but not too high up, just below the eyes. Bloody hell, Sharp said. He'd eased the padlock out of its hasp, and he could now move the door outwards, though he did it gingerly, unwilling to attract the tiger's attention. He pulled the door shut again and stooped for his red jacket that lay on the straw. Let's hope the buggers are stupid, pussycat, he said. Then he gently pushed the door open again. The hinges squealed alarmingly. He had the door in his left hand, and his red coat was bundled in his right. When the door was open afoot, he tossed the coat as hard as he could toward the remains of the goat at the corridor's farther end. The tiger saw the motion, twisted away from Hexwell's cage, and sprang toward the coat. The red jacket had flown the best part of twenty feet, and the tiger covered the distance in one powerful leap. It batted the coat with its claws, then batted it again, but found no flesh and blood inside the cloth. Sharp had slipped through the door, turned to the steps, and snatched up the pistol. He turned back, hoping to regain the safety of the cell before the tiger noticed him. But his foot slipped on the lowest step, and he fell backward against the stone stairs. The tiger heard him, turned, and went still. The yellow eyes stared at Sharp. Sharp gazed back, then slowly thumbed the cock of the pistol. The tiger heard the click, and its tail lashed once. The merciless eyes watched Sharp. Then very slowly the tiger crouched. Its tail swung back and forth once more. Don't shoot now, McCandless called softly. Get close. Yes, sir, Sharp said. He kept his eyes on the tiger's eyes as he slowly, slowly climbed to his feet and edged toward the beast. The fear was like a mad, wild thing inside him. Hakewell was spitting encouragement, but Sharp heard nothing, and he saw nothing but the tiger's eyes. He wondered if he should attempt to duck back into the cell, but guessed that the tiger would spring while he was still trying to open the door. Better to face the beast and shoot it in the open pit, he decided. He held the pistol at arm's length, keeping the muzzle aimed at a patch of black fur just beneath the animal's eyes. Fifteen feet away, twelve. His boots grated on the stone floor. How accurate was the pistol? It was a pretty enough thing, all ivory and silver, but did it fire true? And how tightly was the ball sized to the barrel? Even a gap between barrel and ball, the width of a sheet of paper, was enough to throw a bullet wide as it spat out of the muzzle. Even at twelve feet, a pistol could miss a man-sized target, let alone a small patch of matted fur between a man-eating tiger's eyes. This book is continued on disc 10. Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell continued. Disc 10. Even a gap between barrel and ball, the width of a sheet of paper, was enough to throw a bullet wide as it spat out of the muzzle. Even at twelve feet, a pistol could miss a man-sized target, let alone a small patch of matted fur between a man-eating tiger's eyes. Kill the bugger, Sharpie! Eh? Hakeswell urged. Careful, man, McCandless hissed. Make sure of your shot. Careful now. Sharp edged forward. His eyes were still fixed on the tiger's eyes. He was willing the beast to stay still, to receive its death gracefully. Ten feet. The tiger was motionless, just watching him. Sweat stung Sharp's eyes, and the weight of the pistol was making his hand tremble. Do it now, he thought. Do it now. Pull the trigger, put the bugger down, and run like shit. He blinked, his eyes stinging with the sweat. The tiger did not even blink. Eight feet. He could smell the beast, see its unsheathed claws on the stone, see the glint in its eyes. Seven feet. Close enough, he reckoned, and he straightened his arm to line up the pistol's rudimentary sights. And the tiger sprang. It came from the ground so fast that it was almost on top of Sharp before he even realized that the beast had moved. He had a wild glimpse of huge claws stretched far out of their pads and of feral yellow teeth and a snarling mouth, and he was unaware that he called aloud in panic. He was unaware, too, that he'd pulled the trigger, not smoothly as he'd planned, but in a desperate, panicked jerk. Then instinctively he dropped to the ground and curled tight so that the tiger's leap would pass over him. Lawford gasped. 
The echo of the pistol shot was hugely loud in the confines of the dungeon pit, which suddenly reeked with the sulphurous smell of powder smoke. Hakeswell was crouching in a corner of his cell, scarce daring to look, while McCandless was mouthing a silent prayer. Sharp was on the ground, waiting for the agony of the claws to rip him apart. But the tiger was dying. The bullet had struck the back of the tiger's mouth. It was only a small bullet, but the force of it was sufficient to pierce through the throat's tissues and into the brain stem. Blood spattered the cell bars as the tiger's graceful leap slumped into death's collapse. It had fallen at the foot of the steps, but some terrible instinct of surging life still animated the beast, and it tried to stand. Its paws scrabbled against stone, and its head jerked up for a snarling second as the tail lashed. Then blood surged out of its mouth, the head fell back, and the beast went still. There was silence. The first flies came down to explore the blood spilling from the tiger's mouth. Oh, sweet suffering Christ, Sharp said, picking himself up. He was shaking. Jesus bloody wept. McCandless did not reprove him. The colonel knew a prayer when he heard one. Sharp fetched his torn jacket, pulled the cell door wide open, then gingerly sidled past the dead tiger as though he feared the beast might come back to life. McCandless and Lawford followed him up the stone stairs. What about me? Hakes will call. You can't leave me here. It ain't Christian. Leave him, McCandless ordered. I was planning on it, sir, Sharp said. He found his pick lock again and reached for the padlock on the outer gate. This log was much simpler, merely a crude one-lever mechanism, and it took only seconds to snap the ancient lock open. Where are we going? Lawford asked. To ground, man, McCandless said. The sudden freedom seemed to have lifted the colonel's fever. We must find somewhere to hide. Sharp pushed the gate outward, then saw Mary gazing at him from a doorway across the courtyard. And he smiled then saw she was not smiling back, but was instead looking terrified. There were men with her, and they too were unmoving with fear. Then Sharp saw why. Three jetties were crossing the courtyard toward the dungeon cage. Three monsters, three men with bare oil chests and muscles like tiger thews. One carried a coiled whip, while the other two were armed with hugely long spears, with which they had planned to subdue the tiger before opening the prisoner's cell. Sharp swore. He dropped his coat and picklock. Can you lock us in again? McCandless asked. Those boogers are strong enough to tear the padlocks clean away, sir. We have to kill the bastards. Sharp darted through the gate and ran to his right. The jetties followed him, but more slowly. They were not fast men, though their massive strength gave them an easy confidence as they spread out into a line to trap Sharp in a corner of the courtyard. Throw me a musket! Sharp called to Mary. Quick, lass, quick! Mary snatched a musket from one of Kunvar Singh's men, and before the astonished man could protest, she tossed it to Sharp. He caught it, held it at his waist, but did not cock the weapon. Then he advanced on the middle jetty. The man had seen that the musket was uncocked, and he smiled, anticipating an easy victory. Then slashed out his whip so that its coiled end wound round Sharp's throat. He tugged planning to pull Sharp off balance. But Sharp was already running toward him, cheating the whip's tension, and the jetty had never faced a man as quick as Sharp, nor as lethal. The jetty was still recovering from his surprise when the muzzle of the musket rammed into his Adam's apple with the force of a sledgehammer. He choked, his eyes widened, then Sharp kicked him in the crotch, and the huge man staggered and collapsed. One big, muscle-bound brute was down, gasping desperately for breath, but the long spears were turning toward Sharp, who, with the whip still trailing from his throat, turned fast to his right. He knocked the next jetty's spear aside with his musket barrel, then reversed the weapon and charged. The jetty abandoned his spear and reached for the musket, but Sharp checked his rush so that the big man's hands closed on nothing, and then Sharp swung the musket by its barrel so that its brass-bound butt slammed into the man's temple with the sound of an axe biting into soft wood. Two of the bastards were down. The soldiers on the inner ramparts battery were watching the fight, but not interfering. They were confused, for Kunwa Swing was standing right beside the fight and doing nothing, and his jewels made him appear a man of high authority. 
and so they followed his example and did not try to intervene. Some of the watching soldiers were even cheering, for though the jetties were admired, they were also resented because they received privileges far above any ordinary soldier's expectations. Lawford had moved to help Sharp, but his uncle held him back. Let him be, Willie, McCandless said quietly. He's doing the Lord's work, and I've rarely seen it done better. The third jetty lumbered at Sharp with his spear. He advanced warily, confused by the ease with which this foreign demon had downed his two companions. Sharp smiled at the third jetty, shouldered the musket, pulled back the cock, and fired. The bullet drummed into the jetty's chest, making all his huge muscles shudder with the force of its impact. The jetty slowed, then tried to charge again, but his knees gave way and he fell forward onto his face. He twitched, his hands scrabbled for an instant, then he was still. From the ramparts above, the soldiers cheered. Sharp uncoiled the whip from his neck, picked up one of the clumsy spears, and finished off the two jetties who still lived. One had been stunned, and the other was almost unable to breathe, and both now had their throats cut. From the windows of the low buildings around the courtyard, men and women stared at Sharp in shock. Don't just stand there! Sharp snarled at Lawford. Sir, he added hastily. Lawford and McCandless came through the gate while Kunvar Singh, as if released from a spell, suddenly hurried to meet them. Mary crossed to Sharp. Are you all right? Never batter, lass, he said. In truth, he was shaking as he picked up his red coat, and as Kunvar Singh's six men stared at him as though he was a devil come from nightmare. Sharp wiped sweat from his eyes. He was oblivious of most of what had just happened, for he'd fought as he'd always fought, fast and with a lethal skill. But it was instinct that led him, not reason, and the fight had left him with a seething hate. He wanted to slake that hate by killing more men, and perhaps Kunwar Singh's soldiers picked up that ferocity, for none of them dared move. Lawford crossed to Sharp. We think the assault is about to come, Sharp, the lieutenant said and Colonel McCandless is being taken to a place of safety. He's insisted that we go with him. The fellow in the jewels isn't happy about that, but McCandless won't go without us. And well done, by the way. Sharp glanced up into the lieutenant's eyes. I'm not going with him, sir. I'm going to fight. Sharp! Lawford reproved him. There's a bloody great mine, sir. Sharp raised his voice angrily. Just waiting to kill our lads. I ain't letting that happen. You can do what you bloody well like, but I'm going to kill some more of these bastards. You can come with me, sir, or stay with the colonel. I don't care. You, lad! This was to one of Kunwar Singh's uncomprehending soldiers. Give me some cartridges. Come on, hurry! Sharp crossed to the man, pulled open his pouch, and helped himself to a handful of cartridges that he shoved into a pocket. Kunwar Singh made no move to stop him. Indeed, everyone in the courtyard seemed to be stunned by the ferocity that had reduced three of the Tipu's prized jetties to dead meat. Though the officer commanding the troops on the inner wall did now call down to demand to know what was happening, Kunwar Singh shouted back that they were doing the Tipu's bidding. McCandless had overheard Sharp talking to Lawford. If I can help, Private, the colonel said. You're weak, sir, begging your pardon, sir, but Mr. Lawford will help me. Lawford said nothing for a moment, then nodded. Yes, of course I will. What will you do? McCandless asked. He spoke to Sharp, not Lawford. Blow the bloody mine, sir. Blow it to kingdom come. God bless you, Sharp, and keep you. Save your prayers for the bloody enemy, sir, Sharp said curtly. He rammed a bullet home, then plunged into an alleyway that led southward. He was loose in his enemy's rear. He was angry, and he was ready to give the bastards a taste of hell on earth. Major General Baird hauled a huge watch from his fob pocket, sprang open the lid, and stared at the hands. One o'clock. On the 4th of May, 1799. A Saturday. A drop of sweat landed on the watch crystal, and he carefully wiped it away with the tassel of his red sash. His mother had made the sash. "'You'll not let us down, young David,' she had said sternly, giving him the strip of tassel silk and then saying no more as he'd walked away to join the army. The sash was over twenty years old now, and it was frayed and threadbare, but Baird reckoned it would last him. He would take it back to Scotland one day. It would be good, he thought, to go home and see the new century. 
Maybe the 1800s would bring a different world, even a better one. But he doubted that the new era would manage to dispense with soldiers. Till time ended, Baird suspected there would be uses for a man and his sword. He took off his mildewed hat and wiped the sweat from his forehead with his sleeve. Almost time. He peered between two sandbags that formed the forward lip of the trench. The South Corvary rippled prettily between its flat boulders, the paths across its bed marked with the little white flags on their bamboo sticks. In a moment, he would launch men across those paths, then through the gap in the glacis and up that mound of stone, brick, mud, and dust. He counted eleven cannon balls stranded on the breach, looking for all the world like plums stuck in a pudding. Three hundred yards of ground to cover, one river to cross, and one plum pudding to climb. He could see men peering from between the city's battered crenellations. Flags flew there. The bastards would have guns mounted crosswise to the breach, and perhaps a mine buried in the rubble. God preserve the forlorn hopes, he thought. Though God was not usually merciful in such matters, if Colonel Ghent was right, and there was a massive mine waiting for the attackers. Then the forlorn hopes would be slaughtered, and then the main attack would have to assault the breach and climb its shoulders to where the enemy was massed on the outer ramparts. So be it. Too late to worry now. Baird pushed through the waiting men to find Sergeant Graham. Graham would lead one of the two forlorn hopes, and if he lived, would be Lieutenant Graham by nightfall. The sergeant was scooping a last ladle full of water from one of the barrels that had been placed in the trenches. To slake the thirst of the waiting men. Not long now, Sergeant," Baird said. "Whenever you say, sir." Graham poured the water over his bare head, then pulled on his shako. He would go into the breach with a musket in one hand and a British flag in the other. Whenever the guns give their farewell volley, Sergeant," Baird clicked open the watch again, and it seemed to him the hands had scarcely moved. In six minutes, I think, if this is accurate. He held the watch to his ear. That usually loses a minute or two every day. We're ready, sir," Graham said. "I'm sure you're ready," Baird said. "But wait for my order." "Of course, sir." Baird looked at the volunteers, a mix of British and sepoys. They grinned back at him. Rogues, he thought. Every last man, jack of them. But what splendid rogues, brave as lions! Baird felt a pang of sentimentality for these men. Even for the sepoys, like many soldiers, the Scotsman was an emotional man, and he instinctively disliked those men, like Colonel Wellesley, who seemed passionless. Passion, Baird reckoned, was what would take men across the river and up the breach. Damn scientific soldiering! Now, the science of siege warfare had opened the city, but only a screaming and insane passion would take men inside. God be with you all, boys. He said to the forlorn hope, and they grinned again. Like every man who had crossed the river today, none of them was encumbered with a pack. They'd all stripped off their stocks too. They carried weapons and cartridges and nothing else. And if they succeeded, they would be rewarded with General Harris's thanks and maybe a pittance of coins. Is there food in the city, sir? One of the volunteers asked. Plenty, boys, plenty. Baird, like the rest of the army, was on half rations. And some bibby, sir? Another man asked. Baird rolled his eyes. Running over with it, lads, and all of them just panting for you. The place is fair crammed with bibby, even enough for us old generals. They laughed. General Harris had given strict orders that the inhabitants were not to be molested, but Baird knew that the terrible savagery of an assault on a breach. Almost demanded that the men's appetites be satisfied afterward. He did not care, so far as Major General David Baird was concerned. The boys could play to their loins' content so long as they first won. He edged his way through the crush of men to a point midway between the two forlorn hopes. The watch still ticked, but again the minute hand seemed scarcely to have moved since he last looked at the face. Baird closed the lid, pushed the watch into his fob. Then peered again at the city. The undamaged parts of the wall glowed white in the sun. 
It was, with its towers and shining roofs and tall palms, a beautiful place. Yet it was there that Baird had spent close to four years as a prisoner of the Tipu. He hated the place as he hated its ruler. Revenge had been a long time coming, but it was here now. He drew his claymore, a brutal Scottish blade that had none of the finesse of more modern swords. Yet Baird, at six feet four inches tall, had little need of finesse. He would carry his butcher's blade into a breach of blood to pay back the tipu for forty-four months of hell. In the batteries behind Baird, the gunners blew on their linstocks to keep the fire burning. General Harris pulled out his watch. Colonel Arthur Wellesley, who would lead the second wave of attackers through the breach, adjusted his cravat and thought of his responsibilities. The bulk of his men were from the Regiment de Meron, a Swiss battalion that had once fought for the Dutch, but which had put itself under the command of the East India Company when the British had captured Ceylon. The men were mostly Swiss, but with a leavening from the German states, and they were a sober, steady battalion that Wellesley planned to lead to the inner palace to protect its contents and its harem from the ravages of the attackers. Seringapatam might fall and the Tipu might die, but the important thing was to gain Mysore's friendship, and Wellesley was determined to make certain that no unnecessary atrocities soured its citizens' new allegiance. He adjusted the silver gilt gorget about his neck, drew his sword an inch or two, then let it fall back into its scabbard, before momentarily closing his eyes to say a prayer beseeching God's protection on his men. The forlorn hopes, their muskets loaded and tipped with steel, crouched in the trenches. The officers' watches ticked on. The river ran gentle across its stones, and the silent city waited. Caught off, Sharp said to Lawford, instinctively lapsing back into the relationship that had existed between them when they had served in Goudin's battalion. No point in showing a red coat till we have to, Sharp explained, turning his own coat inside out. He did not put it back on, but knotted its sleeves about his neck so that the claw-torn jacket hung down against his scarred and naked back. The two men were crouched in a byre off the alley that led from the courtyard. Colonel McCandless had gone, led away to Apparao's house, and Sharp and Lawford were alone. "'I don't even have a gun,' the lieutenant said nervously. "'Soon remedy that,' Sharp said confidently. "'Come on now!' Sharp led, plunging into the intricate maze of small streets that surrounded the palace. A white man's face was not so unusual as to attract attention in Seringapatam, for there were plenty of Europeans serving the Tipu. But even so, Sharp did not fancy his chances in a red coat. He did not fancy his chances much at all, but he would be damned before he abandoned his fellow soldiers to the Tipu's mine. He hurried past a shuttered goldsmith shop and half-glimpsed, deep in its shadowed entrance, an armed man who was standing guard on the property. "'Stay here,' he told Lawford, then slung the musket on his shoulder and doubled back. He pushed a wandering cow out of his way and ducked into the goldsmith's entrance. "'How are you feeling today?' he said pleasantly to the man, who, speaking no English, just frowned in confusion. He was still frowning when Sharp's left fist buried itself in his belly. He grunted, but then the right fist smacked him on the bridge of his nose, and he was in no state to resist, as Sharp stripped him of musket and cartridge box. For good measure, Sharp gave the man a tap on the skull with the butt end of the musket, then went back to the street. One musket, sir, filthy as hell, but she'll fire. Cartridges, too. Lawford opened the musket's pan to check that it was loaded. Just what do you plan to do, Sharp? The lieutenant asked. Don't know, sir. Won't know till we get there. You going to the mine? Aye, sir. There'll be guards, like as not, and only two of us. I can count, sir, Sharp grinned. It's reading, I find, hard, but my letters are coming on, aren't they? Well, you're reading well, Lawford said. Probably the lieutenant thought as well as most seven-year-olds, but it had still been gratifying to see the pleasure Sharp took from the process. Even if his only reading matter was a crumpled page of the Revelation, full of mysterious beasts with wings that covered their eyes. I'll get you some more interesting books when we're out of here, Lawford promised. I'd like that, sir, Sharp said, then ran across the street junction. The fear of an imminent assault had served to empty the streets of their usual crowds, but the alleys were clogged with parked carts. 
Stray dogs barked as the two men hurried southward, but there were few people to remark their presence. "'There, sir, there's our bloody answer,' Sharp said. He had run from a street into a small square, and now jerked back into the shadows. Lawford peered about the corner to see that the small open space was filled with handcarts, and that the handcarts were piled with rockets. "'Waiting to take them up to the wall, I dare say,' Sharp said. "'Got so many up there already, they have to store the rest down here. "'What we do, sir, is to take one car, go down that next street, and have a private Guy Fawkes day.' "'The guards?' "'Of course there are. I mean on the rocket carts, Sharp.' "'They're nothing,' Sharp said scornfully. "'If those fellows were any good, they'd be up on the walls. "'Can't be nothing but maimed men and grandfathers. Rubbish. "'All we have to do is shout at the buggers. Are you ready?' Lawford looked into his companion's face. "'You're enjoying this, aren't you, Sharp?' "'I, sir. Aren't you?' "'I'm scared as hell,' Lawford admitted. Sharp smiled. "'You won't be when we're through, sir. We're going to be all right. You just behave as though you own the bloody place. You officers are supposed to be good at that, aren't you? So I'll grab a cart and you shout at the rubbish. Tell them good our sent us. Come on, sir. Time's wasting. Just walk out there as though we own the place.' Sharp brazenly walked into the sunlight, his musket slung on his shoulder, and Lawford followed him. "'You won't tell anyone that I confess to being scared?' the lieutenant asked. "'Of course not, sir. You think I'm not scared myself? Jesus, I almost fouled my breeches when that bloody tiger jumped at me. I've never seen a thing move so bloody fast, but I wasn't going to show I was scared in front of bloody eggs, Will. "'Hey, you! Are you in charge?' Sharp shouted imperiously at a man who squatted beside one of the carts. "'Move your bloody self! I'm on the cart!' The man sprang aside as Sharp jerked up the handles. There must have been fifty rockets in the cart, more than enough for Sharp's purpose. Two other men shouted protests at Sharp, but Lawford waved them down. "'Colonel Goudin sent us, understand?' Lawford said. "'Colonel Goudin, he sent us.' The lieutenant followed Sharp down the street leading south from the square. "'Those two men are coming after us,' he said nervously. "'Shout at the boogers, sir. You're an officer.' Back, Lawford shouted. To your duties, go on, now. Do as I say, damn your eyes, go. He paused, then gave a delighted chuckle. Good God, Sharp, it worked. Works with us, sir. Should work with them. Sharp said. He turned a corner and saw the towering sculptures of a big Hindu temple. He recognised where he was now, and he knew the alley leading to the mine was only a few yards away. It would be filled with guards, but Sharp now had a whole arsenal of his own. "'We can't do anything if there isn't an attack,' Lawford said. "'I know that, sir. So what do we do if there isn't an assault?' "'Hide, sir. Where, for God's sake?' "'Lally will take us in, sir. You remember Lally, don't you, sir?' Lawford blushed at the memory of his introduction to Sir Ingepatam's brothels. "'You really believe she'll hide us?' "'She thinks you're sweet, sir,' Sharp grinned. I've seen her a couple of times since that first night, sir. She always asks after you. I reckon you made a conquest there, sir. Good God, Sharp. You won't tell anyone. Me, sir? Sharp pretended to be shocked. Not a word, sir. Then very suddenly and far off, muffled by distance, so that it was thin and wavering, a trumpet sounded, and every gun in creation seemed to fire at once. Baird clambered up the trench wall, climbed over the sandbags, and turned to face his men. "'Now, my brave fellows!' he shouted in his broad Scottish accent, waving his sword toward the city. "'Follow me and prove yourselves worthy of the name British soldiers!' The forlorn hopes were already on their way. The moment Baird had climbed out of the trench, the seventy-six men of the two hopes had scrambled over the lip and begun running. They splashed through the little corvary, then sprinted toward the larger river. The air about them churned with noise. Every siege gun had fired at almost the same instant, and the breach was a boiling mass of dust, while the huge sound of the guns was echoing back from the walls. The banners of Britain streamed as the leading men ran into the South Corvary. The first bullets plucked at the water, throwing up small fountains, but the forlorn hopes did not notice the firing. They were screaming their challenge and racing each other to be first up the breach. Fire! the tipu shouted, and the walls of the city were rimmed with flame and smoke, as a thousand muskets poured lead down into the South Corvary and out toward the trenches. Rockets hissed off the walls, their trails twisting madly as they tangled in the hot air. 
The trumpet was still sounding. The musketry of the defenders was unending as men simply dropped their empty guns, snatched up loaded ones, and fired into the smoke cloud that edged the city. The sound of their guns was like a giant fire crackling. The river was foaming with bullets, and a handful of redcoats and sepoys were jerking and thrashing as they drowned or bled to death. Come on! Sergeant Graham roared as he stumbled over the remains of the mud wall that had penned in the water behind the glassy. A foot of muddy water still lay in the old ditch, but Graham ran through it as though he had wings. A bullet plucked at the flag in his left hand. Come on, you bastards! he shouted. He was on the lower slope of the breach now, and his whole world was nothing but noise and smoke and whip sawing bullets. It was a tiny place, that world, a hell of dust and fire above a rubble slope. He could see no enemy, for those above him were hidden by their own musket smoke. But then the defenders on the inner wall, who could stare straight down the throat of the breach in the outer wall, saw the redcoats clambering up the ramp and opened fire. A man behind Graham collapsed backward with blood gurgling from his throat. Another pitched forward with a shattered knee. Graham reached the breach's summit. His real goal was the wall to his left. But the summit of the breach felt like triumph enough, and he rammed the flagstaff deep into the stones and dust. Lieutenant Graham, now! he shouted exultingly, and a bullet immediately snatched him off the summit and hurled him back toward his men. It was just then that the Tipu's own volunteers struck. Sixty men swarmed up from behind the wall with sabres and muskets to meet the two forlorn hopes on the crest of the rubble breach. These were the Tipu's best men, his tigers, the warriors of Allah, who had been promised a favoured place in paradise, and they screamed with exultation as they attacked. They fired a musket volley as they climbed, then threw down the empty guns to attack the redcoats with bright curved swords. Musket barrels parried swords, bayonets lunged and were cut aside. Men swore and killed, swore and died. Some men fought with hands and boots. They gouged and bit each other as they grappled hand to hand on the dusty summit. One Bengali sepoy snatched up a fallen sword and carved away to the foot of the wall, where it climbed up from the breach to the northern ramparts. A Mysorean volunteer sliced at him. The sepoy instinctively parried, then cut down through the man's brass helmet so violently that the blade was buried and trapped in his enemy's skull. Bengali left it there, and, so fevered by battle that he did not realize he was weaponless, tried to scale the broken wall's flank to attack the defenders waiting on the fire step above. A musket shot from the top of the wall hurled him backward, and he slid, dying and bleeding, to lodge against the wounded Graham. Baird was still west of the river. His job was not to die with the forlorn hopes, but to lead the main attack up the path they had cleared. That main attack now formed itself into two columns of platoons. Forward! Baird shouted, and led the twin columns towards the river. The ground ahead was being pitted by bullets, as if an invisible hail fell. Behind him, the drummer boys were sounding the advance, while the engineers, laden with their fascines and ladders, walked alongside the platoons. Rockets screamed about Baird, their trails stitching ropes of smoke above the river. Men struggled hand to hand in the breach, and the walls of the city spat flame through the churning rill of smoke. Hell had come to Seringapatam, and Baird hurried toward it. Jesus Christ! Sharp swore, for he could hear the sudden sound of battle swelling just beyond the western walls. Men were dying there. Men were storming a breach, and the Tipu's mine waited for them, its ton of powder cunningly crammed into a stone tunnel, and poised to annihilate a whole brigade. He stopped at the corner of the alley which led to the ancient gateway that had been filled with the explosives. He peered round the corner and saw Sergeant Rotier and two Frenchmen from Goudin's battalion. All three were standing beside a barrel, staring up at the inner ramparts, and around the Europeans was a guard of a half-dozen jetties, all armed with muskets and swords. He ducked back and blew the priming out of his musket's pan. "'Only nine or ten of the bastards,' he told Lawford, "'so let's give them a headache.' The rockets were stacked nose-first on the cart, so that their long bamboo tails stuck out toward the cart's handles. Sharp went to the front of the cart, seized the thin boards that were painted with gods and elephants, and wrenched them off. They came away easily, their nails pulling out of the cart's sides. 
He beat off the last slivers of wood so that now there was no obstacle in front of the lethal cargo. Then he turned the cart so that the rocket's tin cones were pointing toward the alley, though he took care to make sure that the cart and its contents were still hidden from the men waiting beside the mine's fuse. Lawford said nothing, but just watched as Sharp tore the fuse paper from one of the rockets. He twisted the paper into a spill, then pushed it into the musket's empty lock, cocked the gun, and pulled the trigger. The powder-impregnated paper immediately caught the spark and started burning. Shop dropped the musket and began lighting the fuses of the topmost row of rockets. The paper in his hand burned fiercely, but he managed to light eight of the weapons before he was forced to tear off another fuse and use it to light more. It was difficult to reach between the rockets' bamboo sticks, but he lit another ten while the first few fuses were fizzing and smoking. Lawford, seeing what Sharp was doing, had taken a single page of the Bible from his pocket. And twisted it into a spill that he used to light still more of the missiles. Then the first rocket to be lit suddenly coughed and spat out a gout of smoke, and Sharp immediately snatched up the cart's handles and shoved it around the corner so that the missiles were pointing straight down the alley. He crouched beside it, sheltered from the men in the alley by the corner of the building, and pulled his musket toward him. He used the musket to raise the cart's handles so that the vehicle's bed and the rockets it contained. Were horizontal. The first rocket shuddered, then streaked away. The second went an instant later, then two more, and suddenly the whole cart was shaking and jerking as the rocket seethed away. A musket bullet hit the cart. Another flick dust from the corner of the building, but then there were no more shots. Just shouts of terror as the missiles screamed between the alley's close walls. Some of the rockets had solid shot in their nose cones, others had small charges of black powder, and those now began to explode. A man screamed. More rockets exploded. The sound of their blasts cramming the alley with noise, while the missiles' fierce trails filled the small street with smoke and flame. Sharp waited till the last lit rocket flamed off the cart. Now's the hard bit, he warned Lawford. He replaced the priming in his musket with a pinch from a fresh cartridge. Then seized the handcart and pushed it in front of him down the alley. At least thirty of the rockets had fired, and the alley was now an inferno of boiling smoke, amongst which a handful of live rockets still ricocheted or spun crazily, while the carcasses of the spent weapons burned bright in the gloom. Sharp charged into that chaos, hoping that the half-loaded cart would serve as a shield if any man still lived in the alley. Lawford charged with him. At least four men were still on their feet, while another had found shelter in a deep doorway. But they were all dazed by the violence of the rockets and half blinded by the thick smoke. Sharp gave the cart a huge push to send it clattering toward them. One of the jetties saw the cart, dodged aside, and charged at Sharp with a drawn saber. But Lawford shot him with his musket, taking the huge man in the throat as quickly and cleanly as if he'd been a pheasant rising from a brake. The cart struck two of the standing men and sent them reeling. Sharp stamped on the head of one and kicked the other in the crotch. He slammed the butt of the musket onto the back of a Frenchman's skull, then drove the weapon's muzzle deep into a jetty's belly, and as the man folded, he rammed the barrel into his face. The jetty screamed and staggered away, his hands clutched tight to one eye. Lawford had seized a fallen sword and sliced it savagely across another jetty's neck. And was so inspired and elated by battle that he did not even feel any revulsion when the man's blood gushed out to hiss in the burning remnants of a rocket. Sergeant Rottier was on the ground with one of his legs broken by the strike of a rocket, but he cocked his musket and aimed the gun at Lawford. Then the sergeant heard Sharp behind him and tried to swing the musket round. Sharp was too close and too fast. He felled Rottier with a huge swing of his gun. He felt the butt break the sergeant's skull. The gun was still loaded, so he reversed it, and snarled a challenge as he peered through the choking smoke. He could see no danger now—just wounded men, dead men, and flickering rocket cases. The mine's trail, a snaking length of quick fuse, had somehow escaped the fire of the rockets, and lay discarded beside the toppled barrel in which Rottier had been keeping a lit linstock. Sharp moved toward the barrel, then heard the click of a gun being cocked. That's far enough, Sharp. It was Colonel Goudin who spoke. He was behind Sharp. The colonel had been waiting for the Tipu's signal on the inner ramparts just beside the gatehouse, but he had jumped down onto a rooftop and then into the alley, and now he aimed his pistol at Sharp. Lawford, saber in hand, was a half dozen paces away, too far to help. 
Gudan jerked the pistol. Put the musket down, Sharp. Gudan spoke calmly. Sharp had turned with the musket at his hip. The colonel was only three or four paces away. Put your pistol down, sir, Sharp said. A slight look of regret crossed the colonel's face as he straightened his arm to take more careful aim. Sharp fired as soon as he saw the small movement, and though he'd not aimed the musket but fired it from the hip, his bullet struck the colonel high on his right shoulder, so that Goudin's pistol arm flew into the air. Sorry, sir, Sharp said, and then he ran to where one of the spent rockets still had weak flames burning from its exhaust. He carried the flaming carcass to the end of the quick fuse and there paused to listen. He could hear cannons firing and knew they must be the Tipu's guns, for no British artilleryman would dare fire now for fear of hitting the assaulting troops. He could hear musket fire, but he could not hear the massive, deep-throated roar of men coming into the breach. The fall-on hope alone must be fighting, and that meant the space between the walls must still be clear of British soldiers. He stooped to put the rocket's feeble flames to the waiting fuse, but Lawford pushed his arm aside. Sharp looked up at the lieutenant. Sir, best to leave the mine alone, I think, Sharp. Our men might be too close. Sharp still held the burning tube. Just you and me, sir, eh? You and me, Sharp? Lawford asked, puzzled. In five minutes, sir, when the tipper wonders why his fireworks aren't going off, and he sends a dozen men to find out what's happening, you and me, we're going to fight all those buggers off alone. Lawford hesitated. I don't know, he said uncertainly. I do, sir, Sharp said. And he pushed the burning rocket onto the fuse, and immediately a quick and bitter fire began to fizzle and spark down the powder-impregnated rope. Goudin tried to stub it out with his foot, but Sharp unceremoniously shoved the Frenchman aside. "Are you hurt bad, sir?" he asked Goudin. "Broken shoulder, Sharp." Goudin looked close to tears, not because of his wound, but because he'd failed in his duty. "I've no doubt Doctor Venkatesh will mend it. How did you escape?" Kill the tiger, sir, and some more of those jetty buggers. Goudin smiled sadly. The tipu should have killed you when he had the chance. We all make mistakes, sir. Sharp said as he watched the fire burn through the stone barricade that had been piled up in front of the ancient archway's gates. I reckon we'd better get you into cover, sir. He said, and he pulled an unwilling Goudin into a doorway where Lawford was already crouching. The smoke was thinning from the alley. A wounded jetty was crawling blindly against the farther wall. Another was vomiting, and Sergeant Rottier was groaning. There was blood bubbling at the sergeant's nostrils, and the back of his head was black with gore. "I reckon you've just made sergeant, Sharp," Lawford said. Sharp smiled. "I reckon I have, sir." "Well done, Sergeant Sharp." Lawford held out a hand. "A good day's work." Sharp shook his officer's hand. But the day's work ain't done yet, sir. It isn't," Lawford asked. "For God's sake, man, what else are you planning?" But Lawford never heard what Sergeant Sharp answered. For at that moment the mine blew. Chapter Eleven, the last chapter. The Tipu's engineers had done their work well. Not all the mine's force was directed northwards, but the greater part of it was, and that part was devastating. The explosion scoured the space between the inner and outer walls, a space that should have been packed with British soldiers. To Sharp, peering around the doorway, it at first looked as though the whole squat gate house disintegrated, not into rubble and dust, but into its constituent stones. For the dressed granite blocks all jarred slightly apart as the ancient building bulged from the terrible pressure of the fire within. Dust sprang from every opened crevice. As the big stones separated cleanly along their mortared joints, then Sharp lost sight of the collapsing gatehouse, because there was suddenly nothing but dust, smoke, flame, and noise. He jerked back into shelter and covered his head with his arms when the noise boomed past him. Just an instant after he'd seen the dust whip past the doorway as the gases escaped from the expanding fire, the noise seemed to go on forever. First there was the swelling bang of the powder exploding. Then the grinding crash of stones cracking and tumbling, and the whistle of shards whirling away across the city, and then there was a ringing in Sharp's ears, and above the ringing, but sounding as far away and as thin as the trumpet that had heralded the assault, the screams of men caught by fire or blast or stone. After that came the sound of a wind 
an unnatural wind that scoured thatch off houses, threw down tiles, and raised dust devils in streets a quarter of a mile away from the explosion. The men on the walls nearest the gatehouse saw nothing, unless it was the flash that ended their lives, for the explosion plucked the Tipo's defenders clean off the ramparts south of the breach. The wall itself was undamaged, even where it ran past the gatehouse. For there, the old outer archway was blown out like a bung, and a monstrous jet of smoky flame jetted from the city wall to vent the explosive's power safely beneath the ramparts. But the squat tower over the old gateway fell. It collapsed slowly, sliding down into the space between the inner and outer walls. Scraps of brick and stone arched up and outward, splashing in the river just ahead of Baird's advancing columns. More scraps of stone rained down on the city. The noise slowly faded. The ringing in Sharp's ears diminished until he could hear a man whimpering somewhere in the horror. He peered out again and saw that the explosion had scoured the alley of dead and wounded men. There was no sign of the handcart. There was nothing except broken stone, burning thatch, and smears of blood. North of the breach, where the lick of flame and blast had been lessened by distance, the defenders were dizzied by noise. Their banners of gold and scarlet and green silk whipped stiff in the blast as men crouched in embrasures or reeled like drunks before the hot wind. The Tipu's heroes, who had volunteered to fight the forlorn hopes on the breach, were killed almost to a man, for they were on the inner side of the breach where nothing could save them. While the survivors of the forlorn hopes, thrust back by the first charge of the Tipu's men, had been shielded by the southern shoulder of the broken wall. In the breach itself there was a vast veil of swirling dust, a huge boiling pyre of smoke churned above the walls. But the breach, for a moment at least, was undefended. The Tipu's men who should have been guarding the shoulders of the breach were either dead or so shocked as to be unable to respond, while the men on the inner wall had ducked down as the terrible noise and heat and dust pounded about them. Most of them still crouched, fearful of the strange silence that followed the explosion. "'Now, boys, now!' a man shouted on the breach, and the survivors of the forlorn hopes climbed into the smoke, then up the broken stonework of the walls. They choked on the airborne dust, and their red coats were whitened by it. But they were men who had steeled themselves to the worst ordeal of war, the storming of a breach, and the steel was hard and cold in their souls, so that they were scarcely aware of the horror of the last few seconds, only of the need to climb the shoulders of a breach and start their killing. Those who went south found an empty wall, while those who went north climbed to meet dazed men. The redcoats and sepoys had expected no mercy in this assault, and were prepared to show none, and so they began their slaughter. "'Pig-sticking time, lads!' one corporal shouted. He stabbed his bayonet into a wild-eyed man and rid his blade of the body's encumbrance by shaking the corpse over the inner rampart's edge. His comrades stormed past him, their blood whipped into rage by the fear of being the first men into the enemy's citadel. Now, up on the ramparts, they killed in a frenzy to let their fear escape in a torrent of enemy blood. Baird had still been west of the river when the explosion occurred, and he'd felt a momentary pang of horror as the great blast blossomed in the city. For a terrible second, he thought the whole city, all its houses and temples and palaces, was about to disintegrate before his eyes. But he'd kept moving. Indeed, he'd quickened his pace, so that he splashed into the South Corvary while the debris was still falling. He waded the shallows as all around him the river foamed with falling stone, and he shouted incomprehensibly, desperate to take his heavy sword to the enemy that had once imprisoned him. The dust obscuring the breach shifted as a snatch of wind caught and whirled it northwards, and Baird saw that his forlorn hopes were on the walls now. He saw some red coats, oddly whitened, moving north. Then he glimpsed a rush of the enemy coming from the southern bastions to replace the defenders who'd been scarred from the ramparts by the explosion. Those reinforcements were running past a great toiling grey-white plume of smoke, amongst which pale flames licked the sky. Baird assumed the explosion had been the Tipu's feared mine, but his horror at its force turned to exultation as he realized that the blast had been premature and that, instead of slaughtering his men, it had opened the city to storm. 
but he also recognized that the enemy was now waking from his nightmare and rushing men to face the attack. And so Baird hurried out of the river, through the shattered glacis, and up the breach that was now vividly slicked with great splashes of fresh blood. He chose to turn southward to help that forlorn hope face the rush of the Tipu's reinforcements. Behind Baird, the twin columns of redcoats splashed through the river. Each column had 3,000 men, and their task was to encircle the city and so capture the whole ring of Seringapatam's walls and bastions and towers and gates. But the Tipu's men were recovering their wits now, and the invading streams were at last being opposed. Muskets blasted down from ramparts, concealed guns were unmasked, and rockets streaked away from the parapets. Canister and round shot slashed down at the two columns, the missiles exploding high gouts of water as they struck the river. Sepoys and redcoats fell. Some crawled to safety, others were carried downstream, while the least fortunate were trampled by the boots of the men crossing the river. The leading troops of each column scrambled up the broken shoulders of the walls. The engineers shoved ladders against those shoulders, and still more men climbed their rungs to the ramparts. And there the fight changed. Now, on the narrow fire step of the outer wall, the columns had to force their way forward, but the Tipu's men were firing volley after volley into the attackers' ranks. The most damaging fire came from the inner wall, for there the Tipu's men were protected by a parapet, while the British and their Indian allies had no such protection on the inner side of the captured outer wall. Men fired at them from their front, and a torrent of fire came from their flank. Yet still they pushed on, consumed by the blind rage of war. The only way to survive horror was to win through, and so they stepped over the dead to fire their muskets, then crouched to reload while the ranks behind pushed on. The wounded fell, some of them tumbling down to the inner ditch, while behind them, in the foaming river, the tails of the two columns hurried on toward the battle. The breach had been taken, but the city had not fallen yet. The sepoys and the redcoats had taken a hundred yards of the outer wall on either side of the breach, but the Tipu soldiers were fighting back hard, and the Tipu himself led the defenders north of the breach. The Tipu had cursed Gudin for blowing the mine too early, and thus wasting its terrible destructive power. But now he tried to revive the defense by his personal example. He stood in the front rank of his soldiers, while behind him a succession of aids, loaded jewel and encrusted hunting rifles. One by one, the rifles were given to the Tipu, who aimed and fired, aimed and fired, and redcoat after redcoat was struck down. Whenever an enemy tried to rush along the ramparts, the Tipu would drop that man, then pass the gun back, take another, step forward through the powder smoke and fire again. Musket balls hissed about him. Two of his aides were wounded, and a score of soldiers fighting at the Tipu's side were killed or maimed, but the Tipu's life seemed charmed. He stepped in blood, but none of it was his, and it seemed as though he could not die, but only kill. And so he did, cold-bloodedly, deliberately, exultantly defending his city and his dream against the barbarians who had come to snatch his tiger throne. The fight on the walls intensified as more men came to the threatened ramparts. The men in red came from the river, and the men in tiger stripes came from other parts of the city wall and both came to kill on top of the wall. A narrow place, scarce five paces wide, lifted in the sky, where the vultures flew, scenting death. Sharp scooped up three fallen muskets from the end of the alley where they'd been blown by the explosion. He checked that his new guns were undamaged, loaded the two which were empty, then went back to Lawford. You stay with the colonel, sir he suggested, and put your coat right side out. Lads will be here soon, and when they're here, sir, you might like to find Lally. Lawford coloured. Lally? Look after her, sir. I promised the lass she'd come to no harm. You did? Lawford asked, with a trace of indignation. He was wondering just how well Sharp knew the girl. Then he decided it was better not to ask. Of course I'll look after her, Lawford said, still blushing. Then he noted that Sharp, despite his own advice, had still not donned his red coat. Where are you going? the lieutenant asked. Got a job to do, sir, Sharp answered vaguely. And, sir, can I thank you, sir? I couldn't have done any of this without you.
Sharp was not used to offering such heartfelt compliments, and he spoke awkwardly. You're a brave bugger, sir. You really are. Lawford felt absurdly pleased. He knew he should have stopped Sharp from leaving, for this was no time for a man to be roaming Seringapatam streets. But Sharp was already gone. Lawford turned his coat the right side out and pushed his arms through the sleeves. Good arm beside him waved away a fly, and wondered why the dust and smoke did not keep the pests away. What will they do with me, Lieutenant? He asked Lawford. They'll treat you well, sir. I'm sure. They'll probably send you back to France. I'd like that, Goudin said, and suddenly realized that was all he really did want. You're Private Sharp, he said. Sergeant Sharp, now, sir. You're Sergeant Sharp, then. He's a good man, Lieutenant. Yes, sir, Lawford said. He is. If he lives, he'll go far. If he lives, sir, yes. And if the army lets him live, Lawford thought, look after him, Lieutenant. Goudin said, "An army isn't made of its officers, you know, though we officers like to think it is. An army is no better than its men, and when you find good men, you must look after them. That's an officer's job." Yes, sir," Lawford said dutifully. The first fugitives from the walls were visible at the end of the alley now. Men in dust-smeared tiger tunics, who staggered or limped away from the fighting. The noise of that fight was the continuous staccato of musket fire, shouts, and screams, and it could not be long before the first murderous attackers broke into the streets. Lawford wondered if he should have demanded Goudin's sword, then worried about having allowed Sharp to go off on his own. Sharp lived so far. He had thought about putting on his red coat, then decided there was no point in making himself conspicuous, even though the coat was now so filthy that it hardly looked like a uniform any more. And so he left the turned jacket knotted about his neck, and with two muskets slung on each shoulder, ran northward through the city. The crackle of muskets was constant, but above that crisp sound, he could also hear the roar of maddened men going into a brutal fight. In a few minutes, that fight would spread into the city, and Sharp planned to use those minutes well. He ran through the small square where the rocket carts were still parked, and then hurried past the inner palace, where a tiger-striped guard, thinking that Sharp was a deserter from the Tipu's European troops, shouted a challenge at him. But by the time the guard had cocked his musket, Sharp had already disappeared into the labyrinth of alleys and yards that lay to the north of the palace. He pushed through a crowd of fearful women, past the cheetah cages, and so went back to the dungeons. The bodies of the three jetties were crawling with flies, and beyond them the outer gate of the dungeon still swung open. Sharp ran through the gate and jumped down the stairs to where his tiger lay dead. Sharp, e!、Eh? Hakeswell came to the bars. You came back, lad. I knew you would. So what's happening, lad? No, don't do that. Hakeswell had seen Sharp take a musket from his shoulder. I like you, boy. Always have. I might have seemed a bit hard on you at times, but only for your own good, Sharpy. You're a good boy. You are. You're a proper soldier. No. Sharp had aimed the musket. Sharp turned the muzzle away from Hakeswell and aimed it at the padlock. He did not want to waste time with the picklock, so he simply held the musket against the ancient loop of the padlock, and pulled the trigger. The iron loop sheared, and the lock fell from the hasp. Sharp dragged the cell door open. "I've come to get you, Obadiah," he said. "Knew you would, Sharpy. Knew you would." Hakeswell's face twitched. "Knew you wouldn't leave your sergeant to rot." "So come on out," Sharp said. Hakeswell hung back. "No hard feelings, lad. I'm not a lad, Obadiah. I'm a sergeant like you are. I've got Colonel Wellesley's promise. I have." I'm a sergeant now, just like you. So you are, so you are, and so you should be. Hakeswell's face twitched again. I said as much to Mister Morris, didn't I? That Sharpy, I said, he's a sergeant in the making. If ever I did see one, a good lad, I told him, got me eye on him, sir. That's what I told Mister Morris. Sharp smiled. So come on out here, Obadiah. Hakeswell backed all the way to the cell's rear wall. Better to stay here, Sharpie," he said. "You know what the lads are like when their blood's boiling. 
Might get hurt out there. Best to stay put a while. Let the lads settle it first, eh? Sharp crossed the cell in two strides and gripped Hakeswell's collar. You come with me, you bastard, he said, tugging the whimpering sergeant forward. I should kill you here, you scum, but you don't deserve a soldier's death, Obadah. You're too rotten for a bullet. No, Sharpie, no! Hakeswell screamed as Sharp dragged him out of the cell, across the tiger's carcass, and up the stone steps. I ain't done nothing to you. Nothing! Sharp turned furiously on Hakeswell. You had me flogged, you bastard, and then you betrayed us. I never did. Cross my heart and hope to die, Sharpie. Sharp spun Hexwell up against the bars of the dungeon's outer cage, slamming him against the iron rods, then punched the sergeant in the chest. You're going to die, Obadiah, I promise, because you did betray us. I didn't do nothing, Hexwell said through his laboured breathing. On my mother's dying breath, Sharpie, I didn't. The flogging, yes, I, I did do that to you, and I, I was wrong. He tried to fall to his knees, but Sharp dragged him upright. I didn't betray you, Sharpie. I wouldn't do that to another Englishman. You'll still be telling lies when you go through the gates of hell, Obadiah, Sharp said as he grabbed the sergeant's collar again. Now come on, you bastard. He pulled Hexwell through the dungeon's outer gate, across the courtyard, and into the alley which led south toward the palace. A squad of tiger-striped soldiers ran past the mouth of the alley, going to the western walls, but none took any notice of Sharp. The guard on the northern palace gate did notice him and levelled his musket, but Sharp snarled the magic words at the man, Goudin! Colonel Goudin! And such was the confidence in Sharp's voice that the guard lowered the musket and stepped aside. Where are you taking me, Sharpie? Hexwell panted. You'll find out. Two more guards were stationed at the inner courtyard gate, and they too pointed their muskets. But Sharp shouted at them, and once again Gudar's name was a talisman sufficient to allay their suspicions. Besides, Sharp had a red-coated prisoner, and the two nervous guards mistook him for one of Gudar's men, and so let him pass. Sharp lifted the gate's latch and dragged it open. The six tigers, already disturbed by the terrible noises that had been battering about the city, leapt toward the opening gate, and their six chains cracked taut. Hakeswell saw the animals and screamed, No, Sharpie, no, mother! Sharp dragged the struggling Hakeswell into the courtyard. You reckon you can't die, Obadiah? I reckon different. So when you get to hell, you bastard, tell them it was Sergeant Sharp who sent you. No, Sharpie, no! This last word was a yelp of despair as Sharp pulled Hakeswell into the centre of the courtyard and there spun him around at arm's length. No! The sergeant wailed as Sharp spun him faster. Then Sharp suddenly let go of Hakeswell's collar. The sergeant was unbalanced and out of control. He staggered and flailed his arms, but nothing could stop his momentum. No! He screamed a last time as he fell and slid across the sand to where three tigers waited. Goodbye, Obadiah, Sharp said. You bastard! I cannot die! Hakeswell screamed. Then his cry was cut off as a great yellow-eyed beast growled above him. They've got an early supper, Sharp told the bemused guards on the gate. Oh, they've got an appetite. The guards, not understanding a word, grinned back. Sharp took one look behind, spat, and walked away. A debt he reckoned was properly paid. Now all he needed to do was hide till the redcoats came. And then he saw the pearl-hung palanquin, and another debt came to mind. For a time it seemed as if the Tipu could hold his city. He fought like a tiger himself, knowing that this blaze of violence beneath the smoke-shrouded sun would decide his fate. It would be the tiger throne or the grave. He did not know what was happening on the southern stretch of the walls, except that the distant fury of constant musket fire told him that fighting continued there. He only knew that he and his men were taking a terrible toll on the attackers on the northern wall. The Tupu had been forced slowly back by the sheer weight of numbers that poured onto the ramparts, and that bloody retreat had driven him off the western ramparts, 
back around the corner by the remnants of the northwestern bastion, and so on to the long stretch of northern wall which faced toward the river Corvary. But there his retreat had stopped. A cushion of infantry had been stationed in the Sultan Battery, the largest bastion in the north wall, and that garrison hurried along the walls to reinforce the Tipu, who now possessed enough men to overwhelm the musketry of the attackers on the narrow northern fire step. The Tipu still led the fight. He was dressed in a white linen tunic and loose chintz trousers with a red silk sash about his waist. He had jewelled armlets, the great ruby glittering on the feathered plume of his helmet. There were pearls and an emerald necklace at his throat, and the gold-hilted tiger sword at his side. Those gaudy stones made him a target for every redcoat and sepoy, yet he insisted on staying in the very front rank where he could pour his rifle fire at the stalled attackers. And his charms worked, for though the bullets flicked close, none hit him. He was the tiger of my saw. He could not die, only kill. The attackers suffered even worse damage from the men on the inner wall. That wall had not been breached; it had not even been attacked. And more and more tiger-striped infantry hurried up its ramps to reinforce the defenders. They fired across the inner ditch, and their musket balls flayed at the crowded attackers, and their cannon fire cleared whole stretches of the outer wall. Only the blinding powder smoke that hung between the walls protected the attackers. Who either endured the terrible flank fire, or else crouched behind dismounted cannon, and prayed that their ordeal would soon end. They'd captured the northwestern corner of the outer wall, but it seemed to have gained them nothing but death, for now it was the turn of the Tipu's men to be the slaughterers. Baird, heading south from the breach, encountered similar resistance, but Baird was in no mood to be delayed. He caught up and passed the survivors of the forlorn hope. And shouting like a demon, led a crazed charge past the ruined gatehouse, where the remnants of the Tipu's mine smoked like the pit of hell. Baird was a major general, but he would gladly have given all the gold lace on his uniform for this one chance to fight like a common soldier. This was revenge, and the great claymore hacked into the Tipu's men, as Baird bellowed his challenge. That mingled fury with the agonized memories of his humiliation in this city. He fought like a creature possessed, stepping over the dead and slipping on their blood as he carried the battle down the walls. His men howled with him; they were caught up in Baird's madness. At this hour, under the fire of the sun and emboldened by the arrack and rum they had drunk in their long wait in the trenches, the redcoats and sepoys had become gods of war. They gave death with impunity, as they followed a war-maddened Scotsman down an enemy wall that was sticky with blood. Baird would have his city, or else he would die in its dust. Apa Rao's cushions defended the southwestern corner of the city, and Apa Rao watched appalled as the hugely tall Scotsman hacked his way toward him. He watched the torrent of redcoats swarming behind the giant, and he heard their shouts. And he watched their victims fall off the ramparts. The brigade that defended that stretch of wall was being killed, man by man, and those that lived were giving way, and some were running rather than face the horror. And Apa Rao's men were next for the slaughter. But to die for what? He wondered. The city was gone, and the Tipu's dynasty was doomed. Apa Rao knew his men were watching him, waiting for the order that would hurl them into battle. But instead, the general turned to his second in command. "When were the men last paid?" he asked. The officer frowned, puzzled by the question, but at last managed an answer. Three months at least, I four, I think. Till then, there will be a pay parade this afternoon. Sahib. The second in command gaped up at Apa Rao. The general raised his voice so that as many of his men as possible could hear him. The pay is overdue, so this afternoon we shall have a pay parade in the encampment. Men shouldn't fight without pay. He ostentatiously sheathed his sword and walked calmly down from the ramparts. Here at the Mysore Gate, there was no ditch between the inner and outer walls, and Rao airily strode through the inner gate. 
For a second, his men watched him, then first in ones and twos, and afterward in a rush. They followed. One instant the wall was crammed with men, the next it was emptying, so that Baird, cutting his furious way through the last of the West Wall's guards, suddenly saw that the city was his. He howled again, this time in victory. His butcher's sword was red with blood, his right sleeve soaked with it. A red coat, perhaps forgetting that the Scotsman was a general, slapped his back, and Baird hugged the man for pure joy. The Tipu still fought, and still thought he could win, but on the northern wall just twenty yards beyond the northwest bastion, a single cross wall joined the inner and outer ramparts. The cross wall served as a buttress for the old outer wall, and at one time it had been intended to thicken the buttressing cross wall, then make the space it contained into an even larger bastion. But the work had never been done, and now the wall, its coping just eight inches across, offered itself as a perilously narrow bridge to the redcoats and sepoys who were trapped by the Tipu's fire. If they could cross that bridge, they could assault the inner wall and scour its defenders from the deadly parapet. One man tried to cross and was shot down. He wailed as he fell into the ditch. A moment later, another man dashed across and reached halfway before a musket ball shattered his lower leg. He dropped his own musket and fell onto the wall's coping, cursing as he tried to keep his balance. Then a second shot tipped him over the side. For a second or two, he managed to cling to the top of the wall, shuddering as pain shook his body. Then he, too, dropped. The Tipu's men on the outer wall cheered and edged forward to drive the enemy away from the buttressing cross wall. But a rush of sepoys checked their progress. A new musket duel broke out, Indian against Indian, a torrent of fire in which the Tipu somehow survived like a charmed being. The sepoys fired volley after volley, came forward, died, and more men came to take their places. The light company of the King's 12th Regiment followed the sepoys. Captain Goodall, their commander, eyed the narrow buttress. It led directly to the inner wall, which was heavy with defenders, but it was also a bridge to victory. Death or glory, Goodall shouted the cliché, but it was a truism too at that moment. And then he stepped out onto the narrow coping and fired his pistol into the lingering powder smoke that obscured the far end of the wall. Come on, he called, then ran along the top of the wall, miraculously keeping his footing. He jumped onto the inner wall's parapet and slashed down with his sword. A man fired up at him, but good old sergeant, coming hard behind, had unceremoniously shoved his captain out of the way, and Goodall fell down onto the inner wall's fire step, and the bullet missed him. The sergeant was next to cross the parapet. Then a line of screaming men followed as Goodall fought his way eastward. The fire from the inner wall, which had been gutting the attackers, began to falter, and suddenly a rush of redcoats, who had been crouching for shelter from the inner wall's musketry, ran eastward along the outer wall toward the Tipu. Others crossed the makeshift bridge to reinforce the Twelfth's light company. The Tipu saw the enemy revive. They were like a beast that had been wounded, but not killed. And the beast had life in it yet. Too much life, and the Tipu understood that his night's troublesome dreams had been right after all. The turbid oil pot had told the truth. This day the city would fall, and with it his throne and his palace and his seraglio, with its six hundred women. But the disaster did not mean the dynasty was dead. There were great forts in Mysore's northern hills, and if he could reach one of those fastnesses, then he could still fight on against these devils in red who were stealing his capital. The Tipu retreated fast, and his bodyguard went with him. They left other men to defend the outer wall, while they ran past the Sultan Battery to the ramp which led down to the water gate. And there, at the foot of the ramp, the palace chamberlains had thought to have His Majesty's palanquin ready with its bearers. One of the chamberlains, oblivious of the bullets hissing through the sky, bowed low to the tipu and invited His Majesty to take his proper place on the plump silk cushions beneath the palanquin's tiger-striped canopy. The tipu turned and glanced up at the walls to see what progress the attackers were making. There was fighting on both walls now, and the city was plainly doomed, 
but the defenders were still resisting stubbornly. The Tipu felt a pang at deserting them, but swore he would avenge them yet. He rejected the palanquin. It was a slow vehicle in which to make a retreat. While inside the city, just on the other side of the inner wall, he had stables filled with fine horses. He would choose his swiftest horse, snatch up some gold to pay those men who stayed loyal. This book is continued on disc eleven. Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell concluded. Disc eleven. He rejected the palanquin. It was a slow vehicle in which to make a retreat. While inside the city, just on the other side of the inner wall, he had stables filled with fine horses. He would choose his swiftest horse, snatch up some gold to pay those men who stayed loyal, then flee through the city's unthreatened Bangalore gate, and from there turn north toward his great hill fortresses. Above the Tipu, the city's last defenders retreated slowly. The city was falling to the redcoats under a pallor of smoke, and God had willed it. But God might yet permit the Tipu to fight another day, and so, rifle in hand, he headed for the inner water gate. The palanquin was carried by eight men, two to each of its four long gilded handles. When Sharp first saw it. The clumsy vehicle was being hurried away from the palace by two robed chamberlains, who lashed at the bearers with their tiger-headed staves. For a second, Sharp thought the Tipu must be inside the palanquin, but then he saw that the side curtains were looped back and that the cushions inside were empty. He followed. He could sense a panic inside the city now. It had been quiet until a few moments ago, crouching like a beast, not wanting to be noticed. But now the city somehow sensed that its doom had come. Beggars huddled together for protection. A woman cried in a shuttered house, and the stray dogs yelped piteously. Small groups of the Tipu soldiers were fleeing in the streets, their bare feet pattering on the dried mud as they ran toward the Bangalore gate, where no enemy threatened. The sound of battle was still intense, but the defence was fraying fast. The chamberlains led the palanquin toward the water gate of the inner wall. The gate lay close to the malodorous lake of sewage that so soured the air, and some of the sewage, denied proper drains by the hastily constructed inner wall, had leaked into the water gate, which was a brick-lined tunnel fifty feet long, piercing the inner wall. An officer stood guard at its inner doors. But as the palanquin approached, he unbarred the big teak gates and dragged them open. He shouted something as Sharp followed the clumsy vehicle into the low tunnel. But Sharp just shouted Colonel Goudin's name back, and the officer was too confused to challenge him again. Instead, once the palanquin and the European soldier had gone through the tunnel, he closed the doors, then glanced nervously up to where a mist of smoke betrayed the attacker's progress on the wall above him. Sharp paused inside the tunnel while the palanquin went on ahead. The tunnel's floor had sunk in places, and the leaking sewage had gathered in those deep spots. The place stank like an unclean barracks latrine. The palanquin's bearers stumbled as they splashed through the pools. Then the vehicle went into the sunlight beyond. Sharp could see soldiers out there in the space between the walls. The soldiers wore tiger stripes and were watching anxiously westward. He had followed the palanquin instinctively, but now found himself in a bad place. The tunnel's thick teak doors were shut behind him. The air was foul and choking, and there was an enemy in front of him. He crouched beside the damp wall, trying to decide what he should do. He had four muskets, all but one loaded, but his spare cartridges were in the pocket of his red coat, which, because it was still knotted around his neck, was hard to reach. He stood. Propped the muskets against the curved wall, pulled the jacket right side out, and then shoved his arms into the tiger-torn sleeves. He was a redcoat again. He loaded the one empty musket, then crept toward the mouth of the tunnel, and saw the tipu. He saw the small gaudy man come running down the ramp from the outer walls. The tipu, surrounded by his bodyguard and aides, stopped beside the palanquin. 
Sharp saw the Tipu look back toward the fight, then shake his head, and immediately an aide broke away from the group and ran toward the tunnel where Sharp waited. The Tipu gave one last glance westward, then followed. Bloody hell! Sharp cursed. The whole damn lot were coming for him, and he backed down the tunnel, cocked one of his muskets, and dropped to one knee. The aide ran into the tunnel, shouting for the gate to be opened. Then he saw Sharp in the gloom, and his shout died away. He dragged a pistol from a green sash at his waist, but too late. Sharp fired. The spark of the powder in the pan was unnaturally bright in the tunnel, and the noise of the musket was magnified to a deafening crash. But through the sudden smoke, Sharp saw the aide flung backward. Sharp seized a second loaded musket, and just at that instant the door opened behind him. He turned, snarling, and the officer guarding the gate saw the red coat, and without thinking, just slammed the heavy nail-studded teak doors shut again. Sharp heard the locking bar being dropped into place. The Tipu's bodyguard ran toward the tunnel. Sharp fired his second musket. He knew he could not fight them all, so now his best chance of surviving was to deter them from coming into the tunnel itself. Then, blessedly, a roar of musketry announced that he had help, and with the third musket in his hand, he edged forward through the dense smoke to see that the Tipu's bodyguard had been distracted by a new enemy. Some British troops had found steps down to the space between the walls, and those troops were now attacking toward the water gate. The bodyguard retreated from the new attackers, unmasking the tunnel's entrance, and Sharp ran toward the daylight. He crouched just inside the tunnel and saw that the Tipu had been caught in the open. On one side was the palanquin with its dubious chance of a lumbering escape, and on the other was the threatened water gate, which led through the inner wall to his horses. His bodyguard was firing and reloading, firing and reloading, while the Tipu seemed frozen with indecision. A cheer sounded to Sharp's left. More muskets fired. Then suddenly there were two redcoats taking cover in the inner tunnel. One saw Sharp and whirled round with a levelled musket. "Oh!" Sharp shouted. "I'm on your bloody side!" The man, wild-eyed and with his right cheek pitted by powder burns from the lock of his musket, turned back toward the enemy. "What regiment?" he called to Sharp. "Have a cakes, you? The old dozen." The man fired and immediately sidled back to begin reloading the musket. "It stinks in here," he said, ramming a fresh bullet down his barrel. More redcoats were occupying the Sultan battery in the outer wall. They had no British flag to show their conquest of the huge bastion, and so they ran a red jacket up the flagpole. The jacket had pale yellow facings, showing that it came from the King's Twelfth, a Kentish regiment. That's ours," the man beside Sharp exulted. Then seemed to gurgle. His eyes opened wide with astonishment. He gave Sharp a puzzled. Almost reproachful look, then slowly toppled backward into one of the fetid puddles. Blood seeped onto his pale yellow facings. Up on the outer wall, a mass of tiger-striped men charged to recapture the Sultan battery, and their courage gave new heart to the defenders between the walls, who gave a cheer and fired a ragged volley at the redcoats edging toward the water gate. The dying redcoat shuddered. His companion fired, then swore, "Bastards!" He hesitated for a half second, then broke out of the tunnel's shadow, and sprinted back to the west, back toward the rest of his comrades who had been advancing toward the tunnel. The Tipu had made up his mind; he would ignore the palanquin and try to reach his horse, and so he'd ordered his bodyguard to clear the tunnel's entrance. That bodyguard now charged, screaming, and Sharp, knowing that he was trapped, splashed back into the inner water gate's lingering smoke. He stopped halfway, turned, and blasted the musket toward the mouth of the tunnel, where he could see the leading men of the Tipu's bodyguard silhouetted against the daylight. A man screamed. Sharp had one loaded musket left. Musket balls thumped into the teak doors beside him. He fired his last musket, then reloaded with a practiced but desperate haste. He was waiting for men to appear in the dense smoke of the tunnel, but none came. Sharp knew he was going to die here, but he was bloodily determined that he would die in company. Let the bastards come! He was frightened, and in his fear he was crooning a mad, tuneless song without words. 
but his fear did not stop him from loading a second musket. Still no one came to kill him, and so he snatched up a third musket and bit the top off another cartridge. The bodyguard had still not come into the tunnel. Sharp in his fear had not heard the sound of battle growing at the end of the tunnel. But now, crouching and listening, he became aware of the shouts and volleys. The men of the Twelfth were pouring musket fire into the Tipu's bodyguard, and those men were staying close to their monarch and returning the fire. Redcoats attacked from the west, and more fired from the Sultan battery. The attempt to recapture the battery had failed, and a mix of sepoys and redcoats were now forcing their way along the outer northern wall. The ferocity of their fire had forced the Tipu's bodyguard to crouch close about their monarch, and Sharp had been given precious seconds in which to load his muskets. He had three charged guns now, three bullets, and he wanted one of them for the heathen bastard who had poured salt on his back, the bastard who wore a great ruby in his hat. He again crept forward through the smoke, willing the Tipu to come into the tunnel. But the Tipu was once again fighting off at the encroaching infidels. Allah had given him this last chance to kill redcoats, and so he was taking the jewelled hunting rifles from his aides and calmly shooting at the men who had so nearly captured the inner water gate. His aides were shouting at him to flee through the tunnel and find a horse, but the Tipu had been granted this final moment of battle, and it seemed to him that he could not miss with any of his shots and with each red coat thrown back he felt a fierce joy. Then a new rush of sepoys and red coats burst along the outer wall, and those men came swarming down the ramp by the outer water gate to add their muskets to those threatening the Tipu's shrinking bodyguard. And as those new enemies appeared, the Tipu's charmed luck turned. One bullet struck his thigh, and another punched his left arm to leave a splash of blood bright on the white linen sleeve. He staggered, but kept his balance. It seemed that not a man of his bodyguard was left unwounded, but a score of them still lived and could walk. In a moment, though, the enemy must triumph, and the Tipu knew it was time to bid his city farewell. We go, he told his relieved aides, and limped toward the tunnel. His left arm was numb, as though it had been hit by a giant hammer, but there was a horrid pain in his left leg. A shot crashed out of the water gate's smoky gloom, and the man leading the Tipu's escape was snatched backward from the tunnel entrance, with blood misting up from his shattered skull. Against the bright sunlight that glowed at the end of the tunnel, the fine droplets of blood looked like powdered rubies. The man fell, screamed, and thrashed. The Tipu, stunned by the suddenness of the bodyguard's unexpected death, paused and behind him a terrible roar sounded as the assaulting redcoats closed in on the mouth of the tunnel. The bodyguard turned back to face their attackers with fixed bayonets. Go, your majesty! A wounded aide thrust a rifle into the Tipu's hands, then dared to push his monarch into the tunnel. The Tipu allowed himself to be pushed into the shadows, but stopped close to the mouth of the tunnel, and from there he stared into the vaporous darkness. Was an enemy there? He could not see because of the smoke. Behind him were the harsh sounds of volleys and curses as his bodyguard died. And as they died, their bodies were making a terrible barricade that protected the Tipu. But what waited in front of him? He peered, reluctant to go forward into the shit-stinking gloom. But then the aide snatched at the Tipu's elbow and dragged him deeper into the darkness. The few surviving bodyguards were defending the tunnel with bayonets, stabbing at the crazed redcoats who tried to scramble across the bloody pile of corpses. "'Open the gate!' the aide shouted. Then he saw the shadow within the shadow at the end of the tunnel, and he dropped to one knee and took aim with his jeweled rifle. He fired, and the golden tiger mask dog head snapped forward onto the prison. Sharp threw himself to one side just as the gun fired, heard the bullet snick the wall and ricochet into the teak door. Then he saw the aide pull a long pistol from his sash. Sharp fired first, the boom of his musket echoing in the tunnel like doom's thunder. The ball hurled the aide back into a deep pool, and suddenly there was only the Tipu and Sharp left. Sharp stood and grinned at the Tipu. Bastard, he said, seeing the glint of light reflected from the ruby in his enemy's helmet. Bastard! he said again. 
He had one loaded musket left. The tipper was holding a rifle. Sharp stepped forward. The tipper recognized the hard, bloody face in the gloom. He smiled. Fate was most strange. He thought, "Why had he not killed this man when he had the chance?" Behind him, his bodyguard was dying, and the victorious redcoats were plundering their bodies. While in front of him was freedom and life, except for one man to whom the tipper had shown mercy. Just one man. Bastard," Sharp said again. He wanted to be close when he killed the tipu, close enough to make certain of the man's death. Behind the tipu, the bright daylight was dulled by the swirling gun smoke, where dying men gasped and victorious men looted. Mercy is God's prerogative, not man's," the tipu said in Persian, "and I should never have been merciful to you." He aimed the rifle at Sharp and pulled the trigger, but the gun did not fire. In the panic of the last seconds, the aide had handed the tipper an unloaded rifle, and the flint had sparked on an empty pan. The tipper smiled, tossed the gun aside, and unsheathed his tiger-hilted sword. There was blood on his arm and more on his chintz trousers, but he showed no fear. He even seemed to relish the moment. How I do hate your cursed race! He said calmly, giving the sword a cut through the smoky air. Sharp did not understand the tipu any more than the tipu understood Sharp. "You're a fat little bastard," Sharp said, "and you took away my medal. I wanted that. It's the only medal I've ever got." The tipu just smiled. His helmet had been dipped in the fountain of life, but it had not worked. The magic had failed, and only Allah was left. He waited for the snarling red coat to shoot. Then a shout sounded in the mouth of the tunnel, and the tipu turned, hoping that one last bodyguard would come to save him. But no bodyguard appeared, and the tipu turned back to face Sharp. I dreamed of death last night, he said in Persian as he limped forward and raised the curved blade to strike at the red coat. I dreamed of monkeys, and monkeys mean death. I should have killed you. Sharp fired. The bullet went higher than he intended. He had thought to put it through the tipu's heart, but instead it struck the sultan in the temple. For a second, the tipu wavered. His head had been whipped back by the bullet's force, and blood was soaking into his cloth-padded helmet. But he forced his head forward, and stared into Sharp's eyes. The sword fell from his nerveless hand. He seemed to smile a last time. Then he just slumped down. The booming echo of the musket shot still battered Sharp's ears, so he was not aware that he was talking as he crouched beside the tipu. "It's your ruby I want," Sharp said. "That bloody great ruby! I wanted it from the very first moment I saw you. Colonel McCandless told me he did that. It's wealth that makes the world turn, and I want my share." The tipu still lived, but he could not move. His expressionless eyes stared up at Sharp, who thought the tipu was dead. But then the dying man blinked. Still here, are you? Sharp said. He patted the tipu's bloodied cheek. You're a brave fat bastard. I will say that for you. He wrenched the huge ruby off the blood-spattered feather plume, then stripped the dying man of every jewel he could find. He took the pearls from the tipu's neck, twisted off an armlet bright with gems, tugged off the diamond rings, and unlatched the silver-hung necklace of emeralds. He pulled on the tipu sash to see if the dagger with the great diamond called the moonstone in its hilt was there, but the sash held nothing except the sword scabbard. Sharp took that, but left the tiger-hilted sword. He lifted the blade from a puddle of sewage and placed it in the tipu's hand. "You can keep your sword," he told the dying man, "for you fought proper, like a proper soldier." He stood up, and then awkwardly, because of his burden of jewels, and because he was suddenly conscious of the dying sultan's gaze, he saluted the tipu. "Take your blade to paradise," he said, "and tell him you were killed by another proper soldier." The tipu's eyes closed, and he thought of the prayer that he'd copied into his notebook that very morning. "I am full of sin," the tipu had written in his beautiful Arabic script. 
and thou, Allah, art a sea of mercy. Where thy mercy is, where is my sin? That was a comfort. There was no pain now, not even in his leg. And that was a comfort too, but still he could not move. It was like one of the dreams he copied each morning into his dream book, and he wondered at how peaceful everything suddenly seemed, as peaceful as though he was floating on a gilded barge down a warm river beneath a blessed sun. This must be the way to paradise, he thought, and he welcomed it. Paradise. Sharp felt a pang of sorrow for the dying man. He might have been a murderous enemy, but he was a brave one. The tipper had fallen with his right arm trapped beneath his body, and though Sharp suspected there was another jewelled armlet on that hidden sleeve, he did not try to retrieve it. The tipper deserved to die in peace, and besides, Sharp was rich enough already, for his pockets now held a king's ransom, while a leather scabbard sewn with sapphires was hidden under his shabby coat. And so he picked up one of his empty muskets and splashed through the tunnel's bloody puddles toward the pile of dead that lay in the smoky sunlight. A sergeant of the twelfth, startled by Sharp's sudden appearance from the tunnel, snatched up his bayonet, then saw Sharp's filthy red jacket and let the weapon fall. Anyone alive in there? The sergeant asked. Just a fat little fella dying, Sharp said as he climbed over the barrier of the dead. Did he have any loot? Nothing, Sharp said. Nothing worth the trouble. Place is full of shit too. The sergeant frowned at Sharp's unkempt dress and unpowdered hair. What regiment are you? Not yours, Sharp said curtly, and walked away through the crowds of celebrating redcoats and sepoys. Not all were celebrating. Some were massacring trapped enemies. The fight had been brief but nasty, and now the winners took a bloody revenge. On the far side of the inner wall, Colonel Wellesley had brought his men into the streets, and they now surrounded the palace to preserve it from plunder. The smaller streets were not so fortunate, and the first screams sounded as the sepoys and redcoats found their hungry way into the unprotected alleys. The Tipu's men, those that still lived and had escaped their pursuers, fled eastward. While the Tipu, left alone in the tunnel, lay dying. Sergeant Richard Sharp slung the musket and walked around the base of the inner wall, seeking a passage into the city. He had only a few moments of freedom left before the army took him back into its iron grip, but he had won his victory and he had pockets full of stones to prove it. He went to find a drink. Next day it rained. It was not the monsoon, though it could have been, for the rain fell with a ferocity that matched the fury of the previous day's assault. The pelting warm rain washed the blood off the city's walls and scoured the hot season's filth out of its streets. The corvary swelled to fill its banks, rising so high that no man could have crossed the river in front of the breach. If the Tipu's prayers had been answered and the British had waited one more day, then the floods would have defeated them. But there was no Tipu in Seringapatam, only the Raja, who had been restored to his palace, where he was surrounded by red-coated guards. The palace, which had been protected from the ravages of the assaulting troops, was now being stripped bare by the victorious officers. Rain drummed on the green-tiled roof and ran into the gutters and puddled in the courtyards. As the red-coated officers soared up the great tiger throne on which the Tipu had never sat. They turned the handles of the tiger organ and laughed as the mechanical claw savaged the redcoat's face. They tugged down silk hangings, they pried gems out of furniture, and marvelled at the simple bare white painted room which had been the Tipu's bedchamber. The six tigers, roaring because they had not been fed, and because the rain fell so hard, were shot. The Tipu's father, the great Hyder Ali, lay in a mausoleum east of the city, and when the rainstorm had stopped, and while the garden around the mausoleum was still steaming in the sudden sultry sunlight, the Tipu was carried to rest beside his father. British troops lined the route and reversed their arms as the cortege passed. Muffled drums beat a slow tattoo as the Tipu was borne on his sad last journey by his own defeated soldiers. Sharp, 
with three bright white stripes newly sewn onto his faded red sleeve, waited close beside the domed mausoleum. I do wonder who killed them. Colonel McCandle is restored to a clean uniform and with his hair neatly cut, had come to stand beside Sharp. Some lucky bastard, sir. A rich one by now, no doubt. The colonel said, "Good for him, sir." Sharp said, "Whoever he is, he'll only waste the plunder." McCandless said severely, "He'll fritter it on women and drink." Don't sound like a waste to me, sir. McCandless grimaced at the sergeant's levity. That ruby alone was worth ten years of a general's salary. Ten years. A shame it's vanished, sir. Sharp said guilelessly. Isn't it sharp? McCandless agreed. But I hear you are at the water gate. Me, sir? No, sir. Not me, sir. I stay with Mister Lawford, sir. The colonel gave Sharp a fierce glance. A sergeant of the old dozen reports he saw a wild-looking fellow come out of the water gate. McCandless's voice was accusing. He says the man had a coat with scarlet facings and no buttons. The colonel looked disapprovingly at Sharp's red coat, on which Sharp had somehow found time to stitch the sergeant's stripes, but not a single button. The man seems very certain of what he saw. He was probably confused by the battle, sir. Lost his wits, I wouldn't doubt. So who put Sergeant Hakeswell in with the tigers? McCandless demanded. Only the good Lord knows, sir, and he ain't saying. The colonel, scenting blasphemy, frowned. Hakeswell says it was you," he accused Sharp. "Hakeswell's mad, sir, and you can't trust a thing he says," Sharp said. And Hakeswell was more than mad; he was alive. Somehow he'd escaped the tigers. Not one of the beasts had attacked the sergeant, who had been discovered babbling in the courtyard, crying for his mother and declaring his fondness for tigers. He liked all pussy cats. He'd said to his rescuers, "I can't be killed." He'd shouted when the redcoats led him gently away. Touched by God, I am. He'd claimed, and then he demanded that Sharp be arrested for attempted murder. But Lieutenant Lawford had blushed and sworn that Sergeant Sharp had never left his side after the mine was blown. Colonel Goudin, a prisoner now, had confirmed the claim. The two men had been discovered in one of the city's brothels, where they had been protecting the women from the drunken, rampaging victors. Hicksville's a lucky man," McCandless said dryly, abandoning any further attempt to drag the truth from Sharp. Those tigers were man eaters, but not devil eaters, sir.、Uh, one whiff of Hicksville, and they must have gone right off their feed. He still swears it was you who threw him to the tigers," McCandless said. "I've no doubt he'll try to take his revenge. I've no doubt either, sir. But I'll be ready for him." And next time, Sharp thought he would make certain the bastard died. McCandless turned as the slow funeral procession appeared at the end of the long road that led to the mausoleum. Opposite him, behind an honor guard of the King's Seventy Third, Aparau, now in the Rajah's service, also watched the cortege approach. Aparau's family and household all lived. McCandless had sat in Aparau's courtyard, a musket on his lap. And turned back every red coat or sepoy who had come to the house. Mary had thus survived unscathed, and Sharp had heard that she would now marry her Kunwa Singh, and he was glad for her. He remembered the ruby he had once promised to give her, and he smiled at the thought. Some other lass, maybe. The Tipu's ruby was deep in his pouch, hidden like all the other looted jewels. The muffled drum beat came nearer, and the red-coated honor guard stiffened to attention. Mourners followed the coffin, most of them the Tipu's officers. Goudin was among them. McCandless took off his cocked hat. "There'll be more fighting to come, Sharp," the colonel said softly. "We have other enemies in India. I'm sure we have, sir." The colonel glanced at Sharp. He saw a young man, hard as flint. And the restless anger in Sharp's heart made him dangerous as flint and steel, but there was also a kindness in Sharp. McCandless had seen that kindness in the dungeons, and McCandless believed it betrayed a soul that was well worth saving. 
I may have uses for you if you're willing, the colonel said. Sharp seemed surprised. I thought you were going home, sir, to Scotland. McCandless shrugged. There's work undone here, Sharp. Work undone. And what will I ever do in Scotland but dream of India? I think I shall stay for a while. And I'd be privileged to help you, sir, so I would, Sharp said. Then he snatched off his shako as the coffin drew close. His hair, which he had still not clubbed or powdered, fell loose across his scarlet collar as he stood to attention. Far away, beyond the river, rain fell on a green land, but above sharp the sun shone, glistening its watery light on the mausoleum's bulging white dome, beneath which, in a dark crypt under their silk-draped tombs, the Tipu's parents lay. Now the Tipu would join them. The coffin was carried slowly past Sharp. The men bearing the Tipu were dressed in his tiger-striped tunic, while the coffin itself was draped with a great striped tiger pelt. It was a mangy skin, uncured and still bloody, but the best that could be discovered in the chaos following the city's fall. And down one flank there was a long ancient scar, and Sharp, seeing it, smiled. He'd seen that scar before. He'd seen it every night that he was in the Tipu's dungeons, and now he saw it again, scored into a tiger skin that covered a brave, dead king. It was Sharp's tiger. A historical note. The siege and fall of Seringapatam, now Seringapatna, in May 1799, ended decades of warfare between the remarkable Muslim dynasty that ruled the state of Mysore and the invading British. The British, under Lord Cornwallis, had captured the city before, in 1792, and at that time they decided to leave the Tipu on his throne. But mutual antagonisms and the Tipu's preference for a French alliance led to the final Mysore War, The aim of the war was simple, to do what had not been done in 1792, unthrown the Tipu, to which end the British concocted some very thin reasons to justify an invasion of Mysore, ignored the Tipu's overtures for peace, and so marched on Seringapatam. It was a brutally naked piece of aggression, but successful, for with the Tipu's death the most formidable obstacle to British rule in southern India was removed. And with it, the increasingly slim chance that Napoleon, then at the head of a French army stranded in Egypt, would intervene in the subcontinent. The novel's description of the city's fall is mostly accurate. Two forlorn hopes, one headed by the unfortunate Sergeant Graham, led two columns of attacking troops across the wide South Corvary and up the breach. And there the columns separated, one going north about the city's outer ramparts, and the other south. Major General David Baird commanded the assault, and he, judging in the heat of battle that the resistance to the south was more formidable, turned that way. In fact, the northern column encountered the stiffest opposition, most probably caused by the Tipu's own leadership. Many eyewitnesses from both sides testified to the Tipu's personal bravery. He was gaudily dressed and bright with gems, but he insisted on fighting in the front rank of his men. Further difficulties were caused by the defenders firing from the inner wall's sheltered fire step, and it was not until Captain Goodall, the commander of the 12th Regiment's Light Company, had led his men across the buttressing cross wall, and so began the capture of the inner ramparts, that the defence collapsed. The fight was short, but exceptionally bloody. Causing one thousand four hundred casualties among the attackers, and over six thousand from the Tipu's troops. I did take one great liberty with the historical facts of the assault. There was no disused western gateway, nor any mine either. But the idea for the mine came from an enormous and spectacular explosion which occurred in the city two days before the assault. It is believed that a British shell somehow ignited one of the Tipu's magazines, which then blew up. I changed the nature of that explosion, and delayed it by two days, because fictional heroes must be given suitable employment. There were a few French troops in Seringapatam, 
But Nelson's victory at the Nile had effectively ended any real chance of French intervention in India. Colonel Goudin is a fictional character, though someone very like him did lead a small French battalion in the battle. Others of the novel's characters, like Colonel Ghent, did exist. Major Shi, a somewhat intemperate and unfortunate Irishman, commanded the 33rd during the time Wellesley served as one of Harris's deputies, and Lieutenant Fitzgerald, brother of the Knight of Kerry, was killed in the confused night attack on the Sultan Peter Tope, probably by a bayonet thrust. That setback was Wellesley's only military defeat, and it gave him a lifelong aversion to night actions. Major General Baird did dislike Wellesley, and fiercely resented the fact that General Harris appointed the young man to be the governor of Seringapatam after the siege. Although, given Baird's hatred of the Indians, the appointment was undoubtedly wise. Baird's jealousy lasted many years. Though in his later life, the Scotsman generously admitted that Wellesley was his military superior. By then, of course, Arthur Wellesley had become the first Duke of Wellington. In 1815, only Napoleon still regarded Wellington with contempt, dubbing him the Sepoy General. But the Sepoy General still whipped Napoleon. The Tipu Sultan, of course, existed. His defeat was celebrated in Britain, where the Tipu was regarded as a peculiarly brutal and ferocious despot. And for years afterwards, despite many other momentous victories over much more formidable enemies, the British still harked back to the Tipu's defeat and death. The event was celebrated in numerous prints. It was turned into at least six stage plays, and it occupied many books, all tributes to the curious fascination the Tipu exercised over his erstwhile enemies. Yet his death, despite being pictured and reenacted so many times, was never fully explained because no one ever discovered who exactly killed him. It was most probably a soldier of the 12th Grenadier Company. The Tipu's body was found, but his killer never came forward, and it is presumed that this reticence was caused by the man's unwillingness to admit to ownership of the Tipu's jewels. Where many of those jewels are today, no one knows. But much of the Tipu's grandeur can still be seen. The inner palace of Seringapatam, alas, was demolished in the 19th century. Local guides insist it was destroyed by the British bombardment, but in fact the building survived the siege intact. And all the remains of its splendour are a few ruined walls and some pillars, which now support the canopy of Seringapatana's railway station. But the summer palace, the Daria Daulat, still exists. The mural of the British defeat at Polilur was restored by Wellesley, who lived in this exquisite little palace while he governed Mysore. It is now a museum. The Tipu's mosque still stands. There is another small palace in the city of Bangalore, and perhaps most moving of all, the Gumbaz, the elegant mausoleum where the Tipu lies with his parents. To this day, his tomb is covered with a cloth patterned with tiger stripes. The Tipu revered the tiger and used tiger motifs wherever he could. His fabulous tiger throne existed, but it was broken up at his death though large parts of it can still be seen, notably in Windsor Castle. His dreadful toy, the Tiger Organ, is now in London's Victoria and Albert Museum. The organ was sadly damaged during the Blitz, but it has been superbly restored, though, alas, its voice is not what it was. The Tipu did keep six tigers in his palace courtyard. Wellesley ordered them shot. Sri Ringa Patna's outer wall still stands. The town, which has fewer inhabitants now than it did in 1799, is an attractive place, and the site of the assault, overlooking the South Corvary, is marked by an obelisk that stands immediately to the north of the repaired breach. Just behind the breach, and filling the whole northwestern corner of the defences, is an enormous earthen bastion, all that remains of the inner wall. The rest of the inner wall has disappeared completely, probably demolished by Wellesley shortly after the siege. Later, during the high noon of the Raj, 
Various sites were identified in Sriringa Patna as historically significant locations, but I believe the absence of the inner wall caused some confusion. Modern visitors to Sriringa Patna will discover plaques or memorials displayed at the Tipu's dungeons, at the water gate where he was supposedly killed, and much farther east at the place where his body was found. But of the three, I suspect only the last is accurate. The so-called dungeons are beneath the Sultan Battery, and while it is quite possible they were used as cells in the 1780s, and thus the place where Baird spent his uncomfortable 44 months, they were not so employed in 1799. By then the inner wall had been built, it was hastily constructed after Cornwallis's 1792 siege, and it is much more likely that the dungeons were thereafter employed as a magazine a use for which they were obviously intended. The Tipu's surviving prisoners all attested that they were held inside the inner wall during the siege. So that is where I placed Sharp, Lawford, McCandless and Hakeswell. A plaque marks the water gate through the outer wall as the site of the Tipu's death, but again this seems wrong. The evidence of Mysorean survivors, some of whom were close to the Tipu at the end, clearly states that the Tipu was trying to get inside the city when he was killed. We know he had been fighting on the outer wall, and that when he broke off that fight, he came down to the space between the walls. And there the story becomes muddled. British sources claim he tried to escape the city through the outer wall's water gate, but the Indian testimonies all agree that he tried to go through the inner wall's water gate into the city itself. That second water gate has since vanished, but I suspect it was there that he died and not at the existing gate. It might seem logical that he should have attempted to flee the city, but the remaining water gate led, and still leads, to the flooded ditch inside the glacis, and even if he had negotiated those obstacles, under fire from the attackers on the walls above him, he would only have reached the southern bank of the Corvary, which was under the guns of the British forces north of the river. By cutting through the city, he could have reached the Bangalore Gate, which offered a much greater chance of successful escape. Indeed, after the Tipu's death, or perhaps while he was still dying, some of his loyal retainers found him, placed him in the palanquin, and carried him eastward, presumably in an attempt to reach the Bangalore Gate. They were intercepted, the palanquin was overturned, and the Tipu's body lay undiscovered for several hours. It seems a pity to abandon the present water gate as the place where the Tipu was shot, for its gloomy, dank tunnel has a certain eerie drama. But doubtless the matching gate in the inner wall was equally atmospheric. The Tipu's body was treated with honour, and next day, as the novel describes, he was buried beside his parents in the Gumba's mausoleum. Wellesley, meanwhile, stamped out the looting in the city. He hung four looters, a remedy he would employ in the wake of future sieges. But what the common soldier could not take, the senior officers happily plundered for themselves. The East India Company's prize agents tallied the Tipu's treasures at a value of two million pounds, one thousand seven hundred and ninety-nine pounds, and half of that fabulous fortune was declared to be prize money, so that many senior officers became rich men through that single day's work. Most of the treasures returned to Britain, where they remain, some on public view, but many still in private hands. Today the Tipu is a hero to many Indians who regard him as a proto-independence fighter. This seems a perverse judgment. Most of the Tipu's enemies were other Indian states, though admittedly his fiercest fights were against the British and their Indian allies. But he could never entirely rely on his Hindu subjects. No one is certain that he was betrayed on the day of his death, but it seems more than likely that several Hindu officers, like the fictional Appa Rao, were deliberately lukewarm in their support. The Tipu's Muslim religion and his preference for the Persian language mark him as being outside the mainstream of modern Indian tradition, which is perhaps why I was assured by one educated Indian that the Tipu had, in truth, been a Hindu. He was not.
and no amount of wishful thinking can make him into a more acceptably Indian hero. Nor does his story need embellishment, for he was a hero anyway, even if he never did fight for Indian independence. He fought for Mysorean dominance over India, which was quite a different thing. I would like to thank Elizabeth Cartmail Friedman, who ransacked the files of London's India House and did much other research for Sharp's Tiger, and for all the useful things she discovered, and which I left out. I apologize. I must also thank my agent, Toby Eady, who went above and beyond the call of duty by accompanying me to Sriringapatna. Research has rarely been more enjoyable. As usual, when writing Sharp, I owe gratitude to Lady Elizabeth Longford for her superb book, Wellington, The Years of the Sword, and to the late Jack Weller for his indispensable Wellington in India. Sriringa Patna is still dominated by the Tipu's memory. He was an efficient ruler whom Indians revere, and the British consider a callous tyrant. That tyrannical reputation was caused, above all, by his execution of thirteen British prisoners before the assault. Only eight of them had been captured in the night skirmish. The others were already prisoners. It is unlikely that the execution took place at the Summer Palace, but they were carried out by the Tipu's jetties, who did kill in the manner described in the novel. Those murders are reprehensible, yet they should not blind us to the Tipu's virtues. He was a very brave man, a considerable soldier, a talented administrator, and an enlightened ruler, and he makes a worthy foe for young Richard Sharp, who still has a long road to march under his cold but very clever sepoy general. This concludes the reading of Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell. This book was read by Frederick Davidson. If you would like to obtain a mail order catalogue or additional information about our growing line of audio books, write Blackstone Audio Books, Post Office Box nine six nine, Ashland, Oregon, Zip Code nine seven five two zero, or call one eight hundred say book. That's one eight hundred seven two nine two six six five.